This is the Collected Works of Robert Adams. Part 2. Transcript 13. There is no self. 30th September, 1990. Robert, when people first come to see me, they expect a lecture, I do not give lectures. I am not a philosopher. I am not a preacher. All of the reasons you came to me are wrong. I can do absolutely nothing for you. What I usually do is make my confession to myself and since there's one self everybody's included. I speak in the first person. When I use the terms I or I am, I am not referring to Robert, I am referring to consciousness. Consciousness is omnipresent. This means that all of you are included when I use the words I am. Though I confess that I am not the body or the mind principle. I confess that I am not the doer. But, that I am the absolute reality. I am ultimate oneness, pure intelligence, emptiness, nirvana. I am unborn and I do not disappear. And in the term between life and death, I do not prevail. I am nothingness. Emptiness. That shit ananda. Parabrahman. I am that I am. That is my confession to you, and that is your confession to me. There is one consciousness, one Brahman, one ultimate reality. As I make my confession to you, remember I am not speaking about Robert, I'm speaking of oneness, of the ultimate reality, of nothingness, emptiness. I am that I am. That shit ananda. Pure awareness. The ultimate oneness. I which is consciousness was never born and consciousness can never die. This realization transcends all your karma. To be aware of this alone, emancipates you makes you free now. To be aware of this, is to be this. So again, I do not give talks, I do not give lectures, I am not a philosopher, I am not a preacher, I am nothing. If you came here to expect some teaching, you will go away disappointed because I have nothing to teach. Again, I confess to you, that I am is not the body-mind principle, nor the doer, nor the world, nor God. I am is consciousness. Consciousness is the self. The self is self-contained, projecting and manifesting this world and this universe. Someone arrives to satsang, Hello Arty. SN, the bed is fine for anyone to sit on the bed. Robert, if you'd like to sing, oh God beautiful. After singing. SE, that's the first can't I ever learned, thirty something years ago. Robert, really? And that and the in the temple of silence. Rubber, oom. Last Thursday we were talking about the self as consciousness and after about an hour into it, I finally confessed that in the ultimate reality, there's no self and there's no consciousness. And some people became perplexed because just as they were beginning to discover the self, I come and tell them there's no self. Now what does this mean, we'll follow through on it. The self exists as long as you believe you're not self-realized. Does a self-realized person need a self? Does a self-realized person talk about consciousness? Needs consciousness or Brahman, or Parabrahman, or Sat Chit Ananda? Those are words, those are concepts. As long as you are believing in concepts, words, preconceived ideas, this will halt your progress. Reality is beyond words. Reality is in the silence. Really the only thing you have to do is quiet your mind. Make your mind quiescent and reality will shine forth all by itself. But, if you go around repeating like a parrot, I am the self, I am consciousness, I am ultimate reality. It will actually keep you back. I tell you the truth, it's better to say nothing. The reason I express these words is to make you understand that there is something else besides you bodily experiences. There's something beside your everyday occurrences. And that is called the self. 
The self is merely a self-contained self, projecting and manifesting the universe and the world. You are that self. And the reason the universe and the world exist is because you exist. It's being emanated through you. You are the projectionist. The entire universe is a projection of your mind. So, if there's no mind everything becomes the self. Then you can confess, everything is the self and I am that. But, until that happens the best thing you can do is to speak very little. The best thing you can do is to dive deep within yourself and discover your true nature. This can be done at any time. When you get caught up in the world for instance. Simply ask yourself, who is it that's caught up in the world? And be truthful say I am and go further and ask yourself, where did the I come from? What is this I? How did it originate? What is its cause? Follow the I, abide in the I, and you will soon come to the conclusion that I does not exist. You will soon come to the conclusion that you are infinite space. And instead of observing objects in the world, you will observe the space that the objects seem to be glued onto. It's like a little kid's cut out book. A little kid gets a piece of paper, cuts out a picture of the sun, pastes the sun on the paper, cuts out a picture of a tree, pastes it on the paper, cuts out a picture of a man, pastes it on the paper, and they become objects. And the little kid is interested in the objects. But where would the objects be without the paper? The paper is the reality of the objects. And when the kid stopped playing with those objects, he simply unpeels the sun and puts the moon in its place. Takes away the clouds and pastes up stars in its place. Takes away the man and puts a woman in its place. Takes away the tree and puts grass and mountains. But did the paper change? Paper is still the same. And so it is with us. We appear to be mortals. Going through various experiences in the world. There appears to be a sky, planets, stars, others. But I say to you in truth that these are all false. Only the space is real. The space never changes and everything else does. Therefore how can anything that changes be real? Now some of you may ask what good is this teaching? Is it practical? What can it do for me? And I say to you are you really happy? Do you have unchanging happiness in your life? Do you have peace real peace? Most of us do not even understand what happiness and peace are. We think that happiness ensues when we get things to go our way. How long does that last? As you well know from experience things change. The only thing that's permanent in this life is change. If your happiness depends on person, place or thing when that changes there goes your happiness out the window. Same with peace and joy. As long as things bring you happiness, joy and peace, you will be miserable most of the time. For these things must change sooner or later and there goes your happiness with it. Some people believe that this teaching will cure their ills. Give them financial rewards. Improve the relationships. It may but that's not the point. We're not trying to improve our humanhood. If you wish to improve your humanhood, they have plenty of so-called science of mind classes, positive thinking courses. What we're trying to do here is annihilate our humanhood. Destroy it completely. It's our humanhood that causes the misunderstanding, the suffering. As long as we identify with the body, we have to suffer. This doesn't mean that by not identifying with the body, the world will become a bundle of joy, and there will ensue happiness and peace in the world, on the contrary. What this means is you will acquire a new attitude. You will see things differently. When you begin to understand that you are the self, and that you are an embodiment of love, and that your true nature is Satchitananda, Parabrahman. If you really feel that, and you ultimately become that, whatever you see will become a reflection of yourself. 
that's why you will be able to confess the whole universe is the self and I am that. But, until it happens to you, do not try to improve your affairs. It's like beating a dead horse. When you improve your affairs they stay improved for a while and something negative pops up somewhere else. Then you improve that and then something negative pops up somewhere else. It's unceasing, it never ends. It's like you grow a tumor and you go to an elective doctor and he says, well I've got to cut it out. I'll give you a local anesthetic and cut it off right here. Though he does just that, but a month later it grows back on the other side of your arm. Then he cuts that out. It grows back on your leg. He never got to the cause. You cannot destroy the effects and expect harmony. You've got to change the cause and there's only one cause and that is your erroneous belief that you are human. That you are the body and the mind. That is the only cause of your misery. Eliminate that and suffering will cease. Though again, how will you eliminate that? By simply asking yourself, to whom does this come? Who's going through these karmas? And you will soon realize it's your ego, not you. Your ego has absolutely nothing to do with you. It is your ego that reincarnates. It is your ego that comes back again and again. But, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. It's like people being born and people dying in this space. People come and go every day very fast. Wait until the war in Iraq starts then they'll really go. Then they'll come back again and go again. It never ends. Until you get tired of playing the game. And you say to yourself, wait a minute, I've been playing this game for eons. I die I come back and I die and I come back and I die and I come back. I'm getting tired of it. What to do? When you finally ask that question something will happen. You'll either grab the right book meet the right teacher, hear the right words. But something will happen to you when you inquire why do I have to keep playing these games? And soon you will ask who is it that plays the game? Who's going through these reincarnations? Me I am? Who is I am? Where did I come from? What gave it birth? Did I have a father and a mother to give it birth? How did it appear? And something will tell you it's like an optical illusion. Just as when I say to you, the sky is blue. In reality, there's no sky and there's no blue. There's only atmosphere. But, if you look out the window you see a beautiful blue sky. Yet we know it does not exist. If you are in the desert dying of thirst, you see a mirage, you see an oasis, and you run to drink the water but it's a mirage doesn't exist. It's an optical illusion. The same is true of your eye. Your eye appears to exist. But, it is non-existent. Your body appears to exist. But, it's like moving pictures on the screen. Only the screen exists. The pictures that cover it are false. If you don't believe it try to grab them and see what you grab, you grab the screen. Though it is with your so-called life. It comes from false imagination. You are dreaming the mortal dream. You believe that you are a body. And you're going through many experiences. And you do as long as you have that belief. As soon as you drop that belief reality ensues all by itself. Everything stops. First feeling that you achieve is a feeling of immortality. You just know. You know that you were never born. And if you were never born, you can never die. You become aware of this. The second feeling is that you are omnipresent. You're not your little self located in any body. There is no body. No body is home. You are free forever. Omnipresent. Omniscient. Omnipotent. You are everyone, everything, all existence and yet you are nobody. You are like a mirror self-contained and you project the universe. But, you become aware that you are the mirror and not the projection. 
Find yourself. Come true to yourself. How many more years do you have left? What are you doing with your life? How do you spend each day? What is more important to you than anything else? It begins in the morning when you first open your eyes. What do you think about first thing? What you should ask yourself as soon as you get up you say, What the hell am I doing here? Laughter. That's the smart thing to say. Instead of thinking, I want a cup of coffee, I want a Danish, I have to go to work, I have to make my week's pay. Ask yourself, what the hell am I doing? What am I going through? Why? That is the first step. Be totally dissatisfied with your lot. Laughter. As long as you're satisfied and you say, oh I look good, I'm handsome, I'm pretty, and you spend three hours putting on makeup or bathing, putting on fresh clothes every minute. Then you're feeding a dead horse. But, when you realize you're going through all kinds of nonsense and you've been going through nonsense all of your life and you ask yourself, where do I go from here? The answers will come by themselves, really. You will not need any teacher. The only reason you come here is because you're not doing it. Laughter. If you were doing the right thing, why do you need me for? And so you begin to inquire as soon as you open your eyes. What is this body? Who is it? Who am I? What am I all about? And then you remember you say, I dreamt, I had a beautiful dream, and I also slept soundly and now I am awake. But here's something funny you say, I was present during my sleeping state, during my dream state and during my waking state. I was present because I said, I slept, I dreamt, and I am awake. What is this I? And again you follow through, where did this I come from? That sleeps, that is present during sleep, that is present during dream state. And now I say, I am awake. Who is this I that does all this? What is its nature? What is its source? And you begin to be aware of your thoughts. You watch your mind as it goes through the motions of thinking, 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 forever thinking. As if your thoughts are so important. You may say to me, well, if I don't think about my life, who's going to take care of me? I've got to think about my life. Does the tree that grows beautiful mangoes think about its life? And yet it grows luscious mangoes. Does the sun think, will I shine again tomorrow? Does the grass think, am I going to grow next week? There's a mysterious power that takes care of everything. Karmically your body came to this earth to do something. It knows what to do without your help, thank you. Laughter. It needs no help from you. By abiding on the eye, your body will take care of itself. Even better than you can ever do when you're thinking. Though try not to think too much. But, Rather follow the I thought, and when you follow it to its source, you will be surprised how easily you wake up and you become free and emancipated. Sometimes I close my eyes, sometimes I don't. Though for those of you who think I'm having some wonderful inner experiences and that's why I close my eyes, forget it. I just close my eyes because they get tired. Laughter. There are no experiences to get. You are the experience yourself. Now I've talked enough and we'll have questions and answers if you like. This is satsang and I shouldn't be talking too much. Otherwise, I might become a philosopher. Laughter. SR, Robert I have a question. There's a feeling I have to do inquiry, I have to achieve a goal and I also notice all the thoughts and reactions have the feeling, Yes I've heard it before, yes I agree with it, yes it's familiar, and there's always a sense of something I have to do. Even the whole liberation thing seems like something I want to do. Robert, simply observe those thoughts. Do nothing about them. Since you've realized this is something you have to do, then do nothing. Just observe the thoughts, let them come, let them go and watch what happens. The whole idea is to quieten your mind. All of the sadhanas, 
all of the teachings on this earth is for one purpose, to quiet the mind. Once the mind is quiet, emancipation comes by itself. So simply observe your thoughts. Let them rage, let them do what they want. And they will quiet and by themselves, if you do not interfere. If you try to change them, they'll become stronger. Simply observe them, watch them. And leave them alone. They will dissipate all by themselves. Or if you get tired of doing that, ask yourself, to whom do they come? Do whatever you have to do. And if that doesn't work that day, take a cold shower. Laughter. That'll do something. SD, I think for me the best method is to say, to whom do these thoughts come? Because it will always lead back to, who am I? It involves all these questions, go back to self-inquiry. At any time my thoughts stray, I'll say, to whom do these thoughts come? Well, they come to me. To whom? I. Who is the I? It takes me to the I thought. Robert, well that's good but Richard has been doing that for years apparently and he gets tired of it. So do nothing. SR, I like what the hell am I doing here? Best. Robert, whatever you have to do. SU, I have said, what the hell am I doing here probably because of language. I wake up very often and I say am I still here? Robert, that's good. I actually asked my mother this when I was about 13 years old. One day, I woke up and went to her, and I said, Mum, what am I doing here? And she took me to a doctor. Laughter. Do you want to say something, Jay? SJ, no. SU, there was something that you said earlier, you were saying something. There is no self of the self-realized person and then you said something along at the same time, there's no such thing as consciousness. Did you mean that or? Robert, in the ultimate reality, there's nothing. As we know it as we conceive it. As long as you're able to voice it, it's false. As long as you're able to think about it, it does not exist. Reality is silence, not words. SU, that is consciousness, isn't it? Consciousness is a word that we use. I keep on using it because it gives you something to work from. But, in the ultimate reality, it does not exist. SH, how was the notion of an I or a me arise in principle? How does it come into being? Robert, it's like an optical illusion. Have you ever been hypnotized? SH, no. When you're hypnotized, you can be made to imagine anything. It's the same thing. It's mass hypnosis. It's collective hypnosis. We all believe we are the I body. SH, why does that occur? It doesn't. SH, it appears to. It appears to. SH, yeah. But it really doesn't. It does not occur. SH, isn't it that consciousness is identifying with this body-mind organism? No. SH, and therefore you get the notion that there is a separate me? That's how it appears but it's not true. Consciousness is undivided. Consciousness is self-contained. Where it appears to manifest as the universe. SH, something identifies with the body-mind? SE, it's the mind. Robert, there's no mind. Laughter, SH, boy, you really wipe everything out. Laughter, that's where it's at. SH, I agree. As long as there are words or concepts, it's not that. SX, we're taught that Henry. SH, huh? We're taught that. SH, taught what? That as we grow up, we're taught I, you know, where's your nose, where's your eyes, where's your teeth, you know. SH, yeah, that's true. Break in tape and restarts as students' question is picked up. SK, 
when the thought comes to your mind that the passion isn't there like it used to be, maybe there's no more need for it or maybe it's a false sense of. Robert, when you've arrived at that state see if you ask that question. Because it'll just be gone. It's like you were in a dark room all your life and you turn on the light. And now you're in light, the darkness has dissipated, it's gone, same thing. The ignorance has dissolved and you become yourself. It's no big thing. SK, what is the difference then in this kind of a realization and the kind of thing that people who practice Ashtanga Yoga or mystical types of yoga and other things where they, whether they get realization or not, the ultimate realization, but they manifest and generate all kinds of spiritual energy. Robert, the true Ashtanga Yoga, the Eightfold Path is merely to bring you to the place where the mind becomes quiescent. But, it takes years and years and years. This is the direct path. SK, boom and that isn't. No it's indirect. On a path like this, you can become emancipated right now, if you want to. Just wake up. That's all you have to do, just wake up. SK, when that occurs does the individual, like individuals of other paths, generate all kinds of spiritual energy. Why? Laughter, SK, it's interesting to me whether that's actually a. If you're generating spiritual energy, there has to be someone left to generate the energy. SK, so it's actually. When there's no one left, there's no one to generate anything. ST, may I ask a question? After countless reincarnations and one needs a teacher and yet the ultimate event of realizing the truth has not happened, even if passion is lacking, will something of its own volition happen anyway? Is it just a matter of a process unfolding? Robert, I like to say we're all hell bound for heaven. ST, say it again please. We're all hell bound for heaven. Laughter is H, goody goody. Laughs. It's going to happen to all of us whether we like it or not. ST, in other words we're doomed to self-realization. Exactly. ST, I had come to this conclusion but I think sometimes I've done myself a great disservice. SR, the strange part of that seems to me I'm in a recurring dream and I keep coming into rooms like that and now I'm starting to see the same thing. Laughter. And everybody's still getting promised the direct path and nobody seems to be waking up. And there's a beauty in that in a sense too, that the dream goes on of its own accord in a way that is not real. You know what I'm saying. Robert, yes. There are people that wake up but you haven't met them. ST, it's usually the people who wake up, who don't ask to be awakened, it just happens spontaneously. Robert, exactly. They just arrive at some point even though there's nothing going on, even in the illusory sense there's something going on that propels it to happen. There's a causation that seems to be, even within the void or so, I don't know, it's hard to. Robert, it's just a question of letting go, let go of everything, ask yourself, what am I holding on to? As long as you're holding on to something, person, place or thing, you're earthbound. As soon as you let go totally you're free. ST, why is it so hard? For whom is it hard? ST, the one who's bound. Who is that? T never put yourself down. Your real self is not bound and you are your real self. Identify with your real self. Forget about the past, it's dead. Be centered, live in the now. And identify with reality, that's all you have to do. ST, what sort of existence does one lead when that realization has taken place? It isn't existence as we ordinarily experience it, and we acknowledge that another person exists that we may not know their inner state. Are they still experiencing karma? Do they still have obligations in the world? Robert, there's no karma for a Johnny. But the body will do what it has to do. But 
the Johnny will not be aware of it. St. There's no identification with whatever is going in that. The Johnny sees a completely different world. St. So the Johnny is not aware of his body doing what he has to do. Exactly. St. Didn't you say at one point that you're only aware in the observational sense? Robert, you like the screen. The movie is shown on the screen. The screen is just there. And people are getting killed in the movie. People are getting born. People grow old. All kinds of things are happening. Wars, man's inhumanity to man. It's all happening on the screen. But the screen is never affected. St. So you're like watching yourself on the screen then. I realize I am the screen and these are projections. St. But you see the projection of what we call Robert. Robert. Yes. You are aware as the screen of the image on the screen. Robert. Yeah. I identify with the screen. St. Is that Sahaja Samadhi? Robert. Yes. Kind of like a working nirvana. Robert, yes, it is. S R, I wondered this before and never got answered. Who thought this whole scheme up? S H, you did. Robert, well, you didn't. S R, I don't think I did. No, in reality, there's no scheme and nobody thought it up. It doesn't exist. S R, but it did happen though. No, it didn't. Sd. So who is dreaming? Robert. Nobody. There is no dream. It's an appearance. So what we call the cosmic dream itself is an appearance. Sr. Who is the author of the appearance then? Robert. There is no appearance and there's no author. What am I doing? Who am I? Laughter. Robert. Find out. Sk, there appears to be an appearance. Robert, always use the example. The sky is blue. When you go outside and look at the sky, it's a beautiful blue sky. But if you go up there, there's no sky. There's no blue. Sr, to human beings, there seems to be a consensus that it is, although it may not. It isn't really. But the way our perceptions are set up, we all have an agreement about these illusions that it's blue. Although I know it's just what I said, Robert. It's a collective dream. Collective. Robert, dream. Okay, collective dream. Robert, wake up. Step out of the dream. Wake up. S T. Why has it been said that one who is awakened has an obligation to go back and awaken others? What difference does it make, Robert? It isn't true. You're speaking of Buddhism, the Bodhisattva St. Well, even in yoga traditions, they say, "Go back, go back for the sake of humanity." Who tells you that, S.K.? Who can go back, Robert? Well, you can go back if you want to, but who tells you that, St. I understood that was a part of an initiation rite for Swami Hood. Robert, well, that's in Swami Hood. Yes, that's true for Swami Hood. If you want to be a Swami, go ahead. S T, I see. But the Swami's goal is not self-realization, is it, or? It is, but in a roundabout way. The whole idea is, if you want to save the world, become self-realized. For you become omnipresent and you become the world. So if you become realized, then your world is also realized. St. I understand it intellectually. St. On this path, there is no desire to cause anything right. Sh. Do we all appear realized to you, Robert? Of course. You see perfectly clear that we are fully awake, Robert. Everyone is. Why are we pretending otherwise, Robert? Who says you are? I didn't. Student slaff, Robert. Then you're not. What, Robert? Then you're not. Yeah.
Tape break restarts with student's question. SR. Numerous near-death experiences are starting to bubble up in the media and are kind of like a tear in the illusion or peek through the illusion. Robert, not really it's a bigger illusion. Creates a vast illusion. It incorporates all kinds of things. SR, but it does allow people to think more beyond the finite. Well like it says in the Upanishads. Once you start playing around with the occult, you can be stuck for thousands of incarnations before you become free. SD, Robert has explained to us before that the astral planes are all relative and the causal etc. They are all part of the cosmic dream or maya or illusion. SK, Robert, you spoke about quieting the mind and I noticed that it seems that the mind has gotten quiet but the remnants of that seems to be that same as when the mind is very agitated, I distinctly feel that. Robert, don't pay any attention to the agitation or the quietness. SK, so what the state of mind is don't pay any attention. Don't pay any attention whatsoever. SK, is it better to focus just on the awareness of that? Exactly. Let the mind take care of itself. If it gives you trouble take no notice, it'll get you out of trouble when you don't interfere. It's like when you have a friend, and if you don't interfere in your friend's life and you leave him alone or she alone, what does your friend do? He leaves you because you're not interfering in their life, they'll have nothing to do with you. When you have nothing to do with your friend, he'll go away. Though when you have nothing to do with your mind it'll dissipate. Act like you don't own it, it's not yours. ST, may I ask you something, you said you were asking your mother a question about, what am I doing here, so obviously you were very precocious of it as a boy. I'm asking about something I've heard ask about 20 times, I hope I won't bore the people. But I'd love to know something about your own experiences Robert. Robert, well not at this time, I've done it so often. Alright I respect that. Robert, because what good does that do you really? ST, it doesn't. It's just an interesting story. And you've heard many stories. You get right to the meat of the product, go within yourself and become free. It really makes no difference what I've been through. SH, you were with Ramana Maharshi for three years is that correct? Robert, the last three years of his life. How wonderful. You really leapt out. Students laugh, Robert, it wasn't my fault. Laughter. It wasn't your fault? Robert, it just happened. SX, Robert, I'm not going to ask you anything personal, but I'm also curious about a little child asking her mother, well, what am I doing here? And other questions and is it possible for young children of 3, 4 or 5 to be in a realized state? Robert, yes it is. Can you lose it and regain it? Robert, if you gain it, you can never lose it. If it's the real state, if it's the real thing you can never lose it. SK, is it then advisable to promote or encourage children to inquire within themselves? Robert, it's advisable but it won't necessarily happen. It all has to do with your karma. The karma of the children. I know children who have been with spiritual parents for years and they become wild. SK, they reject it become the opposite. Yes. S.E. Preacher's son. Robert. Exactly. It all has to do with your karma. Nothing on this path is predictable. S.X. Also Robert, if you feel that you had it as a young child, maybe it's not within the acceptance of the culture. You could be your real self and bury it. Periodically it emerges. In other words, you just don't feel all the time like you. Robert, not really because if you have that feeling within, you manifest it in your doings. That's what happened to me. I was always weird. SL, 
I thought you said, aware or weird. Weirdly aware. Lass. St. Did you see manifesting everything that you did represents what that is normal people that were unrealized might stop you from your awareness. Robert, I was aware, at a very early age, that this world is an act, a play. It isn't real. And I used to wonder why people couldn't see that. SD, did you talk to them about it? I stopped when I got smart. SR, did you see physical pain and psychological pain that way also, that it was not real and it was an act? Robert, in a way yes. I thought everybody felt the same thing. But, who was I to know? St, but you actually, you were realized then. Robert, who knows? Se, what happened to that sense of unreality? Did it deepen because I feel that all the time, that this is totally unreal, the world is totally unreal, but I've never been realized. It just feels unreal, real unreal. Robert, what makes you think you're not realized? S.E. Yeah. Never put yourself down. That's the true blasphemy. Blasphemy means when you put yourself down. Never do that. S.E. I have never had that experience that allowed me to have complete trust in myself. You probably don't remember. We've all had experiences but we don't remember, we forget. It's like the clouds hiding the sun and ignorant people say, there's no sun, there's no sun. But the sun is always shining. And when the clouds dissipate there's the sun. Our true self is always aware, always there. But, the clouds of ignorance appear to cover it up. All we have to do is look back at our true self and the clouds will dissipate. S.H., you make that real simple beautiful. Sen, I had a similar experience that Ed was saying about relying on the self and believing in the self. And I used to curse myself, at one time following a guru or another time trusting in myself, and then not trusting in myself, and not knowing what was real. Where was this thing within myself, and I am telling myself that you can get initiated, this or that and finally I had to confront myself. Very dramatic for me, and it was kind of an internal quest. I suppose it was a type of self-inquiry without realizing it, and I basically had gone from not believing in myself, not trusting in myself to the conclusion that in the sense that the self is all there is. And I found some comfort when I was reading a Buddhist Dharmapada where it says that, the self is lord of self, the self is the refuge of the self. You can only come to the self through the self. And I meditated on that and I thought about teachers and this and that and I realized as Robert was saying that to put down the self is blasphemy and according to this teaching it's not that you rely on a teacher, but you rely on yourself, you are your own teacher. Robert says he can take you to the mind but you better do your own digging. And besides that that we are the self and we can only find the self through ourself and not being dependent on a teacher or a teaching but your own consciousness, right here, right now. To identify with that. I think sometimes in satsang we get lost in so many different things, love or devotion or this or that, and we never grasp the present moment, that present moment is the self. That present moment, Robert says, find it and abide in it, and then follow it to its source. It's not something that we don't have. It's right here right now, just grasp that, find that. And I think in doing that you have to let the mind go, you have to let everything go. It's just to let go to grasp. SR, what does it mean find the present moment, how could you not find it? Robert, you're in it, you exist in it. You are the present moment. But, to stay there and not go into the past or the present or the future. Just to stay the way you are. You will always be safe if you can do that. As an example, in this second you have no thoughts about the past or the future. And as the seconds go, you start thinking. If you can keep your mind centered on the second where there are no thoughts, you'll be safe. 
In that space in between thoughts, from one thought to the next thought there's a break, stay in the break. Abide in the break. SR. It seems like, as long as there's no effort I'm abiding in the break, as soon as I try I just run out of it. You're not supposed to try. Just be. We have a meditation we use to help us, and I simply share this with you because it helps. In reality you don't have to meditate, but this will help you. And you should practice this wherever you go. When you're driving your car. First thing in getting up in the morning. Well don't do it while you're driving your car. Students laugh, you can use the last part when driving your car. So we'll practice it right now. Relax yourself and make yourself comfortable. If you want to you can close your eyes. Focus your attention on your breath. Emphasize your breathing. Breath from your diaphragm. Inhale deeply, slowly and gently. Expand your abdominals. Exhale through your nose and mouth. Contract your abdominals in slow motion. Take 10 deep breaths like that. This is to relax you. Breath naturally and just watch your breathing. Watch the sensations in your body. This is called Vipassana meditation what we're doing. Become aware of your sensations and your breath. Breath normally, if your mind wanders gently bring it back to your feelings. Witness your thoughts, do not interfere, just watch. Pause. Question. Who is the witness? Who is watching? Who is it that is watching my thoughts? And the answer will be I am. Now the meditation begins, you ask yourself, who am I as you inhale? For you exhale you say, I am he. And with your exhalation you say, I am not the body. Who am I as you inhale, between exhalation and inhaling, I am he. As you exhale, I am not the body. Long silence. Thank you for coming, remember to love yourself, to pray to yourself, to bow to yourself, to worship yourself. Because God dwells in you as you peace. And that's the end of that. At this point, the tape ends. Transcript 14. There are no problems. 11th October 1990. Robert, good evening. It's good to be with you again, and I know some of you can't wait until I start talking, but I tell you in truth, that it's in silence we receive the best message. Silence is another name for God. Quietness is a name for consciousness peace. Everything is found in the silence, not too much in the words in quietness. You should try to be quiet for as long as you can, especially when you are at home. Try to sit in the silence and quietness for as long as you can. It's in the silence where you will receive the message. It's in silence where pure awareness reveals itself to you. Never be afraid to sit in the silence. It's your greatest asset. I get many phone calls. One of the most frequent requests I get is how to resolve personal problems. I won this morning a phone call. And this person had so many problems, yet she has been meditating for 25 years, and she still has problems. There's only one way in which to remove all problems. I don't care how great the problem may be. It makes no difference how serious you think it is. There's one way to eliminate everything. And that way is to realize, I am not the doer. In other words, the problem has absolutely nothing to do with you, even though it appears to, it's only an appearance. What is a problem really? A problem is something that's not going your way. The world is not spinning the way you want it to, that's a problem. Things are not going the way you'd like them to or things are happening that you have no control of, you believe therefore you have got a problem. But, if you look at everybody on this earth, one person's problem is not another person's problem usually. Where do these problems come from? We've been told what's good and what's bad, so if we don't have the good that we think we should have, we've got a problem. 
but really nothing is good and nothing is bad, but thinking makes it so. If you therefore get rid of your mind, you will not have any problems. The main aspect of our teaching is to annihilate the mind and the ego. When the mind and ego are transcended some mysterious power takes over and takes better care of you than you could ever do yourself. But, first the mind and ego has to go. It's difficult for most Americans to do things like this because we've been taught to use your mind. Mind is everything and most of you believe if you don't use your mind you will vegetate. On the contrary, what is your mind? It is only a conglomeration of thoughts of the past and of the future. You usually worry about the past and dread the future. But your mind brings up all sorts of things not only from this life, but from past life experiences, samskaras, tendencies that you have. If you begin to realize I am not the doer where is the problem? To begin with the universe is your friend and can never hurt you. The substratum of all existence is love. Consequently, if you develop a consciousness of love there will be no problems, for love will take care of everything. Love is the same as absolute awareness, pure intelligence. Love is the same as Parabrahman. Again, it is the substratum of all existence. So if you have enough love there is no problem. The problem only arises when you think that you are human, and you think you're the doer, in other words, when you believe that unless I do this something terrible will happen. But, again something terrible is only a preconceived idea, it is not the truth. Something terrible is something you've been brainwashed to believe. You again believe you have to live a certain way and if you can't live this way it's terrible. You have to have certain possessions, certain things in your life. If you do not do this it's terrible. When you start to understand what, I am not the doer means, you become free of all problems. What does it mean when you say, I am not the doer? And this is what you should do whenever you think you've got a problem. To begin with you first realize that everything, and I mean everything, was determined before you came to this earth. Everything has been planned for you. Even the day you're going to give up the body. Everything is preordained. If you accept this and feel this, where is the problem? What's the worst thing that can ever happen to you? If you really analyze it, it's not that bad. It appears bad but it's not. And remember how the appearance works. It's like the snake and the rope. A man gets out of his bathtub in the dark and steps on a rope and he thinks it's a snake and he has a tremendous fear. When he finds out it's only a rope the fear dissipates and he's never afraid again of that problem. So, in this same instance when you believe and believe and think and think that you have a problem, it's like the snake and the rope. It's not really a problem, it's just a preconceived idea of what's going to happen if you don't get what you want. Because you have been brought up again, to believe that your life has to be a certain way, where in truth and reality, it does not have to be any way. As an example, if I go home this evening and I find out somebody has robbed my house and they have cleaned everything out of my house, is that a problem? It's all been preordained. This was determined before I came to this earth in my body. I will not react negatively. I will not react at all. Because I feel that I am the universe and all is well. There are no mistakes. Therefore I will bless the thief no problem whatsoever. If I'm walking across the street and a car passes a red light and hits me, it isn't the driver's fault. It has all been preordained. So why should I get angry? The point is that everything, everything that's happened to you has been preordained. There is nothing wrong. Now how should you handle things? The first concept is to realize that, I am not the doer. When you realize you are not the doer it means that your body is going through the experience but not you. The next thing you do is you ask yourself, who is having this experience? To whom does it come? It comes to me. I'm feeling the depression. I feel hurt. 
I feel out of sort. I feel that I've been robbed or hit by a car. I'm angry I'm mad. Who is this I? How can the I be so many things angry mad depressed hurt out of sort? You therefore hold on to the feeling of I. You hold on to that feeling and you follow it through to its source. The source of I is always consciousness or absolute awareness when you follow it to its source. But, now the only way you can follow it to its source is to forget about your problem, for you can't do both at once. So, you have to turn resolutely away from your problem totally away from the problem, as if it doesn't exist, and hold on to the me. Hold on to the me who thinks it has a problem. As soon as you begin to hold on to me or I, the problem will begin to dissipate all by itself, and you'll start to laugh, you will. For it is virtually impossible for your real self to have a problem. For your real self is omnipresent, absolute. Your real self is emptiness nirvana, pure intelligence. Your real self is omnipresent, it's everywhere present at the same time. When you understand who you are, no thing will ever disturb you again. Now people ask me, if I develop a sense of I and I follow it to its culmination, does that mean I will never have a problem again? And I have to laugh when people ask me that, for as long as you're identifying with I, it is the I that has the problem. Though when you say, will I never have a problem again? You're defeating your own purpose. For I is filled with problems, not only from this life but from previous existences. The trick is to follow the I to the source, and then the I will disappear totally, completely, absolutely. And when the I disappears, so does your problem. In other words, the world doesn't change but you do. Your reaction changes. Just like the screen and its images. When the time comes when you have transcended I, you become like the screen and like the images shown on the screen. Which means the world does not change. Everything in the world will present itself to you like it always does, but it will be like water off a duck's back. It will not be attached to you anymore. You will now have identification with the screen or with the self. Am I clear in this? In other words, the screen and the images are the same, but the screen is aware of itself and also of its images, and it's not affected by the kind of images you show. You can show a bank robbery taking place on the screen, a murder being committed, people making love, houses burning down, wars ensuing. How does that affect the screen? It does not. The screen is never affected, yet the images change one after the other. In the same way, yourself is like the screen. It is never affected by problems of any kind or any sort. The problems come upon the screen, they come and they go, but you remain the self forever. You never change. How do you begin to become this way? Every time you think you have a problem you must ask yourself, to whom does the problem come? After all, I am not the doer. I am not the body. I am not the mind. Though to whom does the problem come? And of course the answer will be to me. I feel this problem. The problem comes to me. You hold on to the me, you abide in the me and you go deeper and deeper and deeper within yourself, abiding in the I consciousness. As you keep doing this every day, every time a problem appears, the day will finally come soon when you transcend your sense of I. You totally transcend it. The sense of I disappears and you will become pure consciousness. That's it. Any questions? SN, Robert on the path, compassion and humility are important. Is it something that develops of itself, or is it something that we can work on? Robert, as you keep asking yourself, to whom does the arrogance come? Who's belligerent? To whom do these feelings come? They will begin to dissipate of their own accord. And in their place will come compassion and humility. Therefore you have to catch yourself. 
Whenever you feel arrogant, whenever you feel belligerent, whenever you feel out of sorts, do not go into that feeling. Do not hold on to it, but immediately ask yourself, to whom does this come? Who has this feeling? It comes to me, who's me? Who am I? And again you hold on to the I or hold on to the me. Again if you do this often enough, the day will come when you transcend me. And there will be truer love. SN, so it's not a matter of developing humility or compassion itself, but more recognizing its opposite. And what of Buddhist loving kindness meditation? Robert, yes, pure awareness is your real nature. Loving kindness is yourself. These other things seem to be attached to you, but they don't really exist. As you begin to inquire, then to whom do they come? You will find out that they never existed to begin with. And you'll be free of them forever. But, if you try to develop them any other way, it doesn't work quite as good. For you may develop kindness for a certain problem, but when it comes to another problem the kindness will not be there. Therefore you forget about the problem and you inquire to whom does it come. And when you follow the I, remember everything is attached to the I, the whole thing will be transcended into nothingness, and you'll be free. SN. That's assuming that we recognize when the ego rears its head. But, very often we justify our own actions. Robert, but now that you know you won't. Laughter. Thank you. Robert, that's only when you don't know what you're doing here that you justify your actions. But, since you're beginning to understand, you will be able to catch yourself more and more whenever you start getting egotistical, and you'll nip it at the bud, it will eventually disappear. S. U. I know what you say is true, I mean. Robert, how do you know? Laughter. Okay, most of what you say is true. Laughter, Robert, why? Now wait a minute. I found it a long time ago, but then like I went other directions and got back to the problems. Robert, if you really found it a long time ago it would have never left. It's you. Well no it hasn't left it's just that I've been playing another role, like playing roles and doing other things. But when you turn on the light the darkness disappears, forever. S U, right. Laugh so if you really had it, you'll have it now. It would never leave no matter what role you play. You can play any role you like. Like the screen, you can show any kind of picture you like, murderers, rapists, arsonists, lovers, whatever you like. But, the screen never changes, the image does. Therefore if you really had it once, you'd never change, no matter what you go through. How can you lose yourself? S. U. Well I don't know, sometimes I feel I do lose myself. It's impossible. S. U. Really well it feels like it I feel I've lost myself a lot of times. What is real is real you're referring to your ego. S U. Yeah right. Not yourself. S U. Yeah it's the ego right. We call the ego the self sometimes. S U. Yeah. It's a case of mistaken identity. S U. Uh huh. Remember the universe is your friend. It's on your side there's nothing against you. The only thing against you are your thoughts. If you learn to quiet your mind you'll have no problems. S U, well like you say that if a problem isn't your problem, you don't have a problem. You think you have a problem but you really don't have a problem? Robert, um correct. Then, didn't the ego create this problem? Robert, the ego's responsible for all your faults. S. U. Yeah. But the ego doesn't exist. Though you have no problems. S. U. Okay. Laughs. You think it exists and because you think it exists you have to get rid of it. If you just realized all of a sudden it doesn't exist you'd be free. But, as long as you believe it exists, you have to do all these techniques to get rid of it. 
because you refuse to accept that you have no ego. As you, I don't know, I guess I have a problem with trying to be responsible. Robert, responsible for what? Oh well responsible, but then again that's the ego, responsible for what happens. Robert, there's a greater power than you, that knows how to take of everything for you. All you've got to do is be still and quiet your mind and everything will work out harmoniously. We always think we have to get involved. There's nothing we really have to do. The world was here before you came. It'll be here after we leave. Your job is to find out who you are and what you're doing in this world by self-inquiry. S.H. If everything is predetermined as you said, that would leave no room for spontaneity, something just happening on its own freely. Robert, exactly. Nothing happens on its own. But everything happens. Robert, sure but not on its own. There's no such thing as spontaneous action, right? Robert, no. It appears that way but there's not. When I speak of being spontaneous, I'm referring to just doing everything in the moment, living in the moment, rather than planning for the future. S.H. It feels like it's spontaneous. Of course it does. The world also feels real. S.H. There's nobody making it happen. It's just happening. That's how it appears. But nothing is really happening. S.H. It's all just appearances dancing playing. It's called false imagination. There is absolutely nothing going on. S.H. Well that's nice to know. Laughs. Are you sure of that? I'm positive. S.H. Okay I'll take it on your word. Take it on your own word. Find out for yourself. Laughs. S.H. Well I haven't quite done that so I'll take it on yours to start out. You shouldn't. Laughter. S.H. I have confidence in you. Why I may be a big liar. Laughter. S.H. You could be maybe you are but I don't feel that in your space I have to go on what I feel. Why should you believe me at all? Find out for yourself. Seach. Well because you look a little like he does points to picture. I have confidence in him so some of it rubs off on you. That's an optical illusion. Sh. It's a nice one. Laughter. The truth is we all have to go within ourselves and discover our own truth. Otherwise we become an automaton. Sh. No 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 I'm not counting on you I'm not depending on you in any way or whatever. Rubber, good don't. I won't you can count on that. Laughter Robert good. SK, depend on who? SH, yeah who is there to depend on? Robert, any time you depend on a person, you will be disappointed. SH, right. SD, I think I make the error of thinking that, the things that are nice are not projections of my mind you know. Like when something's bad I say, well that's just a projection of my mind, but when I look at my six month old kitten or something, I think God if that's a projection it sure is a good one you know. Robert, that's the trick of Maya. A lot of Maya is really pleasing. Robert, of course. That's to keep you earthbound. The more you love something on this earth, the more earthbound you become. When I speak of having a consciousness of love, I'm not really speaking of human love. I'm speaking of pure consciousness, pure awareness, that's love. SD, but I can't help being grateful for the pleasant projections of my mind. Is that an error? Yes, because when you're grateful for the pleasant projections, what happens when your kitten dies? SD, laughs. I'll think about that when the moment comes. Then, you'll be totally disappointed. SD, it's worth the risk to me. But if you came out of both, if you're able to transcend the good and the bad, you'd be in a completely different state of love, and when something is alive you love it, 
and when it's dead you understand it because you realize nothing dies. SD, I already conceived of that. Do you be happy all the time? SH, no life doesn't die, but the vehicles which it inhabits temporarily, they certainly die. Robert, but where do the vehicles come from? SH, where do the vehicles come from? Where do bodies come from? Yes. SH, you haven't been told about the birds and the bees? Laughter. No, not quite. It comes from the same place a dream comes from. SH, aha, uh -huh, so it's a dream living dream. Mortal dream. You should actually forget about yourself, your body self, and focus on the eye. It's hard to understand for most Westerners that the body is only an appearance. It seems to be a fact, but it's not the truth. Now why not? If the body were real, it would stay the same always, wouldn't it? It would never change. You'd be the same way you were when you were a baby, but you change every year. We become older, we become different. So how can the body be real? As soon as it appears to be real old, and then it just drops away. What is real is immortal, can never change. You are reality. But your body is not. Therefore you are not your body. So what are you? Find out for yourself. Go within and discover who you are. SG, can you say in a relative sense that each of us, although it seems that we're separated, there's something inside each of us that is somewhat unique in a relative illusionary sense, but that we all have our own self-transmitter. If we connect with that within ourselves which seems to be slightly different, but if we really find that particular thing within our individual selves there's something that is guiding us. That we can submit to. Robert, that sort of becomes a little complicated. SG, I mean, it sort of becomes like an automatic pilot. There's something that is already there, but for everybody it's slightly different. There is one self. SG, there is one self. And all this is the self and I am that. SG, yeah. Though it's not really different for everybody. The same self is true for all people. You mean the way to get there? SG, the way to get there, it wouldn't be exactly the same per se, but there's a connection to that one self which is unique in a sense to each individual through their own self-experience which is, can't be described. You can say that if you like to. SK, if you were good at it, it seems that you could describe it too. Laughter. Robert, laughs. If you were going to complicate things. Just realize, I am that and end it. If every day you can say to yourself I I I I and use that as a mantra. That will suffice. Because I is the first name of God. And when you say I I, you are declaring the truth about yourself. So try that. There's no need to get technical, it's very simple. You are not the body, you are the self. I am that I am pure consciousness, that is your real nature focus on that and forget about everything else. Again it's difficult for a westerner to comprehend this because they say well what about my work? What about my family? What about this? What about that? Everything will be taken care of. You will never get to the point where you won't run away and live in a cave. You will go on just like you're going on. Only you will know yourself and you will be happy and peaceful all the time. You will have a feeling of immortality. A feeling of divinity of joy bliss happiness and you will act out of that. So if you want to bring peace to this world, do not change anybody or anything. Discover who you are and that becomes omnipresent. Look at all the peace groups we've had since time immemorial, what has it done for us? Things appear to become relatively worse. And that's not the answer trying to make people peaceful. The answer again is to discover your true reality. Discover yourself and you'll have peace. 
I'm not referring to the fact that you should become a dorma for people to step under or step on. You have to put on an act sometimes. Imagine yourself as being an actor or actress and that's how you act in the world. It reminds of the story of a little village where there lived a gigantic reptile, snake, who used to eat all the children. And all the parents were so worried they never let the children go out to play. One day the word got out of a great yogi, great master with all kinds of supernatural powers was coming to the village, he was going through. The fathers of the village approached him and they said, Master, please help us, this snake is eating our children, what should we do? The master said, I'll take care of it. And he went to the snake's lair, he spoke snake language and he said, Snake, come out. And the snake did and he rebuffed the snake and he said, I don't want to catch you eating these children again, leave them alone, do you hear? And the snake could do nothing but obey him, he said, Yes, master. The master left. Six months passed, and the master was walking through that same town again. He saw all the children playing peacefully. But, then he saw a crowd of children and he went over to see what was the matter. And there in the middle of the crowd was the snake, nearly dead. The kids threw stones at it, and the snake didn't respond. The kids kicked it. The snake didn't do anything. It was half dead. So the master chased the kids away and he said, Snake, what is the matter with you? Why do you let these kids do this to you? And then the snake said, But master, you told me not to do anything. The master said, You stupid snake, I told you not to bite, did I tell you not to hiss? Laughter. And so it is with us. Sometimes you have to act accordingly. For instance, when you're bringing up children, Sometimes you have to scream a little, do certain things, act a certain way, but you should never lose the fact of who you are. Always remember your real nature and always remember you're putting on an act. Therefore, when I tell you to have a consciousness of loving kindness and humility, I do not mean for you to become a doormat for people, but to act accordingly, remembering it's only an act and it will pass. Any questions about that? It's you. Well, that's what I feel like I'm doing is acting, listening. Robert, as long as you're aware that you're acting, you'll be at peace. It's you. And if I'm really aware of acting, I'm okay but not really putting on a show. Do not get caught up in it. It's you. Yet yeah, right. If you say you do have to do that, sometimes you have to do that. But as long as you're aware of yourself, you will not really hurt anybody else. You will hiss. Feel free to talk about anything you feel like talking about. SK, how does one understand they're not being the doer? That they're somehow accomplishing the practice of not being the doer. Robert, simply by inquiring, who am I? SK, who am I inquiry? Yes, to whom does the I come? From whence cometh the eye? When you follow the eye, the doership disappears. SK, and then? And yourself emerges. Through self-inquiry, you get rid of the idea that you are the doer. SK, and until then? Until then you do the best you can. SK, by self-inquiry or? Practice self-inquiry but do the best you can otherwise. Make every point of your life self-inquiry all during the day. SK. Excuse me. All during the day, as soon as you get hit by a question of some kind, or some kind of feeling or mood, ask the question to yourself, to whom does this come? SN. Robert, we could practice self-inquiry or you can practice surrender also. Robert. Of course. And does it matter if you go back and forth? Robert, it doesn't matter at all as long as it helps you. The render is when you say to yourself, not my will but thine, and you totally give up living your own life. That's not as easy as you think. SN, isn't saying, I am not the doer surrender? In a way it is yes. 
SD, is it the same as the popular expression let go, let God, is that surrender? Robert, yes it is. But, it's easier said than done. SD, oh for sure. Because it means you really have to let go of everything. Everything. You no longer have a life of your own. Everything is given up to God. SN, I mean when you're confronted with certain circumstances in your life and you're trying to deal with that circumstance, one way to deal with it would be through self-inquiry, to whom does this come? And another method if you find that may not be effective is to say, I am not the doer, not my will, but thine. In other words just surrender. Robert, or you can use just ordinary language. You can say take it God take it. That's what I'm saying. Robert, and feel a sense of release, a sense of peace, that's not your problem but God's. SD. But the concept of everything being predestined more or less is the same thing isn't it? Robert, yes. It's not even precisely God's will, as if it were some futuristic thing, but it's already determined. Robert, yet if you can't grasp that, go back to God and surrender to God. Whatever is easier for you. SD, but one might just change it a little relatively in the mind and think that God's will has already been decided. There's a slight nuance but maybe it's not important. Well you can also think that God's will is decided and you have to suffer and that's not right. Unless you've got to watch what you're doing. I recall in the Old Testament when I read it years ago, I forgot where in Chronicles or somewhere, it says something like this, the battle is not yours but God's. That yourself stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord. Esti, that's good. It's the same thing we're talking about. Come still, become quiet. SK, should one still do action? No? Robert, whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. It'll happen by itself. You have nothing to with it. SK, what if one finds no action happening? Then that's what you're supposed to do at the moment. SK, then that continues for what seems to be longer and longer. That's supposed to happen. SK, if that's supposed to happen? Yes. You have absolutely nothing to do with that. Take yourself away from that. SK, because it's a dream, it really doesn't matter. Your body is going to go through whatever it has to go through. But, it has nothing to do with you. SD, I think sometimes there's confusion when you say, you're not the doer and people think that means that they can just sit and life will happen to them or something, but, Robert, they won't be able to. SD, it's not quite that way. Even if they try to sit, they will not be able to. SD, unless they're not supposed to. That's right. Everything is planned you have nothing to worry about. Be happy. SV, can you intercede with my boss to fire me? Laughter. Robert, if you're supposed to get fired you will. Laughter. SD, if someone tells you to do something say, I am not the doer. Laughter. General talk between students and laughter. SN, Robert, if someone has mental anguish, say for instance, yet they may think, well this is predestined or I am not the doer and in a sense they may accept that, see what I am saying. Robert, sure the way to handle that is you do not fret over it or concern yourself. You simply ask yourself, to whom do those feelings come? Who's feeling this way? and it will go away, the feelings will leave you and you'll be happy. Then, one may think, say for instance, if you think I am not the doer and yet this comes to you, you may think, well, I'm supposed to experience this. Robert, not if you're practicing self-inquiry. Right, 
So that's why there's a difference between thinking you are not the doer and thinking that everything is preordained therefore I'm supposed to feel anguish or doing self-inquiry which kind of cuts through everything. Robert, see, everything is preordained. In other words, so if you're supposed to get hit by a car and have your legs amputated, it's going to happen no matter how you try to stop it. But if you're a Johnny and you were practicing self-inquiry, it won't matter because that's not where you're at. You're no longer body conscious. And you see it completely differently. You see a different world. You see wholeness, completeness, and it won't bother you. SN, what of the Ajani? Then you suffer. That's why the solution for the world is not to react to any condition. But to practice inquiry and ask, to whom does this come? That's the freedom you've got to do. As a matter of fact, that's the only freedom you've got. Not to react to any condition, but to turn within, that's the freedom you've got. SD, it's just that not reacting is so difficult on the earth plane at least. Is the next step to say, who is reacting? Robert, you can say that too if you like if it helps you. But, if you practice beforehand then if there's a war or the place is bombed, you will not be affected. In other words, don't wait until the last minute. SD, well true but say something like catastrophic happens or it appears to happen to you and you just can't seem bodily not react, then the next solution I guess would be to say who is reacting? To whom does this come? Robert, you can say that or you can practice mindfulness and become the witness to the situation. SD, yeah that's right be the observer mindfulness being the witness. As Arnold put a check through the other day, all the world's a play and that's one way of looking at it too. You do whatever you have to do. SV, or whatever you don't have to do. Right. Say, Robert, I've been thinking about my own experience here, and it seems to me that, since I've been coming to you, my mind is more active and not less active. Laughter, Robert, is it good though? I don't know, but I've interpreted it to myself in a certain way. Robert, well, is it good for you? Do you find that you're happier? Say, it's both good and bad, I would say. I can't say it's one or the other. This is the way I thought of it. Years ago I read a book, Exodus and Kabbalah, a marvelous book and its author says that if you read, he reads the tale of Exodus as symbols, as a metaphor of spirit. When the Israelites tried to leave Egypt, as he sees it, they were held by the body who was Pharaoh and so my mind turned to that and thought, as I tried to still the mind, the mind will use every cunning and every bit of power that it has. So that's why it's more of an intense experience since I've been coming here. Robert, of course. Well that's one way to see it, but the reason why I was asking you if you were happier is because sometimes it's not the mind any longer. You think it's the mind. But, it's your feeling of I that's doing that for you. It should make you happier. Give you a sense of peace. S.A. You mean the I would take delight in more mind activity? Yes. S.A. The true I? Yes. S.A. The real self? Yes. You don't become passive. S.A. That's interesting. That's a good point. Many people think when you become self-realized, you become passive and you just sit like me. Laughter. On the contrary, you do things better. It all depends on your bodily karma. SG, so you don't worry about what you do when you don't do. Robert, exactly. You do as much as you have to, and you don't do as much as you have to, it's all the same. Robert, what you're going to do will be done. It's all the same, it'll be done. SG, so we don't need to be still or not be still. It'll be done in any event. So why worry about it? SN, 
Arnold, when you're talking about trying to still the mind, I know that I've had a lot of problems when I was practicing formal meditation. And the problem was that I was trying to still the mind, and I think on this path is that you don't try to still the mind. You just be still, it's not something. It break dot, it's what you are. It's a hard thing to explain and it's a hard thing to understand. But, the more you try, the further away you go from it and now, rather than do formal meditation, I just try to pick up on the spirit of what this is about, and I sit in that same chair and without really trying to meditate or really trying to do anything, I just sit and be. Whether I'm observing my thoughts, whether I'm doing self-inquiry, or whether I'm surrendering. It's not the same all the time. Though it's not like I have a formal meditation where I'm trying to still my mind. I'm in a different place every time and whatever occurs, occurs. But, I do it very naturally, just sit in your own awareness as some would say. And I find I can do it for double, triple the period of time. Because I'm just sitting there, I'm not really doing anything. Whereas when I'm meditating, it's a strain, and I almost can't wait till I get up and get it over with. So it's not a matter of trying, just a matter of being. SD, that's a good point. SA, very good. SD. Robert has always explained to us that meditation is not realization. Meditation simply helps to quiet the mind, and so it's a means to an end, but it's not an end in itself. Robert, does God have to meditate? Who is he going to meditate on? Himself? S.H. It's the meditator who's in the way who's coming up to work. S.N. Actually it kind of turns all the way around rather than being a burden or what have you. It becomes very pleasant. Because if you're sitting there and you're almost saying okay what will the mind bring me now? And each thought and each experience is like a different bubble. And it becomes kind of joyous, you almost anticipate it. And it's hard to explain, it's a hard thing to get into I think. It's only by going within, experimenting within the laboratory of the body can get to that. And there's no doubt that the more you try the more difficult it becomes. No doubt about that. Experiment and see for yourself. It's not like trying to stop the thoughts, that's not it at all. Although the thoughts do need to be stopped. SD, didn't you say Robert that it's the stillness with the space between the thoughts that we're seeking? Robert, yes. Think of the space between words. That's your real self. SD, like the space, there's total emptiness or something. Oom. Um. Space is your real nature. Consciousness is space. Therefore, when there's space in your mind, there's consciousness, and that only happens when you become quiet and still. Therefore, all methods, yoga, hatha yoga, Raja Yoga, Ishtanga Yoga, all these yogas are simply to quiet your mind. But they take the long way around. Here we have no intermediates. That's why this is called the direct path. There's no fooling around, you go directly to go, you don't stop. Ask you, do you have a name for whatever you're talking about? Well, I don't mean it just like that, but I mean, is it Buddhism? Robert, no, it's called Jhana Marga. The path of wisdom. S.U., path of wisdom, that's what I wanted to know. S.N., but it's not different from what Ramana actually taught, right? Robert, the same thing. Did he have a title? Robert, did he have a title? S.H., label. Laughs. You need a label for it. SD, can jhana, in addition to wisdom, mean knowledge? Are they the same thing in Marga means path? Robert, yes. SK, self-inquiry is another term that's used. Robert, vichera self-inquiry, but it makes no difference what you call it, do it. SA, but Vedanta is the same too. In a way, Advaita Vedanta is the same in a way, yes. It's all the same thing. 
Sti, so the knowledge they're referring to is the knowledge of the self, right? Robert, yes, if you discover yourself, you'll know everything else. That's the only knowledge you really need. When I was at Ramana Ashram for the last time I met a judge, an Indian. And he said he never went to school. But, since he was eight years old, he's been practicing John Amarga self-inquiry. And when he was twenty-eight, he took the bar exam in India and passed, without any training. And thus became a judge ten years later. Though it shows, you when you know yourself, you know everything else. For again, your body's going to do whatever it has to do. There's a reason why your body came to this earth. It's going to accomplish the mission. And you have absolutely nothing to do with it. S.T., you've often quoted Christ who said, Be still and know that I am as God. I think all the great masters say the same thing. That's one of the most reassuring things that I've discovered. S.V., are you aware of your own mission? Robert, I don't have any mission. S.V., your body's mission. I don't have any body. S.V., what your body's going to do tomorrow? I have no idea. S.V., so for the body there's no such thing as a mission that was not accomplished in this world? No. S.V., always will be accomplished. The mission is for the Ajani, they see a mission, but for the Jani there's no mission. S.V., but your body whatever it's here to do will do whatever it was here to do no matter what. Yes. And that's how you see it. S.V., right. But in reality nobody's doing anything. S.V., right. Look at everything you do as an optical illusion. The appearance is there. I guess the example that I can give is that there have been some of these great masters like Ramana Maharshi, for instance, who died of a horrible case of cancer, but he was laughing all the way. Because he did not see it like that. His disciples did, and they were worried, but he did not see that at all. For he realized there's nobody to die because nobody exists. Nobody exists. Therefore there's no body to die. S.H. How did he perceive the pain of the cancer? Robert. He didn't. There was no pain to perceive. Robert. Well he claimed that there was a slight like a bee sting. S.K. But there was no one there to feel the pain. Robert. Exactly. They gave him operations without any anesthetic. Try not to think about your body too much. Just take proper care of it. Exercise it a little, eat the right foods, give it a good kick when it doesn't behave, treat it like you treat a dog, your pet, but don't think too much of it. Ramakrishna used to call his body his donkey and when it didn't behave he'd slap it, slap slag, behave. Though again to get rid of your problems and your faults and everything else by searching for yourself. And in that searching, you get rid of everything. Because all these things are attached to the eye. When the eye goes, everything else goes with it and you become free. Point of today's lesson is this. Never try to heal a problem at the level of the problem. It cannot be done. It appears as if it can be done. For instance, if somebody owes you money and you sue them in court. You may win the case and get back your money, but that's the level of the problem. But... Then you'll find somebody else gets money from you some other way. And it never stops. Until you find out to whom it comes. When you find out to whom the trouble occurs, who has this problem, everything disappears. And you're healed. S.D., would you say that applies to illnesses of the body for example? Robert, yes to everything. You would ask, to whom does this illness come? Robert, to whom does it come? And the answer would be to the body which is non-existent? Robert, exactly. Though you become free. Right, free as opposed to cured? Robert, yes, but who's not cured? Right. Robert, 
It's a completely new perspective. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 15 The mind is not your friend. 14th, October 1990 Robert, some of you look so serious. This is not a serious satsang, it's a lot of fun feel happy. Happiness is your real nature. You might as well get used to it, it's going to overtake you whether you like it or not. I want you to ask yourself a question, why am I here at satsang? Why did I come here? Did you come to observe the speaker? Compare him to other speakers? Most of you have gone to so many meetings, you're totally confused. Going to meetings for some of you is like going to the movies. You ask what's playing this week. The same way you ask who's speaking this week. But some of you never do anything about it. You listen to the message and then you go home and then you say well wasn't he or she an eloquent speaker that was great. What are we going to do now? Let's go bowling. Let's go watch TV and you forget all about the meeting until next time. Some of you have been going to meetings for 30 years or more. What have you accomplished? You have read every book that has been written. Where are you? Are you happy? Are you liberated? Are you free? Ask yourself. What we offer here is absolutely nothing, no thing. It's all in the invisible. It all has to do with consciousness and consciousness is your real nature. It's really what you are. When you identify with consciousness, you become your real self. When you don't you're a part of humanity struggling trying to become free. In order to understand the body-mind phenomena, that you are not the body-mind, you first have to understand what the mind is. What is the mind? It is merely a conglomeration of energy of thoughts, thoughts about the past and the future. That's all the mind is. The mind is not your friend. But, you can use the mind to accomplish many things. We've all been programmed brainwashed. It started when you were in your mother's womb. All of her feelings, all of her negation or positiveness, all of her energy was transferred into you. Not only that, but you have samskaras, past life tendencies, fears, prejudices that also go into your subconscious before you were born. When you come out into the world, you're put in your crib and you pick up the vibrations of your house. People fighting, parents hitting each other, loving each other, all that goes into your subconscious mind and makes up you. When you're at the age when you walk you go outside and play with some friends and your environment soaks into your subconscious mind. Then you go to school, you go to church, temple, synagogue and all those teachings go into your subconscious. Then you grow up you get a job, have a family and here you are. You're a product of preconceived ideas of concepts. But, is that really you? It's you as long as you believe it's you. When you get tired of playing games, something within you gives you a push. That's called the inner guru. Pushes you from within and something outside leads you to the right person, to the right book, to the right environment that you have to be because you have given up playing games. In other words, you've become tired of the world and you want liberation. Wanting liberation is very funny to me. It's like a person taking a shower saying, I want to get wet. Liberation is your very nature, you have to wake up to it, to realize it's you. So you are a conglomeration of thoughts, of energy, that has programmed you since you were a baby. And here you are. So now that you're here and you know how you've been programmed, what are you going to do about it? But let's talk a little bit about the mind a little more. If you know about the mind, you will know what you have to get rid of. The mind doesn't really exist. But, you've been programmed to believe that the mind is an entity that it does exist. Therefore you have to play this game, getting rid of the mind. Let's see again how the mind works. Let us compare the mind to the earth. Homer has two seeds. One is of nightshade, a deadly poison, and the other is of corn. The seeds are thoughts. 
farmer plants both seeds. And once the seeds are planted, the earth has no alternative but to grow in abundance, whatever has been planted. In the same way, when you accept certain thoughts, your mind grows those thoughts until they become your experience. And this is why you have the problems that you've got today. You have created them yourself. Take another example. Have you ever planted seeds? Here you have, some of you have. They, a farmer plants a rose seed, a tulip seed, a carrot seed, and let us imagine that these seeds are like us. They can think and talk like humans. And the rose seed says to itself, look at that beautiful rose, they say that I will grow into a rose. I will become a rose. But that sounds impossible, how can I ever be a beautiful rose like that? It's virtually impossible for me to do that. By that very thought the seeds would stagnate and not grow. The carrot seed says the same thing, I'm just a nothing, a nobody, how can I ever grow into a beautiful carrot? By that very thought the seed would stagnate. In the same way I say to you, you are absolute reality. You are Brahman infinite awareness consciousness. But you say how can that be? That sounds impossible. I'm just a lowly person, I'm nobody important. And you keep identifying with your body and your mind. As long as you identify with your body and your mind, the Lord of Karma Ishvara becomes your master. And you're under the jurisdiction of the Lord of Karma. Therefore you keep coming back again and again to this earth. And then, you become sort of earthbound, until you become totally free. But, you have to do this by yourself. You have to practice certain techniques. Somebody asked me just recently, you say that consciousness, reality, is like a screen and the body, the world are all images on the screen. And the question is since I believe I'm an image, can I change my image to a better one? In other words, as long as you believe that you're an image and you are not consciousness, can you improve your lot? Can you improve your lifestyle and change your image? Now, that is up to the Lord of Karma. As most of you know, everything has been preordained, determined before you took up your body. But, you have certain freedom depending on your karma. And the question really is, can you make a sick body well? Can you make a poor person rich? Can you make a depressed person happy? You're working at a mind level when you do this. You're not going to the ultimate truth, but you're working from your mind. And you can never find freedom and liberation by working from your mind. As an example, let's say for instance you manipulate your mind enough and you've got cancer. You've been working on yourself for 15 years. You use imaging techniques, you use mind control. You imagine that the white blood corpuscles are attacking the cancer and you finally heal yourself of cancer. You get written up in the National Enquirer. You appear on Phil Donahue. And you feel great and proud of yourself, you've healed yourself of cancer. Next month you're crossing the street, a truck hits you and you're dead. That's what happens through mind manipulation. Let's take another case. You're working on yourself to become rich. You take the proper real estate courses. You learn business administration. You use mind control. And after 20 years, you become a multimillionaire. You get married and have three children. Then your wife and children get killed in an automobile accident. Somebody kidnaps you and holds you for ransom. And you have to pay out $10 million. And you're back where you started from. What I'm trying to say is, working with the mind is not the answer. We bypass the mind. We realize the mind is not our friend. The idea is to annihilate the mind. To annihilate thought. How we do this? Through the method of John Amarga, through the method of Achara, self-inquiry, this is the fastest method to liberate you from confusion and ignorance. When you have a problem, when you have some sort of confusion, 
you simply ask yourself the question, to whom does this come? Who has this problem? Or who has this karma? And pretty soon the answer will come by itself, I do. Then you further ask, from where does this I come from? What is the source of I? You abide in the I, you hold on to the I. You start to use a meditation called I I, you simply abide in the I as long as you can. And you follow the I thread into your spiritual heart. You say to yourself, I I, 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 I. You remember that everything in the world is attached to I. Isn't it? Think of all the times in your life you've said I. I feel sick. I feel depressed. I feel happy. I feel out of sorts. Who is this I that you're talking about? Is it your body? Can't be your body. Because when you sleep, and you wake up you say, I slept. When you dream, you wake up you say, I dreamt. And when you're awake you say, I'm awake. To whom are you referring when you say I? Find out, go within, ask yourself, who am I? Where did I come from? But never answer, just pose the question, what is this source of I? And one day, you will realize that I does not exist. When you follow I to the source, one day, there will be like a big explosion, and you will see myriads of light particles all around you. You will then realize that the whole universe is nothing but a bunch of light particles. Yet this is not the answer. But where did the light particles come from? They come from no thing from nothing. And nothing is consciousness. Consciousness is like space. It has no shape. Yet it takes the shape of every creation. It appears to take the shape of the world of people. Everything is consciousness. Consciousness is like a chalkboard. And the objects of the world are like images on the chalkboard. You can draw any image that you like. You can draw an Indian. You can draw two people fighting. Two people making love. And then you erase it and draw something else. But, the chalkboard never changes. The chalkboard is always the same. Though it is with you. You go through all kinds of experiences. But, the realization is that you are not the experiences you're going through. Your consciousness that is your real nature. Think about that. My real nature to you. I am not a preacher, nor a philosopher. I am not a minister, nor a lecturer. I can only share with you the way that I feel. When I use the word, I am, I am referring to all of you. I am is another word for God, the first name of God. Another word for consciousness, omnipresence is I am. I feel that I am not the body nor the mind. I am absolute awareness. I am ultimate oneness. I am infinite intelligence, nirvana, emptiness, I am that I am. I am Sat Chit Ananda. I am Parabrahman. I was never born and I can never die. I am that I am. The world is a product of my imagination. I see the world as consciousness. I see the reality, perfection, peace, love, happiness. This is the real self and nothing else exists. Silence. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is where we sit around and rejoice in each other. And if there are any questions you wish to ask feel free to do so. If you wish to make a statement or say anything you like, this is the time to do it. But you don't expect me to keep talking, do you? Feel free to ask any question about the spiritual path or about anything else. S.L. Robert, I know that when we try to meditate or just clear our minds, you said that we could do it by asking the I question. Someone also mentioned before about clearing the mind by just trying to listen, is that also another way? Robert, it makes no difference what method you use to clear your mind. The idea is to make your mind quiescent. To make your mind still and calm. 
When your mind is still and calm you solve the problem. All the methods, self-inquiry, breath control, yoga, everything is to quiet the mind. Use whatever method suits you. You can become the witness to your thoughts. You can watch your thoughts as they go by. When you become the witness and you do not interfere with the thought process, the thoughts automatically begin to weaken by themselves until they dissipate entirely. You can ask yourself, to whom comes these thoughts? Whatever method you use is fine. But, by all means do something to still the mind. And again when the mind is still and quiet, everything will take care of itself. The secret is to quiet the mind. Your real nature is self-realization. When the mind is stilled, you just return to your real nature, to what you always were. SL, earlier you said that something was the fastest path to self-realization. That verse is what? Versus anything. It has been proven that vichara is the fastest path to awaken. Vichara means self-inquiry. By inquiring within yourself and finding the source of your existence, your body-mind disappears. And you become yourself once again. But, it's not for everyone. Most people seem to have some kind of difficulty. Then you've got to do what you've got to do and do whatever helps you. Breath control mantras, japa, repetition of God's name, everything brings you to the top. But, by all means do something. This is why I share these various methods of meditation with you. If you get tired of one you can use another one. If you practice something will give eventually. Something will happen to the one who practices. S.N. Robert ultimately, is there a need for meditation? Robert, no, we meditate just to find out that we don't have to. But, if some of us do not meditate we go crazy. The world has a hold on us. Therefore meditation is good again to quiet the mind. But, as I always say does God have to meditate? On whom should God meditate on? Himself? When you understand who you are, there will be no need for meditation. Until then do whatever you have to do. SN. Now when we say meditation, from the point of view from Jhana Marga, is what we're referring to just abiding in our own awareness. Robert, exactly abiding in the self in the eye. When you abide in the eye, you automatically go to the ultimate truth. And you discover that you are consciousness and you become liberated. By all means abide in the eye always. Then, so when we say meditation, we don't mean something that will take us away from that. Of course not. As I said before, I, I, is meditation. When you repeat to yourself, I, I, and do it with your breathing, you inhale and you say, I, you exhale and you say, I, I, I. The reason it's so powerful is because I is the first name of God. You're therefore speaking of yourself. And as you continue with I, I, ultimate reality will come to you. Sen but not just plain repetition on the level of the mind, but rather I as, I am that I am. Plain repetition is better than nothing. It's better than thinking of the world. Plain repetition will eventually lead you to realization. It will lead to the real I I most people think about their bodies, their affairs in the world. When you start using I I, you forget about the world for a while. And you will notice how better you feel when you're finished. How more secure you feel, how happier you've become. And that proves to you it has some substance. The more you continue it, the greater will ensue the feeling of happiness within yourself. SK, Robert, what role does grace play in self-inquiry? Robert, grace is always available, just like the sun is always available. But, Sometimes the clouds seem to block the sun and you no longer get its rays. But, it's always there. When the clouds dissipate, the sun shines once more. In the same way, the clouds of doubt, 
suspicion, apprehension, laziness keep the sun from shining or keep the grace from coming. But, the grace is always there, you just have to recognize it, realize it's there, and take part in it. There's no one to give grace. Grace is consciousness, it's the same thing, it's always there, it never went away. SD, then why is it said that the Guru bestows grace in three different ways? This I read in the teachings of Maharshi. And it can be by look or thought or touch. Or what is this bestowing of grace, and is that somehow different from the grace you're talking about? Robert, it's the same thing, this is for the benefit of a Johnny. Of those who are in ignorance. It is said that the Guru bestows grace by touch, by look, by feel, and that does happen. For the person who is taking part in that kind of grace actually feels it when it happens. But it's always available for the mature student. It's always there. You just have to awaken to it. But they're both the same, there's no difference. SL, how do you know when you're awakened to it? Robert, oh you'll know. Laughter. You will feel a feeling of immortality, you will feel a peace that you never dreamed existed. You will feel a bliss that's unworldly. It cannot be described. But you will feel it yourself. SL, then what is grace? Grace is love. Grace is realization. Grace is awakening. Grace is consciousness. Okay, that's all there is, isn't it? Robert, yes, nothing else exists. SM, but is it really necessary for Grace Robert? Robert, for some people, yes, for some people, no. It depends on your karma. You have an inner guru, and if you trust the inner guru, the inner guru will lead you where you have to go. It may lead you to an outer guru, or to a tree, or to a river, or to a book, or to yourself. But you have to surrender to your inner guru for this to happen. When there is total surrender you will find you're at the right place, doing the right thing. SL, what part does choice play in this? Robert, there is no choice. The only freedom you have is not reacting to conditions. The only freedom that exists is to turn within and transcend the whole bowl of wax. Transcend karma, the world and God and become totally free. Though in a way you can say you have a choice. A choice whether you're going to turn within and not react to circumstances or you're going to react to circumstances and play the game all over again. That choice is yours. Everything else has been determined prior to your taking birth. Now that's a tough statement to make to a Westerner who has a big ego, but I can assure it's the truth. It is only when you're not realized as it appears that you get involved in the karma trip. SM, is there any indication when one is coming near to realization, Robert? Robert, sometimes there is and sometimes there's not. Usually it's like turning on the light. You've been in a room full of darkness for years and you turn on the light, the only indication is. Tape break as student continues. SL, if everyone got into that state in this lifetime, it would not be so bad to come back and see what kind of a world that people who are realized can make. Robert, everyone will never get into that state. It's the way of this world. This planet is like a third grade planet a planet of duality. The idea is to get off the planet and not come back. Let God take care of the world. Find yourself and become free and then see if you ask that question. We always get concerned about the world. But remember you are the world. The world comes from your mind, from your thoughts. You are the creator of the world by the very thoughts that you feel. When your thoughts go out, the world is created when you pull your thoughts in, the world disappears. SD, so theoretically we all became realized there would be no world to come back to? Robert, exactly because the world never existed to begin with. 
The world is like an optical illusion, like a dream. It exists because you exist. But what happens to the world when you're in deep sleep? It no longer exists, but you exist. Find out who you are. SL, so there really is no question, is there? Robert, no, there's not. But, as long as you feel that you are not the self, then there will always be a question. For if you are the self, to whom will you ask a question? For yourself is omnipresence. SL, it seems sad to leave this world like. It seems sad to leave this world? S, no, to leave this world in such an awful state without trying to make it a little better. What have you got to do with the world? The world has always been here, and will always be here. Set yourself free, and then see if you're concerned with the world. Now what I mean by that is this, the world does not exist as it appears. As long as you believe in the world you're going to ask the question you just asked, because you think the world is an appearance of reality. But, it does not exist. Let's say for instance as an example, you have a dream and in that dream the world is a terrible mess. People are killing each other, there are earthquakes, cataclysms, man's inhumanity to man, it's just terrible. Then you wake up, what happened to the world? You forget about it, don't you? You forget about your dream and you concentrate on this world. In the same way, when you wake up from reality, this world disappears in the same way the dream did. And only you exist as the self or as consciousness. SK, and from there whatever happens, happens. Robert, there's nothing to happen, to whom shall it happen? SK, yeah, or from a Johnny's view, whatever happens, happens with that person. That's how they affect other people. Well, to a Johnny, all kinds of things are always happening. But, to a Johnny, nothing is happening. SK, but it's interesting because I can view you and see how you're affecting hundreds of people, benefiting hundreds of people, and yet to you, this world doesn't exist per se. Yet from my viewpoint, as an Ajani, I can see what benefit you're making by attaining realization. Robert, well instead of seeing what I'm doing, why don't you see what you're doing? SK, I'm not doing. Find out who you are, never mind me. SK, write my own motivation, but I'm sort of hoping to shed some light on your question. SL, maybe what you see of course, we really want to be taught something larger than what we are experiencing. We wouldn't be here if we wanted to be more into the world and take a physical stand. But, we've tried it and realized that it's impossible to change the world. Robert, people have been trying to bring peace to this world from time immemorial. Remember our civilization is not the first one on this planet. This planet is billions of years old and we've had civilizations more advanced than we are today and they've all been wiped out consequently don't worry about the world. Find out who you are and let the world take care of itself. SL, it seems like the world is like an obstacle path for the soul to be realized. If you don't pass then you come back again or something like that. That's a nice way to put it. It seems like that but in reality, there are no obstacle paths. For whom is there an obstacle path? Ask yourself. If you ask yourself that question, and you follow the answer within yourself, you will realize there never was an obstacle path. That you've always been free. SL, but in order for us to be free, it seems like we need to learn certain lessons. So we keep coming back to achieve that to be free. It seems that way, but the only lesson you need to learn is that you are not the body-mind phenomena, that's all. Everything else will take care of itself. SL, that's why we keep coming back, it's too simple. That's right, we become attached to worldly things and the world pulls us back over and over again. It's part of the dream which is called Maya. It appears very strong for most people. That's why most people can never get on a path like this because it's too much for them. SU, 
It seems the natural world, the world that was here before people, it seems to me that's a part of universal existence, just the trees, air and water. Robert, when you go to sleep, what happens to the trees and the air and the water? They no longer exist for you. They only exist when you wake up because they're created by your mind. Though so ask yourself, to whom is the trees and the water and air for? And you realize it exists because of your ego. When your ego is disintegrated, everything else goes with it and you become free. The everything that exists in the world so to speak must perish. The trees last for so long. The mountains last for so long. People last for so long. Everything has to perish. Everything that is born must die. So find out for yourself, who is it that was born and who has to die? Ask yourself. Inquire within yourself and see what happens. For whom is there birth and death? Find out. Now when most of you leave here, you're going to forget what I said in about 10 minutes. And you're going to say now what should I do now? I think we'll go to a restaurant and eat, or I'll go to a movie, or worry about my future, or I'll get ready for work tomorrow. It is only one in a thousand that thinks about these things all the time and does something about it. In the Bhagavad Gita it says, out of a thousand, one searches for God, and out of a thousand that search, one finds him. Find out where you stand as far as that's concerned. Where do you fit in? Do you still have fears, frustrations, doubts, suspicions? Are you still worried about your job or worried about the world or worried about your body or your life? This makes you earthbound. It keeps you from becoming liberated. To become liberated you've got to forget about your little self about me 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 all the time. And realize that you are the self of the universe. Realize that everything, the whole universe is the self and I am that. All is well. As you, within the universe, is there contained other stars and planets, is that part of the universe? Robert, yes. That we're part of? Robert, everything is part of the dream. That's part of the dream? Robert, the planets, the stars, the universe, everything, even God. It's all part of your dream. When you wake up there's no separation between you and reality. You become all-pervading, ultimate oneness, pure consciousness, and there's no room for anything else because you are all there is as the self. So the good news is, you can become a Jiva Mukta liberated while in the body in this life. But, you've got to make it happen, it's up to you. What I mean is, you've got to realize that you're not the body or the mind. That's making it happen. It always begins in the morning as soon as you wake up and open your eyes. What is the first thing you think about? Try to catch yourself. When your mind starts to wonder and you start to think about your work or your dishes or your breakfast or whatever. As soon as you open your eyes realize, I exist, I exist. Not as a body or a mind, but I exist as consciousness. And then ask yourself, then for whom is the body mind? And the answer will be for me, I feel it. Hold on to the me, follow the me to its origin, to its source. And you will find that me never existed. That's a beautiful way to start off the morning. But, catch yourself. That's how it begins. When your mind starts thinking, catch yourself. Keep your mind from thinking, go back to the self. Go back to self-inquiry. It will become easier and easier as you do it. Every week we have a reading from one of the great spiritual traditional books. And Narada picked out something today that confirms what we've been talking about. So feel free to do it Narada. If you want to make some announcements first go ahead. Narada, the man who is pure at heart is bound to fulfill himself in whatever way he is taught. The worldly man seeks all his life but is still bewildered. Detached from the senses you are free. Attached you are bound. When this is understood, you may live as you please. When this is understood, 
the man who is bright and busy and full of fine words, falls silent. He does nothing, he is still. No wonder those who wish to enjoy the world shun this understanding. You are not the body, your body is not you. You are not the doer, you are not the enjoyer. You are pure awareness, the witness of all things. You are without expectation, free wherever you go. Be happy. Desire and aversion are of the mind. The mind is never yours. You are free of its turmoil. You are awareness itself, never changing. Wherever you go, be happy. Receive the self in all beings, and all beings are in the self. Know you are free, free of eye, free of mind, be happy. In you, the world arises like waves in the sea. It is true, you are awareness itself. So free yourself from the fever of the world. Have faith, my child, have faith. Do not be bewildered, for you are beyond all things. Heart of all knowing. You are the self, you are God. The body is confined by its natural properties. It comes, it lingers a while, it goes. But the self neither comes nor goes. So why grieve for the body? If the body lasts till the end of time or vanish today, what would you win or lose? You are pure awareness. You are the endless sea in whom all the worlds like waves naturally rise and fall. You have nothing to win, nothing to lose. Child, you are pure awareness, nothing less. You and the world are one. So who are you to think you can hold on to it or let it go? How could you? You are the clear space of awareness. Pure and still. In whom there is no birth, no activity. No I. You are the one and the same. You cannot change or die. You are in whatever you seek. You alone. Just as bracelets and bangles and dancing anklets are all of the same gold. I am not this, I am he. Give up such distinctions. Know that everything is the self. Rid yourself of all purpose and be happy. The world only arises from ignorance. You alone are real. There is no one not even God separate from yourself. You are pure awareness. The world is an illusion nothing more. When you understand this fully, desire falls away. You find peace. For indeed there is nothing. In the ocean of being there is only one. There was and there will be only one. You are already fulfilled. How can you be bound or free? Wherever you go be happy. Never upset your mind with yes and no. Be quiet, you are awareness itself. Live in happiness of your own awareness, which is happiness itself. What is the use of thinking? Once and for all give up meditation, hold nothing in your mind. You are the self and you are free. Robert, go Henry. Henry, when the virtuous people die, they move towards and live in heaven. The period of their sojourn in heaven may extend 80 to 240 years, it is popularly believed. They are after the termination of their period of stay in heaven, again reborn on earth. After death, the virtuous people enjoy the pleasures in heaven as a reward for their merits, their virtuous deeds, their services and their sacrifices. When their merits are exhausted, they return to earth. What Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, they having enjoyed the spacious heaven world, their holiness withered, come back to this world of death. Following the virtues enjoying by the scriptures, desiring desires, they attain the transitory. But, when a virtuous person comes back from heaven to the physical world, he takes birth in noble and virtuous families. This is the advantage of virtuous deeds. There is a double retribution or reward for man's virtuous actions. He gets after his sojourn in heaven and return to earth, a good birth with good surroundings, environments and opportunities for his good actions and inner evolution. S.H. 
and so we have justified caste. Robert, yes, as far as that goes. S. K. Yeah, but if caste is maintained, purely it's really karmic. But nowadays the caste are so mingled and all that, and it doesn't hold true any more per se. Robert, that's true. I wrote this in 1962. Reality has nothing to do with this. But this is the appearance. It's how it looks. S. L. Oh, but the caste system is still operating in India. The caste system is all over India. S. L. If you're born a poor Indian, there's nothing you can do about it. If you're born a poor American, you're homeless. S. K. It doesn't work with karma anymore. If the caste system's intact, like it was a long time back, then it works with karma. Robert, things have changed with the caste system, but karmically, nothing ever changes. Go ahead, Henry. Retrogression into animal births. Hindu scriptures say that a man may become a deva or a beast or a bird or vegetable or a stone. According to his merit or demerit, the Upanishads also corroborate this statement. The Karbala also agrees with this point. But Buddhism and some Western philosophies teach there is no more retrogression for a man when once he takes human birth. There is no necessity for him to be born as an animal for the sake of demerit. He can be punished in a variety of ways in the human birth itself. When man takes the form of the deva, all human samskaras, habits, and tendencies will remain dormant. When a man takes the form of a dog, animal tendencies, habits, and samskaras only will manifest. Human tendencies will remain suppressed. Some dogs get royal treatment in the palaces of kings and aristocratic people. They move in cars, eat good food, and sleep in cushions. These are all degenerated human beings. Laughter. Robert, do you want to read Mary? S M. Oh no, I just said I'd like to have a copy of this. Have we got any more copies? Anybody like to continue reading? S M. I'll read if you like, Robert. Okay, good. Henry, at the bottom of the first column, first page. Start at the top of the second column. Mary, philosophy of death. Occasionally, in moments of calm contemplation, when we are thrown in the introspective mood, we sometimes wonder why God, who is such a kind, compassionate, and merciful Father, could have included death in the scheme of life. Fact is, death comes as a necessity to egg us on in our evolution. Could you just imagine of a world where there would be no death? Overpopulation even today poses as a difficult problem with all the deaths that are taking place in normal course. So imagine the extent of chaos and confusion that would result if there would be no death. Life would no longer be worth living. It would become a dull drab drudgery. Living in the same body, we cannot grow beyond our bounds and ties of attachments. Complete separation is necessary to make us cautious of our attachments. During our brief sojourn in this world, we get so much attached to this terra firma that when death knocks at our door, we feel too reluctant to be torn from our family surroundings and leave our material possessions so painstakingly created. Therefore, to completely snap the tie of attachment, death is the only solution. Death is not only a necessity for those who die, but it is also necessary for the evolution of those who are left behind. Death helps dissolve responsibilities on our unused shoulders. They accept the challenge of life and grow in experience. Father suddenly passes away. Son takes up the new responsibility, bears it, and enriches his treasure house of experience. When a child dies in his infancy, it may not be much of an assimilation of an experience for him, except for certain karmic purgation. But it means all the more for those who are left behind. 
We have to grow beyond attachment, ego and desire to enjoy immunity from sufferings. Thus by helping us transcend our world attachments, death plays an indispensable role. In fact, individual soul could never grow without death. The evolutionary process is a long one. It requires various types of experiences of poverty and riches, of purity and pollution, of ignorance and education, of every country, clime, culture, race and religion. It requires experiences of both the sexes as well. In a single body all this is not possible to assimilate. Therefore by virtue of necessity we die and are born again under different circumstances for a different set of experiences. Robert, you're a good reader Mary, would you like to read more? Mary, I'm done for fifteen years laughs thank you Robert. Mary continues, assimilation of experiences also not possible without death. In the postmortem states, the consciousness widens. The deeds of the past lifetime have a reaction. And we learn many new lessons. We often notice monkeys devouring edibles rapidly and then masticating them at leisure. Similarly we masticate our experiences in a higher and wider light which shines after death. During our stay in the astral plane, the scenes of our past life flip past our eyes one after another. We begin to relive our lives with the difference that now we are identified with all the actors in every situation. We feel as we did when we tortured someone as also like the one who was tortured by us, we experience the pain of the latter. This process exhausts our karma to a degree and provides us a usable lesson. Karmic purgation occurs when both the oppressor and also the oppressed have been able to excuse each other. Retaliation only augments karmic bondage. Death comes as a necessary drop scene between two births. It is a drop scene in as much as the activities go on behind the curtain. Thus after the assimilation of one set of experiences of one life, the individual soul is provided again with a new set of mental, emotional and pranic body, eminently suitable for his next reincarnation. In this manner from life to life, he travels assimilating his diverse experiences. In normal course the period that intervenes between two births is about four to five hundred years in occult parlance. Our one year is equal to one day of Tetris. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 16 It's all a dream. 18th, October 19, 190 Robert, I always take my dog for a walk in the morning and I go to the park, where I meet interesting people. There's a little old lady who walks in the park with me every once in a while. He is very spiritually inclined and we have discussions. This morning she asked me a very interesting question, we will focus on that. She asked me Robert, you say that the world is phenomena and in continuous change, change, change. And you also say that consciousness is reality, the substratum of existence. Now we can confirm that the world is changing because we can see it, but how can we confirm consciousness? How do we know that it is not changing? And I thought it was a very interesting question. Now you know that you exist, don't you? Everyone is aware of their own existence. When you go to sleep, and you are in the state of deep sleep, you still exist, but the world does not. And as far as you are concerned, the world only exists when you are awake. But once you go to sleep, the world no longer exists for you, and you are in a state of dreamless sleep. A state of dreamless sleep is like jhana, self-realization, except you have consciousness. But, there is no denying that you exist, for when you wake up you say, I slept well. The state of dreamless sleep is like a person who died. It gives you an idea of what happens to you when you die, so to speak. You are in a state of dreamless sleep, and you usually stay like that for about two to four hundred years earth time before you do anything else. Though the first state of consciousness is dreamless sleep, 
and you exist in dreamless sleep. And you also exist when you dream. Take a look at your dreams. A person dreams he's married and his wife has cancer. He's dying of cancer. And they both come to see me. He says, what should we do? My wife has had ten operations and is dying of cancer. And I say the only proper thing to do is turn within and not react to it because everything is determined before birth. They look at me and say that's not a practical answer. We want something practical. And I say that's the best I can do. It's a dream. Hold on. You will awaken soon. But that's not good enough for them, they are caught up in a dream. Now remember, you are dreaming the dream, everything is going on in the dream. In your dream there is a sky, there are flowers, there is a moon, there are people just like the world. And the dream seems to be external from you, but if you investigate you see the dream is all taking place in your mind. While you are dreaming you still exist as the dreamer. And in the dream somebody comes to you and tells you, look, there is going to be a recession. There is going to be a failure of the banks. And you've got money tied up in stocks and bonds, IR accounts and everything else. Everything is going down. You ask, what should I do? You both decide, let's go see Robert. So you come to see me and I say, well, you can do two things. You can take your money and we'll build a large ashram and help others see the truth that it's only a dream or give everything away to the poor, to the homeless, and you won't have any problems. So they both say what? Are you crazy? That is reminiscent of a story about Jesus. If you recall the story of when Nicodemus came to him. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and very wealthy. He was embarrassed to go listen to Jesus because his kind never heard anything like that. They never went out, they were snobs. He sneaked out one dark night, and he came to Jesus and said, Master what should I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Entering the kingdom of heaven simply means, to be self-realized. And if you recall Jesus said, Give all your worldly goods to the poor and follow me. Nicodemus couldn't handle that and left. And that was the end of that. So we go back to the dream, and we say to both people, This is only a dream, can't you see? Do not take it so seriously. They both leave. Then somebody else comes to me in a dream, and he says, Robert, I've got a lot of anger in me. I do not trust anybody. I have no friends. I feel inferior and have low self-esteem. What should I do? And I say, turn within, and you will become free and liberated, because it's all a dream. And he says, I can't do that, I want a practical answer. And he goes away. So you're here having a dream all this time, but then you wake up and it's all gone. It never happened. Your wife never had cancer. There never was a recession. And you were never angry. But, you still existed while you were having a dream. So now you existed during dreamless deep, and you existed during the dream, and now you are awake, and you still exist. Though you see the part of you that exists is permanent. It is the I am the self. It is consciousness. Everything else is illusion, it comes and goes. It is always changing, changing, changing. You are real, what you appear to be is false. Identify with the real, not with the false. Do not accept anything you see as reality. The only freedom you've got is to turn within and not react to any condition and you will be safe. One day you will awaken from this dream, for this is also a dream and you will be free. So let's talk about you. Look at all the problems you think you have. Where do they come from? How do they get there? Why do you become upset over them? Think of all the possessions you are afraid to lose. Think of all the sicknesses you think you are going to catch or that you think you have. You look at the world and you become sick because you don't like what you see. You have to ask yourself, for whom is the world? For whom are these problems? 
For whom is the anger? Am I really the doer? Am I the body? Am I the mind? What am I? Ask yourself. Now how does a Johnny think? I can tell you. They there is a man, he's a Johnny, he's the manager of a bank. He's got two sons that he loves dearly. One day the two sons are going to New York by plane, and the plane crashes. Both sons die. He takes care of the funeral arrangements, goes to the burial, and when it's all over goes back to work like nothing happened. His wife and his friends and relatives approach him and they look at him and say, You heartless bastard, how can you treat your children like that? They loved you so much and you loved them. You don't seem to care that they died. You never shed a tear. You were not upset at the funeral. How can you be like that? And he smiled and said, Sit down with me. Let me explain, a day prior to this I had a dream, and in that dream I was a king and married a beautiful princess. We had six lovely sons. I used to go hunting with them and fishing, and we truly loved each other. Then one day there was a hurricane and all six of my sons got killed. But then I woke up. So my question to you is, for whom shall I mourn? For the two children who were killed in this dream, or for the six sons that were killed in the last dream? This is how a Johnny sees things. What do you think of that? It had nothing to do with being heartless. It had nothing to do with not having compassion. There is a great compassion, but there is a deeper wisdom, a deeper knowledge. There is no such thing as birth, and there is no such thing as death. Nobody is born, no one dies, and no one prevails in between. Nothing that appears exists. Only the self exists. And all this is the self and I am that. You are absolute reality, ultimate oneness. You are consciousness emptiness Sajid Ananda. That is your true nature. Why not abide in it and be free? Why think about other things? Even while I am talking to you, some of you are thinking of other things. You can't help it. It's force of habit. Empty your minds. Come still and everything will happen of its own accord. There is really nothing you have to do just be still. Be still and know that I am God. I am as the self. The self is omnipresence. This means that everyone, everything, both sentient and insentient, is God or consciousness. Accept that and be free. Why do you think of other things? Why concern yourself with your body or your mind or the world? Why bother with yourself? Quit trying to solve problems. This doesn't mean that you are going to do nothing, for as I have told you so often, your body is going to perform the acts it came here to do. If you are meant to be an accountant, you are going to be an accountant. If you are meant to be a preacher, you'll be a preacher. If you are meant to be a homeless person, you will be a homeless person. But, you have absolute nothing to do with it. For you are para-Brahman, absolute reality, and you have absolutely nothing to do with the workings of your body or your mind. Allow your mind to say and think the way it will, only don't identify with it. Allow your body to do what it must but do not react to it. Everything will happen of its own accord when you allow your mind to think of its own accord, the thoughts begin to dissipate and soon you have empty mind. Empty mind is consciousness, realization. That's all you have to do, have an empty mind. But as long as you believe I am the doer and you force yourself to have an empty mind, you never will because the forcing makes the mind stronger. Rather observe your thoughts, watch the mind thinking, and leave it alone. Do not identify with your thoughts or with your body, for in realty there is no body and there are no thoughts, for there is only the self and you are that. All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. There are no mistakes. None have ever been made, none are being made, and none will ever be made. It's all perception. 
It's how you perceive things. For instance, when you look at me, what do you see? If I ask each one of you, I get seven, eight, nine different answers, but the truth is you are seeing yourself. I am simply a mirror for your own reflection, but I am a self-contained mirror. Though all this is taking place as an image on myself, all of life experiences are images on the screen of eternity. The screen is real. The images change. Consciousness is the screen. When you identify with consciousness, you become consciousness. When you identify with the image, you enhance the image, and you worry and fret and fear, and you have all sorts of experiences. As soon as you begin to identify with reality, with consciousness, all fear leaves you, all doubt leaves you, all false thinking leaves you, and you become free. But that's the only free choice you get. Everything else has been preordained. The free choice again is: with what are you going to identify with the image or the screen? If you identify with consciousness, you are no longer reacting to conditions because you understand that all things are for a short time only. Then they disappear. Consequently, nothing will irritate you, nothing will upset you, nothing will bother. You, for you are now appearing as only an image, and will soon disappear. Look at this planet, which has been here for billions of years. There have been civilizations on this planet for billions of years, and they come and go. We had civilizations on this planet that surpassed our existence today. They are all gone, no trace. As a matter of fact. A couple of years ago, there were some excavations in Egypt of a city that was buried about 5,000 years ago. The only thing left is a sign. They deciphered the sign, and it said, "My name is King So and So, and this is my city that will last forever." Though today we think we are going to make this a better world in which to live, and we are going to save the world, and so on. The world has its own collective karma. It's going through a phase. Your job is to save yourself. If you find yourself in a burning building, you do not stop to admire the pictures on the wall. You get out of the building as fast as you can. Though, when you know you have a short time in this existence, you do not stop to play the games of life. You try to find yourself and become free as fast as you can. Any questions? S. Perhaps you could say something about compassion. Over at Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, there is a dear friend who is suffering, and I would like to see him soon. I feel a natural concern and compassion for his suffering, and I don't know what to say or do other than to be with him. Robert, you automatically have compassion. That's very good. By all means, you should help each other out of great compassion. And you should also be aware of the truth that there is no suffering and there is no death. But of course, you can't tell him that because he is really suffering. Therefore, you should do your best to help him while you can, and have great compassion for him. Remember again that what you are, what you do, is all preordained anyway. If you are going to have compassion, you will. What I am saying is, don't worry about it. Just do what you have to do. Hold on to the truth. Realize the truth. I am not the body. This is a dream, but it appears real. But again, don't tell him that. He is suffering, and you have to help him. By all means, you should have compassion. Before you become self-realized, the greater the compassion you have, the better. But you don't shout it from the rooftops. I'm compassionate. I'm a loving person. You keep quiet most of the time. By your actions, people know what you are. S. You see all things as yourself, and therefore you are compassionate for yourself. Robert, there is only one self, and what you feel towards somebody else, you are feeling towards yourself. It becomes automatic. What you do to anybody else, you are doing to yourself. If you help somebody else, you are helping yourself, and if you hurt somebody else, you are hurting yourself. What your body does is karmic. 
it has nothing to do with you. There are many ways to look at this. When you realize, I am not the body, I am not the mind, and I am not the doer, then you are safe. But, as long as you think you are doing something kind for somebody, then you want a reward, you want recognition. But, when you know there is only one self, you are automatically kind to everybody. And virtue has its own reward. So by being kind, compassionate, even though you may not become self-realized in this life, you will be born to better parents, and you will be a step ahead of the game of life next time around, if there is such a thing. S. So actually the belief in the area of reincarnation isn't too much different from the theories of other beliefs, say evolution. Robert. They are all false. S. Then one could say, well if I don't make it in this lifetime, I'll make it in the next lifetime. But what if you don't subscribe to that belief? Robert, you have no choice. What's supposed to happen is going to happen. The only choice you have is not to react, and to turn within and become free. Everything else will take care of itself. S. Does the ego have that choice to turn within? Robert, no, you do. You voluntarily turn within. Ask yourself, to whom comes the ego? And you will find out the ego has never existed. Is non-existent. S. But it's an appearance. It appears as though it were there. Robert, the sky appears blue, but upon investigation, you will find there is no sky and no blue. Upon investigation you will realize, I am not the body, I am not the ego. And you'll just disappear. S. The choice is only apparent too. By looking back we say I made a choice. There's really no one who made a choice, it just occurred. Robert, it seems to occur, but nothing is happening at all. It appears to occur, and you appear to become self-realized, but there is no one to become self-realized, and self-realization doesn't exist, just words. As so self-realization is the erasing of me as a separate entity. Robert, yes exactly. It's also the erasing of the idea, I'm self-realized. There's only silence. It's beyond explanation. It's a mystery. Finite can never comprehend the infinite. There are no words to explain. All is well. Consciousness is bliss, love not as we know it, but a million times stronger and that's our real nature. Be yourself. You see this is why I usually have nothing to say. What can I say? New people come here and they expect a profound lecture. Some people will let me talk hour after hour, yet when they walk out the door they forget everything. Though it's not really a lecture you wanted to hear. You just want to be yourself and I'm simply a mirror. S. Why do we forget Robert? Why do we need to use you as a mirror? Why don't we use ourselves as a mirror? Robert, you can if you try hard enough. But sometimes karmically, we are drawn to a book, a tree, or a teacher, or a lake, or something that can open your heart so you can see yourself for real, who you really are. So I'm like a catalyst for you to open your heart and jump inside, and become free. S. Why is it that as soon as we walk out the door we forget? Robert, Simskara's past tendencies from many lifetimes, they are very strong, very powerful very realistic. And it grabs us, some worse than others. But, if you keep coming to satsang, if you keep asking yourself the question, where does the I come from? By abiding in the I, your samskaras become weaker and weaker, and the I becomes stronger and stronger, until one day you will disappear, and you will be yourself. S. It sure is hard to get there. Robert, to whom? When I say, this is my finger, this is my nose, who is the my? To whom am I referring? It's like there are two of us. This is my foot. Who is the my? Find out. Ask yourself and you will realize there have been two of you. 
there is yourself and your body to whom you are referring. But when you realize I slept, I dreamt, and I am awake, it will give you a clue to your existence and will give you silence. And then you begin to search, what is the source of I? Where did it come from? You never answer those questions. You just ask because if you answer, it's from the viewpoint of the ego. Therefore you never answer the question, you simply abide in the I. You follow the I to its source. All of your problems are attached to the I, and when the I disappears in the source, so do all your problems. They go with it and so will your question. S. Robert, when we are here in satsang, and you give examples like this, it seems so clear to see who is involved in waking up, who woke up. This is my finger, this is my foot. It seems so so clear. But, when I am alone, in my own awareness it seems fuzzy. Robert, this is true for most people. Then again, it is because of past samskaras, past tendencies from previous lives. They pull you back into Maya. But, you have to keep turning around and keep practicing. The more you practice the less fuzzy it will become until you become free. Convert yourself to a spiritual life, think about it all day long before you go to sleep and when you wake up. S. Is practice then mainly a matter of paying attention? Robert, paying attention to yourself, your inquiry, for instance, when you wake up in the morning and you are filled with fears, collective fears, about the world situation, about what's going on in Iraq, don't follow that train of thought, but rather ask yourself, to whom does this fear come? And it will go away. When you follow through, the answer will be, it comes to me. I feel it. Then you further inquire, who is the source of I? Where did the I come from? And you will feel better right away. S. What if you are in a position where the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? You say to yourself, I will practice this discipline, I will simplify my life. Yet when the situations come up in your life, you forget. That karmic? Is it just a matter of time? Robert, it's all karmic. Though even if you have a longing within and you've simplified your life, still things come up? Robert, things can always come up. They are like posts. Do not react to them. Turn away from them. Simply abide in the truth. Ask yourself, to whom is the flesh weak? Who made that thought? Keep coming back again and again to the eye. Keep abiding in the eye, and you will become stronger and stronger. All you have to do is keep coming back again and again. Have patience. It took you thousands of incarnations to be the way you are, so have patience. Continue to practice. Something has to give sooner or later. How are you feeling since the first day I met you until now? Is there any difference in you? S. Oh, I'm reborn. Robert, so what are you complaining about? Continue what you are doing. Have patience. I'll tell you the story of a Zen Buddhist monk, if you haven't heard it. There was once this Zen Buddhist monk sitting on the side of the road meditating. He apparently had been meditating for years and years, because his hair had grown down to the ground, and birds had made a nest in his hair. Intuitively he felt somebody walking by, a self-realized being, so he opened one eye to look. And he saw this old wise man walking by. He said, Holy Father, where are you going? And the old man said, I'm going to see God. The Buddhist monk said, Please, intervene for me and ask God how much longer I've got to sit this way, meditating, before I become liberated. So the old man said, I will my son. The old man continued walking. A mile down the path there was another Zen Buddhist monk, same story. He had apparently had been sitting here for many years because his hair had grown down to the ground and birds had made a nests in hair also. And he too felt somebody coming and knew it was a realized being. 
He opened his eyes and said, Where are you going, father? And the old man said, I am going to see God. Though this monk asked the same question, Would you please ask God for me how much longer I have to sit like this and meditate before I become liberated? And the old man said, I will my son, and he continued walking. Six months passed. The old wise man was walking down the road again. The first Zen Buddhist monk intuitively felt him coming, and he opened his eyes and said, Father, have you seen God? The wise man said, Yes. And did you ask him for me how much longer I have to sit like this and meditate before I become free? The old man said, Yes, I did, my son. The old man pointed to a tree, and he said, Do you see all the leaves on the tree? God told me you have to incarnate as many times as there are leaves on this tree before you can become free. And the monk got furious and said, What? After all the years I've spent meditating? What nonsense. This is all a waste of time. I'm through with this. And he got up and headed toward town to get drunk. Later the old man passed the second monk, who also felt him coming and opened his eyes and said, Father, did you intervene for me? Did you ask God how much longer I have to sit like this before I become free? The old man said, Yes, my son, I did. The old man pointed to a tree and said, God told me that you have to reincarnate as many times as there are leaves on that tree. And the monk became happy and sang for joy and he said, Thank you, thank you. It could have been two trees with three trees or five trees, the whole forest. But it's only one. Thank God. And he walked away happy. Though that's the difference between people. We have to have patience. We are all hell bound for heaven. Have no fear we will get there. Try to remember the main points. Birth and death are like going to sleep at night and waking up in the morning. When you go to sleep at night, you die when you dream, it's like being on the astral plane, and when you wake up in the morning, it's like being born. Through those states of consciousness somebody exists, and that somebody is none other than you. In other words you are aware of dreaming. You are aware of sleeping. You are aware of waking up. You are aware of dying and you are aware of being reborn. Somebody is watching all this that's you. You exist through all those states. Abide in your existence, not in the states. Ignore the fake consciousness. Abide in the reality which is called absolute awareness, consciousness. Abide in that and be free. Is there anything you would like to talk about? Feel free at this time to ask anything you would like. I'm not different from anyone else. Never look at me as anybody special. S. Robert, have you always had this realization? Robert, I guess. There is no telling. People have asked me about this so, I will tell you a little bit about it. When I was a small child in a crib, a little man used to be on the other side, about this big. For a long period I would lie there and he would be talking to me from the edge of the crib. And of course being a baby, I didn't know what he was talking about. As far as I know, he was talking to me ever since I was born. I couldn't understand what he was saying. I used to believe everybody had that experience, and when I was about five or six years old, I told my parents about it, and they thought I was playing games. I told my friends and they laughed at me. So I stopped saying anything about it. The visitation stopped when I was about seven. My father died and all of a sudden the little man stopped coming to me. Then I asked my mother, What am I doing here? I don't belong here. I didn't understand what I was saying but I felt that I was out of place. My mother thought I was crazy and so did a lot of other people. She took me to the doctor and the doctor told her it would go away. When I was going to school I never really fit in because I was always daydreaming. I had strange experiences. I used to sit in the class and become swallowed up in consciousness. 
I became omnipresent. I had out-of-body experiences. I just merged with consciousness. I couldn't understand what was happening. Then, when I was about L4 years old, I went to the library to do a book report. I passed the philosophy section and saw a book on yoga masters. I didn't even know what that meant at the time. I opened the book to a page and there was a picture of Ramana Maharshi. My hair stood on end because it was the same person who appeared to me when I was a baby in my crib. Since then I have never been the same. S. That is what led you to Ramana Maharshi. Robert, later on yes. I actually went to the Self-Realization Fellowship in Encinitas. I went to see Yogananda. I was initiated and was going to become a monk, but after Yogananda talked to me, he said, Robert you don't belong here, you've got your own path, go to India. Though I did. I went to the Ramana Ashram. That was L9, 147 or 48. I confirmed my feelings. Ever since I was born I had never believed I was a body. I went back to school and made believe I was normal, whatever that is. S. When you first saw Ramana Maharshi, did he remind you of the person you had communication with as a baby? Robert. Definitely yes. Did you speak of this later with him? Robert. No, I never did. We just smiled at each other. I had some personal conversations with him, but even at the end of 1947 he was sick. He couldn't walk very well and had to be assisted by his devotees. He had a cane. He could hardly walk. I usually never go into these things because number one, it can't really help you and pause, I forgot what number two is. S. Would I be correct to say that no one outside by his grace or touch or shakti can lift your consciousness beyond what you do with your own work? Robert, to an extent but some devotees who are ready can benefit. A certain quietness, a certain touch, will get rid of the rest of their karma and set them free. S. This is the teacher's grace. You can call it that but the grace is always available. Is not the teacher's grace. The teacher doesn't own it. S. It almost seems like it's more of the devotee's grace. In other words, it's the attitude or something that brings it out. Robert, yes you could say that. Before I went to Yogananda, I was introduced to Joel Goldsmith. Does anyone know him? He was actually my first teacher. He explained to me what was going on within my feelings, because I used to think I was crazy. Dole Goldsmith told me about Paramahansa Yogananda and gave me the book to read. Dole Goldsmith was a Christian mystic who has written about twelve books. They are available at the Bodhi Tree. The books are on mysticism, mostly based on St. John. S. About four or five years ago, I had a client who was a schizophrenic, a well-adjusted schizo. Robert, like most of us, I tried to get him to own his feelings, to recognize what was going on in his mind and so forth, as psychologists usually do, and after a while he converted me to spirituality. He said to me, I'm not doing any of this, God makes me do it. I was trying to get him to accept his individuality and responsibility, his function in life. He said, I have no need for functioning. And I tried to convince him, but he would say, well, on one hand, there is your point of view, and he would tell me what it was, and on the other hand, there is my point of view, and he would tell me his point of view. After I began reading this Sargadatta, I saw that his point of view was far more real than my point of view, and I began siding with him. I told him, I understand completely where you are, and we parted friends. It was wonderful. Robert, I've heard various psychiatrists say schizophrenics suffer from the truth. They have no defenses against the truth, and the truth prevents them from ever becoming a normal individual. S. So it doesn't mean they have two personalities? It means that society has labeled that person, 
because they have certain kinds of experiences. It means nothing. S. Robert, can we ask ourselves, why do I believe I'm the body? Robert, yes you can. It will take you deeper. You should ask to whom is there a body? You see, what you think is the body is not the body at all. It's the self but appears like a body to you. But, there's no body, only the self. There's no body. Nobody home. At this point, the tape ends. Transcript, 17. Divine Ignorance. 21st October, 19, 190. Robert, tape starts abruptly. Dot who come to meeting like this, one will return and become a disciple. Out of every five disciples that come, one will become a devotee. This type of meeting is not for everyone because it hits you hard in the ego. It makes you feel that your anger, your doubts, your suspicions, your frustrations, your jealousies, your pettiness do not exist. They've been haunting you for years and it's up to you to get rid of them. It makes you realize that your possessions, your thought of ownership, taking care of yourself, your idea of God, your idea of the world, of the universe, of your job, of your loved ones are all nonsense. Most people do not like to hear this. People like to be told things that they're used to. You like to be told you'll go far in life. You'll become a successful accountant or a nurse. You'll make a lot of money. You'll have a good family. But this is not that type of a world. We have a wrong conception of the world in which we live. You see what difference does it make what happens to you if you do not realize who you are. And I'm not just speaking of dry knowledge. I know most of you here have read every book that's ever been written. But it's all dry knowledge. The whole idea is to make this a living embodiment of consciousness. And most people do not want to waste their effort to do this. They're used to buying something, they pay their cash and they get their goods, here in the West. This is not how it works. The first step in spiritual awakening is to realize you're divinely ignorant, and that's not an insult. I've had people walk out when I've said this. That's why I say divinely ignorant. With all humility you must realize this first of all. That you are divinely ignorant which means that you don't really understand anything. All your conceptual ideas, all your preconceived ideas, everything you've learnt as a boy or as a girl, all the ideas and feelings and emotions that you grew up with are basically wrong. They're all erroneous, and they must be transcended. The only way to begin to transcend this is to admit to yourself I am divinely ignorant and I really do know know what anything is. I really know nothing. I don't know what anything is. As an example, we don't know what a human being is. We have no idea what it is. It just appears at birth and we take it for granted. We don't know what a dog is. Where did it come from? How did it arrive? We know that it has four legs and it's a dog, so we give it a name dog. Like someone gave you the name Mark, Ed or Mary. But what are these things for real? We don't know what a tree is. We gave it a name tree, but what is it really? It has leaves. Some trees produce oranges, some trees produce grapefruits. Why? What's its purpose? Where did it come from originally? And what came first, the tree or the seed? We don't know, we have no idea. We don't know what the sun is or the moon or the stars. All we can figure out is what they do to keep us warm, the sun does. But we have no idea what it really is, why it exists. Why does anything exist? Why do we exist? We have no idea. But we're brought up in a world of effects, and we begin to respond to the effects of the world at an early age. We develop traits of jealousy, anger, mistrust, envy, fear, all these feelings are developed at an early age. And we don't know why. 
we act accordingly, we cause problems for ourselves. We try to solve them and we spend all of our lives solving problems. Before you know it we turn around, we're 80, 90 years old, it's time to go, where are we? We have no idea. And those of us who think we've accomplished something materialistically, we think we're doing good deeds. We become successful in business, in world affairs and politics. Yet we have to leave it all behind, everything we worked so hard for. Nothing remains. When it's time to leave the body, everything goes and we're alone. Therefore doesn't it make sense that we should search for the answers of life? What is life all about? Doesn't that make sense to go after that for if we find that we will become free? But, if we keep involving ourselves in our affairs, gain loss, happy, sad, sick, healthy and so forth, we're wasting our precious time. It is true as long as you believe that you are the body, you're going to be reborn again and again and again. And you will be reborn to parents that you left off. In other words, before you die, if there's such a thing, if you're filled with doubt and anger and animosity and greed and jealousy and whatever, you're going to be reborn to parents with those qualities. And you will have those qualities again. You will have to work them out. But the ultimate truth is that nothing I'm talking about is real. It is only for those deluded people who believe that they are the body. Reincarnation does not exist. Rebirth does not exist. Death does not exist. All these negative qualities I told you about do not exist. But, as long as you believe your body is for real these qualities will come to you, they come to everyone who believe they are the body. It behooves you therefore to stop reading so many books. To stop running around to so many teachers and so many meetings. I'm not trying to tell you to come here all the time. What I'm trying to tell you is this, find a teaching that is suitable for you at your stage of development. Whether it's one of the major religions or Buddhism, or whatever it may be. If that's what you're into, practice, practice, practice and become a living embodiment of the teaching. But going around from teacher to teacher, going around from meeting to meeting and not practicing anything will get you nowhere. Think about this. My own personal experiences probably have come to me because in a last life or somewhere before I took on this body, which doesn't exist, I must have practiced intense sadhana. Otherwise why would I be born and see a figure of Ramana Maharshi when I was a baby? Why would I be drawn to India? And why would I have personal experiences when my individuality was lost and I merged into infinite consciousness? I didn't ask for these experiences. I didn't ask to be sitting here today. Everything just happens. Whatever is happening in your experiences, do not fight them. You may say, but Robert, my experience is terrible. It makes no difference, do not fight your experiences. Merely observe them, watch them, do not react to them. Do nothing. Oh. Your body will do whatever it has to do. But, do not react to your anger. Do not react to your doubt. Change your mind as fast as possible. When doubt comes to you, when anger comes to you, when fear comes to you, do not entertain it. But, start doing a mantra. Think the spiritual song. Do japa. Do whatever you have to do to get rid of the situation at the moment and then go on with your deeper spiritual practices. But, do not entertain fears, doubts, anger. The best ways of course is to ask yourself, to whom does this come? Who is angry? And something will come and something will say me. In anger. Hold on to that me. Don't let go of it. Find out its source. Where did it arise? Who gave it birth? If you truly follow it to its source, you will find that anger never existed. It's okay, it doesn't matter. No one can hurt you, unless you're hurtable. Makes no difference what everybody says or what they do or what you believe you see them doing, that's not the problem. 
The problem is your reaction. Feeling that something is wrong. What can be wrong? If you knew who you were, you would laugh. The whole world would become laughable. Though all I can do for you is to confess my experiences. And when I use the pronoun I, I'm referring to consciousness, to omnipresence. Everything becomes the self when I say I. That includes everybody here. Though I confess to you that I am not the body or mind. I am not any experience. I am not the world. I am not anything that you can see, touch, taste, smell or feel. I am absolute reality. I am consciousness. I am infinite intelligence. I am Sachet Ananda. I am Nirvana emptiness. I am love pure awareness joy bliss. I am that I am. That is the truth about I, about you, about me and there's nothing else. Become joyful rejoice. They centered. Yesterday never existed. Tomorrow will never come. The only moment you have is this moment now. What you think about yourself now determines what happens to you tomorrow. So why play games? As I said, stop reading books. Stop going to meetings so much. And time with yourself. When in satsang find yourself. Know who you are and you will be the happiest person on earth. Everything is consciousness, everything. Everything is consciousness. The reason that some of us can't feel it is because we're wrapped up in ourselves. I don't mean your real self, I mean our ego selves. We're so wrapped up in our affairs and we're so wrapped up in trying to become enlightened that we never will. It's not a question of trying to become enlightened. Do you know in reality, there's no such word. What's enlightened? What's self-realization? They're concepts, they're words. There's no such word. Though what we're trying to become is something that doesn't exist. How can we ever become it? When exists you are already. What doesn't exist you never can become. What do you think you are? You can tell by your thinking patterns. What do you think most of the day? As an example, what did you think about this morning as soon as you opened your eyes? Were you worried about breakfast? Were you concerned with getting too fat or too thin? Were you concerned over your hair or over another person? Were you thinking about your neighbors trying to hurt you? Or someone cheated you? Or somebody stole something from you ten years ago, you can't get it out of your mind? What do you think about all day long? This is what keeps you back. You must learn to catch yourself. Whenever some conditions arises, catch yourself by asking yourself, to whom does it come? Even if you have to do this a thousand times a day. It's okay. It's better than thinking the thoughts you do think a thousand times a day. Isn't it? Catch yourself, to whom does it come? To me? Hold on to the me, what is me? Who is me? Ask yourself. Follow the me to the source. Ask yourself how the me arose. Where did it come from to begin with? Then your mind will become still, maybe for only a few seconds, and then another thought will come. Practice the same procedure, to whom does this come? And you can do other things. You can ask yourself, what difference does it make, what happens to me? In reality, I am eternal, immortal. In reality, I was never born, can never die. So what difference does the appearance make at this time? I seem to be going through whatever I'm supposed to go through karmically. Why should I fight it? When you stop fighting you have won the battle. For when you have stopped fighting, your mind becomes calm once again. And when your mind becomes calm, you automatically become your real self. Then you forget trying to become self-realized, trying to become enlightened. You forget about those terms. You simply abide in yourself. That's all you've got to do. And yourself means a quiet mind, that's the definition of yourself. A quiet, still mind. 
When your mind is quiet, you have bliss, you have love, you have compassion, you have jhana wisdom. When your mind is noisy, you have doubts, suspicions, anger, greed, jealousy. It's up to you. It makes no difference how deep those samskaras are, those tendencies. Weed them out one by one by asking yourself to whom they come, and by following the ithrid to its culmination, and you will be free. Yesterday I received an interesting gift in the mail from New York, these jogging shoes. And I didn't know who sent them, I didn't remember their name. But I also received a letter and I remember this guy. He used to come to the meetings before he came here when we were at Jeff's. He came to about six meetings. He always used to sit in the back, he'd hardly say anything. It's amazing what satsang does for a person. And he wrote me one of the profoundest letters I've ever written, I've ever seen or read and I've read many. And I want to share this with you because I think it's important. I don't know why he said to me to share this. His name is Andy Kingcar, he's a friend of Richard's. He's from Santa Cruz but he's living in Mahapak, New York. It starts here and continues here. Mary, would you like to read it? Read it slowly. Try to really understand what he's saying. Mary reads, Dear Robert, seeing this card brought you to mind. However, when I bought it, I had no idea it said anything about a birthday inside. Consider it a metaphorical paradox. Never being born, I am born in each moment. I haven't been in touch with you in a while. So just to let you know who is writing this, I spoke with you several times on the phone over the past six months or so, after attending a couple of meetings at Jeffrey's apartment back in April. I'm not sure why I'm writing you now, I have nothing specific to say. I feel like a great reel of opening up has taken place recently and yet nothing has really changed at all. The main gist of it is, that the self is being continually revealed as absolutely inescapable. This entire world of appearance is nothing but an expression of the self. Bondage or liberation, suffering or bliss, there is no distinction in the light of the truth. I mean whether this body-mind is identified or not, it is still consciousness and nothing else. Consciousness is all there is. Form that it takes on in this incredibly diverse world is irrelevant. Exactly, what does realization mean? When everything is already the self. The self realizes itself in all forms of existence. I really must say that I don't care if Andy Kinkark continues to be caught up in this conceptual world of appearance. I know even if I forget that I am one with God and that everything that happens is His will, it cannot be otherwise. God is everything. I guess the most concise way of expressing it in words is that it is a matter of seeing that nothing exists independently. The real substance of anything is void. Even this sounds pathetically limiting. The freedom of understanding is the absence of all identification. I can't even say netainty. Who says it? I don't know Robert, it just feels like if there is an understanding that brings about enlightenment, it really doesn't change a thing. Except, maybe that there's just nothing to resist anymore. There's no one to gain or lose anything. Everything is one. Concepts are so boring. Ironically enough, despite the feeling lately that there is nothing to say or hear about the truth, I've been spontaneously writing down what might be called observations that keep popping up lately. I'll include some of this letter for your entertainment. If you feel so inclined to look at them. Otherwise, I just want to share a feeling of quiet gratefulness. Not for or to anything in particular, just peaceful thanks, Andy. Yes, I'll be in New York until around November 1st. At which time I plan to leave for Taiwan, although that keeps getting delayed. I'll send you a postcard, you can write to this address, and it will be forwarded if I'm not here. And the address is in New York. Robert, now, what did you think of that? SM, it's very nice. 
Robert, the reason I'm sharing it with you is because I want you to realize that this comes from the heart. It does not come from book learning I can tell. I can pick up an article and tell you where it's from. Whether it's from a person's heart, from his consciousness, or whether it's from a book. This comes straight from the heart. Any comments? SK, it's interesting he started expressing and talking and after a while, he seemed like drooling a little bit in words and then he came back into expression again. SM, you can tell it's straight from the heart. You can feel it, even reading it I could feel what he was saying. SK, not only from the heart, it's surcharged with energy. Robert, he has a PhD in English, and he teaches English overseas. SA, I don't know, I must cast a descending vote. Robert, okay. Just to stir things up in my usual role. Robert, good. First of all I find that there is a very strong tendency on the part of the disciple or adherents or students tend to mouth, to repeat the teachings of the teacher. Robert, yes. There is a very strong tendency of that sort especially if you know the people and you get to hear these things that you heard from the teacher. And I kind of that about it, and as I heard it, it seemed to me like such an intellectualization of the divine flow. You can say that what I'm about to say is that I'm sinking into materiality. But, it seemed to me that these are also words, these are material words, these are ideas. What if he just said, oh the sun was intensely hot this morning. I felt tremendous hunger. I ate meat, I loved the meat. I wanted to hike to the top of the mountain, etc., etc. It seems to me that this would have expressed the sense of oneness, the sense of desire for the one, more than these intellectualizations. Robert, well that's your opinion of course and I appreciate it. But remember Arnold, he's speaking from his own experiences I can tell. What you're speaking of is good also. It depends on the person, depends who they are and also depends on how you perceive it. But it's your perception and that's good. What else can I say? S.A., I can try to be more argumentative if that's what I could try. I'm not going to give you an argument. S.A., no. S.M., maybe it was the way I read it. But, if he were here and he said it in his own words from his heart, then, it would be more emphatic, it would be more feeling, I'm only reading somebody else's words. S.A., I don't think it's the way you read it. I don't think that, no, you read very well. Robert, no I remember King Cart, and he's a very sincere person. S.A., well I'm not saying he wasn't. I think that he is sincere, but it just seems to me that the mental element dominates rather than the spirit of the one. Well this is his confession. This is the way he feels. To me it's just sheer beauty. But. It's an interesting comment. Any other comments? SR, I just want to say off the topic but I thought Mary did a very good job in presenting it in a very clean, understandable way. Robert, yes. SM, thank you. SB, what moved me was I liked when he said, the only thing that's different now is that there's no resistance and that seems to be the essence of the whole thing. Before he was being a me, having his own will, having his own trying to be enlightened or wanting, and now he doesn't know anything and there's no resistance to, he said absence of all identification, like lost in ignorance and no resistance to anything anymore. Robert, that's a good observation also true. The ego is always a resistance to that divine ignorance. S.R. I also thought it was unselfish, it wasn't asking you a question like leaving points so that you would return something. Robert, yes. It was totally selfless, I thought. Robert, yes that's true too. SM, from the heart. Say, what I'm talking about I don't want to beat a dead horse but. Robert, beat a dead horse. Okay, 
somehow after I spoke, what came to my mind was memories of Japan, and I'm thinking of the way of the tea house. The way the tea is served, of course, there's many examples. The ceremony thing, I remember the fences walking down the little alleys. Robert, boom.、Um. The care that we know they give to everything without anything being said. You could spend a day in a Zen monastery or in a Shang temple. Nothing need be said because it's all there. It's expressed in every gesture, every movement, just as with the tea ceremony, and so it's ineffable. It's beyond words. Robert, yes. And that's a very moving experience if you approach it that way. Robert, are you suggesting he should have sent me a blank card? I say, he should have what? Sent me a blank card? I say, it would have been more original, I think. I would say yes. It says happy birthday. Laughs. No, that's your opinion again, and I respect your opinion. But he's coming from a different place. It's his feelings, his emotions, his self-expressing. S K. The letter seems to be like a mirror, and everyone's reflecting on themselves. Robert, of course, that's why I asked. I realize that I feel excited about the whole concept. Robert, you see, whatever you tell me comes from your own experience, from your own consciousness. That you're talking about yourself, whatever you say. I shouldn't say that, or you won't say anything. Laughter. Okay, now what would you like me to talk about? S. B. Robert, if consciousness is all there is, right? Then consciousness would have to be prior to our awakened state, so it has to be even similar to even deep sleep state. Robert, yes. The difference between consciousness and deep sleep is in deep sleep you are not conscious. In consciousness, you're aware of what's going on. But in deep sleep, you're in the natural state, but you're not conscious. S B. But if consciousness is all there is, why are we losing consciousness in deep sleep? Why is that? You're not losing consciousness. You're just not conscious because you're in deep sleep. It's another state of ignorance. S B. So when enlightenment occurs, even in deep sleep, there won't be loss of consciousness. When enlightenment occurs, you will not be in deep sleep. S B. So we're in deep sleep because we're. Because you're not aware, but that's the closest thing to realization. S B, is that because the mind is still kind of alive and functioning? It's because you're dead to the world and you're dead to everything, and the mind is functioning as deep sleep. S B, the mind is functioning as, as deep sleep. S B, and when everything is understood and the mind is transcended, then. Then there's pure awareness. S B. Then there's no deep sleep. No, there's just pure awareness. S K. There's no thoughts either. The brain is functioning, but the thoughts aren't in deep sleep. Robert, that's true. Yes. S R. Robert, I just wanted to share with you a feeling I had when I came to your first talk. I thought that what you said for me was the absolute truth. But. When I went home and woke up the next morning, I felt such anger, and in fact, I shared it with Ed. Frustration that, in fact, I renewed my ambition to accomplish things because I felt, I guess, the trouble I had was that is true. But we do have a role to play. Apparently, there is a game to play, and I accept the fact that when you play a game, you have to play it. With all the rules that are there, you don't have to believe that it's real, but you have to play it. And I don't want to rot away and have a nihilistic attitude toward life because I get a pleasure out of certain things. The acquisition of little things that I enjoy reading about and studying—it's just mind things or writing or producing. Accomplishing is actually is just as pleasurable, if not more, than sitting quietly and meditating and going to that silence. I do know what you say down deep is correct. I know it's the truth. But as long as we're in this little game, this eighty-year game that we play, 
70, 80 years, I feel that I'm not taking advantage of those senses, those things that are stuck in this body of mine that do give me little jolts of pleasure. And maybe I misread what you said. I miss the joy and the love and the embracing of nature, life people, music, all that's there. Robert, that's a good question, let's go to your first point, you were angry. That's exactly what your mind wants you to be. When a person hears truth for the first time or to hear the higher truth, the mind is going to begin to fight. It does not want to be annihilated. It will fight you at every turn. Things may get progressively worse in the beginning mentally. Now when you understand what's going on, you simply observe that condition. And that's the ego fighting you, that's the first one I heard now here's the second part. Nobody tells you that when you become realized you will stop doing everything or anything. If you're a painter, you will become a better painter. If you're a sculpture, you'll be a better sculpture. You will feel joy and bliss. But, you have to bear in mind that you are not the doer. And whatever your body is supposed to do in this incarnation, it's going to do. It has nothing to do with you. Therefore you will lose nothing. If you enjoy nature like you said, you will enjoy it a thousand times greater. Because you'll have a better understanding where it comes from, it comes from you. Self and you'll feel greater bliss. So you lose nothing and you gain everything. It's not a question of giving up, it's a question of gaining. The body in itself is very limited. When you realize who you really are, you become omnipresent. And you enjoy things a million times more. Everything becomes more intense, more real. But, you understand where it's coming from. You understand the reality. And you can say all of this is the self and I am that. And that becomes very clear to you. SR, but if it's true it's all an illusion anyway, then that is sort of what's the point of it all. Robert, the point is you're playing a game like you said. You realize it's an illusion, but you're still playing your part. SR, okay. It's like you take a step backward and you watch. As if you're watching a movie. But, yet you're in the movie also. Though you're apart from the movie and you're in the movie, you're both. Though you can be totally free and unattached, but you're still doing the work. SR, I guess the word I'm looking for is permission to play the game. Playing the game is okay to do, even if you know it's a game. But remember, you have nothing to do with it. SR, well the self is playing a game with me and I'm involved. If you search for the self you'll transcend the personality. The personality becomes totally transcended and merges in the self or in consciousness. And then you play the game in a different way, but you play the game. Nobody said you're going to go to a cave and meditate for the rest of your life. You'll be active and you'll keep playing the game but it'll be different. SK it seems that the ego enjoys personally certain things, and I think when you transcend the ego and the personal enjoyment, you can enjoy that same thing but on a universal level, and the enjoyment is increased, and it's not so the ego is fighting for that personal enjoyment. It seems to me. Robert, that's true too. Another point, sometimes it seems that when you're going through this stuff, that you may find or some people find that they get detached or uninvolved in the things that they have been involved in for a temporary amount of time. And then when something happens, some change happens, and they go back into whatever it was spontaneously, there's much more enjoyment and much more enthusiasm and what not. Robert, yes but the main point remember is this, in the beginning stages all your negativity might get worse. You might become more angry, more doubtful, more suspicious, more hateful and remember why. It's your ego fighting you at every turn saying don't go along with this teaching. SK, because you will to lose everything. Yes. The ego does not wish to be annihilated. Though in the beginning it will fight you at every turn. But don't fight back by reacting. 
Simply observe and watch and ask yourself, to whom is this happening? And you'll find out. That's all you've got to do. SR, I've been angry before over things like this. Laughter. Robert, that's a good sign. There's a name for that, it's called chemicalization. There are changes taking place inside of you and everything is coming to the surface, to be totally transcended. So do not pay attention to those feelings. Ignore them by asking yourself, to whom do they come? And they'll go away. They will become weaker and weaker every time you ask the question. They will become weaker and weaker until they're gone. It happens to nearly everyone. Tape break as Robert continues. Robert, appear to go to certain levels. SM, Robert, do we go through those certain levels to reach that point to awaken? Sometimes you appear to go through certain levels. But, in reality you just awaken. There's a story about the Buddha, when he decided to go under the Bodhi tree and sit there for 30 days until he was enlightened, not for 30 days, he was just going to sit under the tree until something happened. He'd either die or awaken. So after about 30 days, his disciples were sitting around, and they saw him opening his eyes, and he was shining. And they said, Master, what happened to you? Had you seen God? And he said, No, have you become self-realized? He said, No, and they asked him all kinds of questions, and he answered, No. Though so finally in unison they said, What happened? And he smiled and he said, I'm awake. It's the same with us. We appear to go through stages and then one day we just flick fingers, wake up. As if we've been asleep for years. Think of the times when you have a long dream or a recurring dream over and over. And the dream appears so real and in the dream you're trying to fight it and trying to go through all these experiences but you can't wake up. So you try all these spiritual practices and then you wake up. Everything is gone. It was only a dream. In the same way one day we'll wake up from this dream same thing. The right now most of you believe the things that you're dreaming are for real. For example, when I received this pair of shoes, I didn't feel the feeling of exhilaration or feeling of sadness, I just observed the shoes and said what nice shoes, and I wore them, that's it. When I'm emerged in my own bliss, things do not make me blissful or happier. Things are just there to enjoy, to look, to see, to observe. But your own bliss never leaves you. For your true nature is bliss, that's human nature. Everything else is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. So to you the things that may appear bad may appear good to someone else. As an example, a man is allowed one wife and that's good. But, if you go to Arabia you're allowed three wives and that's good. So that may be bad to some of us here, but over there it's good. Take another example, let's say if you go to the North Pole and you visit your friend who's an Eskimo. The first thing that he'll tell you to do is to sleep with his wife. It's an honor. If you don't he'll be insulted. Now how many of you guys will let me sleep with your wife? You see what I mean? Nothing is either good or bad only thinking makes it so. So look at all the things that make you angry. All nonsense forget it and be happy. SK, I have a question. Robert, sure. The shoes came to you like in a package and they were dirty, grimy, smelt really bad and looked really bad. Would you think they were nice shoes or would you think that they were interesting shoes? Robert, I wouldn't think they were good or bad, nice or not nice, I would just observe them. I'd look at them if I felt like wearing them, I would if I don't I don't. SK, these you observe they were nice, I'm wondering if the other ones you would say, these are interesting. I didn't observe they were nice, I observed they were shoes. SK, you said nice so I thought. What I meant, what I meant is I looked over them and examined them carefully, I never heard of the brand before and I just put them on. And everybody tells me what nice shoes. SK, mine are interesting. 
Laughter. My used ones. Wait until you see the ones I used to wear before. They got a hole in the top. They were half worn out. The heels were gone. But everything is unfolding as it should. There are no mistakes. Remember that. All is well everywhere. Just the way it is. And remember, the only reason that you get excited or mad is because your world is not turning the way you want. That's all. But if you forget about your world and merge in consciousness, everything will be good. For instance, you say my uncle died, and you think that's bad. But for him, it's good because he's free and he can continue his sojourn, whatever he's doing. But for you, it's bad. You inherit a million dollars. For you, it's good. For your neighbor, it's bad because she becomes jealous and she shoots you. Laughter, S K. For the daughter, it's really good because she inherits it. Laughter. Whoever inherited it, it's good. Laughter. S B. But it just appears good. Maybe someone marries her for her money, makes her miserable, and shoots her. And it turns out to be bad. Robert, of course it goes on and on. It never stops. S L, it's good for her when she gets shot. She's released. Laughter. S B, but then she's born again as a crocodile. Students laugh. Robert, but do you see why we should not react? Students, yeah. Because we don't know what's good or bad. S B. Because we don't know what anything is. Exactly. Narada, you're awfully quiet today. Pause. S B. So Robert, you just spontaneously abide in your divine ignorance without any teaching, without ever reading anything about spiritual life. Robert, no. Yes and no. S B. That's an exact answer. Yes and no. In the beginning, I never read anything. Later on, I did. S B. So before you read, you were abiding as divine ignorance. Yes. I told a little story on Thursday. What happened? S R. Robert, do you think when this human evolutionary cycle is over, that may be the end of it? I mean, in the very, very long scheme of things, that whatever this experiment. Or whatever this is runs its course, and this planet will go, and the human form will probably go with it, unless we're blown over to a new burden or planet or something. Robert, then we'll come back again, and everything will be repeated until you wake up. S R, I do hope there are other places. In your mind, only in your mind. Your mind creates the other places. If you want to find out what's going on in Mars or Venus or Jupiter, go within yourself. Dive deep within yourself, and you'll find out. What you'll actually find out is these planets only exist because you do. What happens to them when you're sleeping? In deep sleep, they disappear. The world disappears. Nothing exists. S K, I don't believe that. It's like if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it. Did it really fall? I don't know if it fell, but it could have. Robert, find out. Understand yourself, and you'll know. Because if you create it mentally, there's no noise, except for the deluded people who hear noise. S K, excuse me. Except for those deluded who hear noises. Like most of the people, most of the population hear all kinds of noise, so for them it's real. S K, and if I don't hear it, then it's not real. But you're creating it all; it's coming out of your mind. When you're asleep, everything stops. In a world, there's nothing. But when you wake up, as it were. S K, yeah, but I can observe someone in deep sleep. No, you can't. S K, I can't. When you're in deep sleep. S K, no, I can observe someone else in deep sleep. That's the answer. S K, what answer is that? They're observing it through their mind. S K, but concrete, relative world. That's what you're seeing for a person in deep sleep. S K, 
Yeah, I have no way of knowing that, I really have no way of knowing. Who wants to know though? SK, I don't know, you make a statement that I'm realizing that there is no way for me to know whether it is true or not. Because your ego is seeing that so I say, dive deep within yourself and you'll know. As long as you're speaking from external purposes you can never know. SK, whom that's interesting. SM, Robert these dreams are mental creations too right? Robert, dreams are creations of the mind of course. It makes no difference what kind of dream it is. Think of a dream. It's externalized into a universe, and it's all taking place within yourself in your mind. Yet you see a moon, you see the stars, you see the sun, you see people, you have experiences and it's all taking place like it's real. It's happening in your mind. The world is the same way. It's happening in your mind but you refuse to accept that. You think these things are real and you suffer accordingly. Ed? S.E. In response to Jay's question. One of the biggest changes for me was to change from believing that I was a body with consciousness inside of it to finding that I was consciousness that contains the body. Robert. Yes. And that when you see that point of view the body is no longer real, it's like anything else out there is part of it and that you're all of consciousness. When you have the first view, the world is real. When your consciousness the body's not real. Robert, that's a good point. It's just an object in consciousness. Robert, everything is consciousness and everything that appears as forms are taking place in consciousness. All this is Brahman. SK, what about if I'm sitting here and my consciousness seems like it's not separate from other consciousness, yet still I somehow have a frame of reference when here? Robert, who has the frame of reference? SK, I don't know who has it but... The ego does. SK, okay. You're talking about ego things. When you get rid of the ego, there will be no frame of reference. SK, so if you get rid of the ego totally, there's no frame of reference. There's no frame of reference. SK, so there's nothing to do with this body, I mean I'm not even aware it's here. When? SK, if there's no ego? If there's no ego, you will be aware, but in a different way. SK, will I be aware of all bodies? In a different way, you'll realize all bodies are the self and you are that. SK, yeah but still I'm coming from a different. SX, your perspective. I can perceive that but I'm coming from here. Robert, but that's intellectually. SK, right. But the other way is spiritually it's different. Coming from the point of the self. I realize that I am the self. But, I am includes you. You are myself. SK, there's no here or there with you none at all. That's why when I see you I see myself as consciousness. I can only see you as I see myself. SK, but there still seems to be a here and there. To who? SK, to you? No. SK, there's no here or there. No here, there is just one. SK, just one. And that's you. SK, that's me. Laughter. Robert, be still and know that I am God. SL, Robert for me, it seems like there's something very scary about the whole prospect or feeling and thinking that I am God. Robert, no, I am is your ego you're referring to. Your personal individual I am is not God. But, I am as God. See the difference? SL, yeah. You are not God the way you appear to be, but your real self is God. So when you say, I am God, you are not referring to yourself as a body. You're speaking to the real you, which you can't see as you. Do you see? Sell, 
I also feel that I find that when I stay with myself quietly for any length of time I become frightened, I get scared of that and I have to reach out or get back in touch with, or get out of myself. Robert. Yes. I don't know what I'm afraid of though. Robert. Well those are all some scares. Past tendencies coming up on you. What you should do is observe them and ask from where do they come? And to whom do they come? What gave them birth? Who was their father and their mother? They come from nothing, and they return to nothing when you see it correctly. But, if you agree with them, if you feel them, if you adhere in them, then they become real for you. So as soon as you begin to feel fear, immediately catch yourself and ask the question, to whom does the fear come? And wait. And the answer will be, it comes to me as soon as the answer comes, it comes to me, immediately abide in the me. Start feeling the me where you can start saying to yourself, I, 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 I. I is the first name of God. You're calling upon your real nature, which is greater than the fear. And the fear will dissipate, try it. SR. Robert, if there's only one self, then how is it that one person can be realized and another person can be in ignorance? Robert, because nobody's really realized. That's just a word. There's only the understanding that all this is the self. Everything that's going on anywhere is the self in expression. I am that self. Just like the dream, I am the dream. Am I not? Because I'm dreaming about everybody. I'm dreaming about the class, I'm dreaming about the world and about the universe. Though I can say I am that dream. I see you in the same way. You are myself and there's only me. But, you see two or three or four multiples. So you've got the problem not me. Laughs. Because you insist on seeing multiples. To yourself and you'll see me as yourself. There's only one self, does that make sense? SR. Yeah, it makes sense. SE. It sounds sort of like it depends on whether you take the position of Krishna or Arjuna. Whether you take the position of the Absolute or whether you take the position of what Arjuna was, a Jiva Mukta, a Jiva, individual self. Robert. Yes. Now when you're only awareness, nothing is. But when you don't have awareness there is multiplicity. When you don't have the absolute then, there is multiplicity. Robert, that's true, yes. We're talking about the absolute. The absolute is one, otherwise there's multiplicity. That's right. It's K. When one is embodied and has obtained the self or understands and becomes enlightened then one is consciousness, I guess we were pointing out these were different containers of consciousness. Body right? Robert, the body is a container of consciousness. Well relatively speaking. Robert, there's only one consciousness, not ten or twelve consciousnesses. SK, so there's one consciousness. So the person who attains that ultimate state, what is the ego? There seems to be individual ego. Someone talks about something, or whatever there seems to be different people talking. Robert, that's how it seems to you. SK, yes yeah, so. Where are you coming from? The Johnny or a Johnny. SK, so I want to try to understand intellectually at least what a Johnny sees. A Johnny sees the self as one. As I said before. It's K, and so I'm talking, do you know what I'm going to say? No I don't know what you're going to say. I only know that I am one with all there is. It's K, okay, so otherwise you don't know per se what this ego is thinking in relative terms. To me there's no ego, the ego doesn't exist. I see you as myself and I don't think anything. I don't see me as you. I don't see myself as you. SK, you don't. I don't pick up your thoughts because in my state there are no thoughts to pick up. Nothing exists, only emptiness. So how can I pick up what you're saying? 
there would have to be somebody home to pick up. SK, do you see this body here? Sure I see you as myself. Just like the screen in the movie, as all the forms on the screen. So I'm like the screen and you're all the forms. So I'm a part of you and I'm independent of you. SK, yet so, it's I think maybe more clear to say is the self. Robert, no self. Yeah, either one, because myself has a slight tendency for me and a Johnny to relate that to ego or just an element very slightly, you know what I mean. Robert, no. You see myself, when you see me, you see myself being yourself. Robert, I see the self. You see the self. Robert, there's only one self. Yeah. Is it yours? Robert, it just exists. If it were mine, there would have to be somebody else. As X what? I would have to be someone else. To be able to say, it's myself. My doesn't exist. There's no me or mine. There's only omnipresent self. Only the self exists. It's not mine, it's not yours. SK, so there's the body here that's just the self actually. There's no body anywhere. SK, well from there you can see that there's a body here. I see you as the self not as a body. SK, yeah, but for some. I don't know, there's like air in between almost. For whom? SK, for me there is obviously, but for you. So ask yourself, who am I? SK, where am I? Who am I? Find out. SR, well there must be a reason for illusion though, because so many people partake in it, you know there's about 5 billion of them who have a hard time being scientific. It would be very hard to prove to them that they were one, even if it is true. Robert, you can't prove it, you have to have your own experience. There are also 5 billion people who dream. Do they say the dreams are real? Of course not, they wake up. But they don't all wake up together. SR, it must serve a purpose is what I mean, this duality must serve some purpose otherwise what a stupid thing it is. Robert. There's no purpose and it doesn't exist. SR, well as I said there are several billion illusory people who perceive it for them as a reality. Who sees all this? That's your viewpoint. SR, it's just my viewpoint but it comes from observation though in the world I didn't make it up. Observation of whom? SR, of those individuals that I come into contact with daily. I've not met too many people who don't express an individual personality. And who is the observer that's speaking? SR, it's really it's all with me. So who are you? SR, well, from what viewpoint do you speak? SR, just my own little perspective. And who are you that speaks? SR, well, are you speaking from the viewpoint of wisdom? SR, no I'm speaking just from ego. From ego exactly, that's how the ego sees the world falsely. That's called false imagination. That's how you perceive it. SR, but that would be very difficult to tell all the people who experience this. But who wants to tell them? SR, I do. Laughter. My job is to make all the other illusions as unhappy as I am about my illusion. Worry about yourself. SR and the others will take care of themselves. Of course. SR, they are already taking care of themselves, as long as I straighten it out they're all straightened out, is that right? If you believe that. SR, well it must be true. If you say so, SR, I'm going to make them all disappear. Do it, make yourself disappear first. Laughter. SA, Robert, I have a question. What you've already said of course many times that karma is inevitable, that it is unfolding. Robert, 
if you believe that you are the body, until the full realization comes. But before that comes, would you say that samskaras, that this could be a difficult thing for one to voluntarily increase the samskaras, if that's the right way to put it? Robert, you will increase the samskaras by reacting to the world. In other words, if you're hit by grief, if you do not react to it, then you're rid of it forever. If you react to it, you will likely be hit by grief again and again and again and again. You will increase samskaras. S.A. Well about something like this, you know that I'm an artist and I'm creating worlds, like right now I'm doing a video of a book that I had done, and I'm kind of fascinated as I have been many times before when you kind of feel that you are creating people, they have emotions, they have this and the whole world is kind of developing before your eyes. Though my feeling is, will I have to pay a price for creating this? Will it be to need to create more and more illusion? Robert, yes, it will. Anything in the world that you're attached to creates greater karma. S.A., so what do you say if I create these worlds and not attach to them, then I can continue creating them? Yes you can. Once you're not attached you can do anything you like. S.A., okay. But it's hard to be non-attached for some people. Do not make the mistake and say well it doesn't matter and you go rob a bank and so what's the difference I'm not attached. You are attached for if you weren't attached you wouldn't rob the bank to begin with. Though it's not a license for you to do whatever you like. You have to be very careful. You have to practice loving kindness compassion peace joy for yourself and everybody else. S.A. Well would non-action be a goal also? No, because of what I mentioned previously, if you were meant to act in this life, you're going to act and you have no choice. No matter how much you may try not to act. You may join a monastery and ashram, become a monk, but you won't be able to hold on to it. S.E., they're going to make you work. Laughter. Robert, yeah. You'll have to act. If you're meant to act, you'll act. See. I became a monk to become a contemplative and they kept sending me out to work to support the ashram. SK, you went to the wrong place. You went to the wrong ashram. Laughter. Robert, why don't we have a little break and have some refreshments? Robert plays music as at this point the tape ends. Transcript, 18. Thakuru via Sudo Guru. 25th. October, 1990. Robert, tape starts abruptly. Okay now. In conjunction with that, since we have a few people here today, they talk about the Sadguru as compared to the Pseudo Guru. I receive a lot of phone calls from people, and they ask me, is this person a real liberated person? Or is that person enlightened? Is this person self-realized? And I really do not know what to say, because I do not give opinions about other people. But, there are signs, three basic signs, whereas you can tell a true master from a false one. And we'll go into that a little bit. It helps to know these things. I only discuss things like this with my disciples and devotees. Though I consider you that, so we'll discuss it. The first thing to know about this, how you tell if a person is real, is by his teaching. Does he have his own teaching, or are his teaching from the scriptures? There are no new teachings. If a teacher tells you, I've had a revelation, I was picked up by a flying saucer and taken to a faraway galaxy and they initiated me and told me to go back and save the earth. And they gave me a mantra that I want to share with you gibberish, 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 gibberish. You say that 25 times and you become enlightened. Though if a teacher tells you something like that, be careful. If a teacher has his own teaching, be careful. But, if a teacher confirms what has always been known. In other words, if a teacher lets you know that you are the unblemished self. That you are not the body or what appears to be, but that you are supreme intelligence, 
absolute reality ultimate oneness, then you know you are on the right track because this is not new knowledge. This knowledge can be found in the Upanishads and the Vedas and in the ancient spiritual works. Never let a teacher tell you I've discovered my own teaching. That's one sign. Another sign is how a teacher lives personally. Investigate, find out. How does the teacher live apart from the teaching? When the teaching is over does the teacher meet certain friends outside and go to the nearest bar and get drunk? Does the teacher smoke on you? Or go into all kinds of rituals? Find out how the teacher lives. Does the teacher practice the teaching 24 hours a day? Or only when he comes to class? What kind of life does a teacher live? Find out for yourself. And the third point is, does the teacher charge money for a class? Does he have a weekend seminar where he charges $300 and tells, you'll become enlightened over the weekend? Be careful. A true teaching never costs anything, it's always free, always and money is never discussed. It is also true that a sage gives up everything in order to give the teaching to others. So his disciples and devotees take care of him. And that stems from the heart. But, he never asks for money personally. He may ask to help a friend or somebody else, but never for himself. Those are things you have to look into. To discover what is real and what is not. And there are two basic principles of self-realization. One is Atmavachara, self-inquiry, and the other one is Bhakta, devotion or self-surrender. By these two methods one may awaken. First method, self-inquiry is the best but so is self-surrender. In self-inquiry, you try to understand who you really are by asking yourself, Who am I? Who is this? What is real? By asking yourself those questions you go down to reality and discover truth, what you've always been. By following the I, by understanding the self and abiding in the self, you ultimately chase away the dark clouds and you shine once again as you always did. The second method is self-surrender, where you surrender completely to yourself which is God. By saying, not my will but thine, and realizing that yourself is God. Yourself is absolute reality. It is yourself that you've been looking for all of these years. Yourself is your teacher. Yourself is your guru. Yourself is the ultimate reality. There's nothing but the self. And you begin to feel this. And you really want this more than anything else in life. Then you do everything you have to do to go deeper and deeper within yourself and discover your own reality. So let's do this right now. Let's close our eyes and if you truly wish to repent just sit in silent meditation and see that perfect reality within. For all manners of error merely arise in erroneous thought. And like the morning dew before the rising sun, can perfectly be eliminated through the benevolent light and wisdom. Who am I? I am none other than the Self. Who is the Self? I am. Who is I am? Absolute Awareness. Who is Absolute Awareness? None other than the Self. How do I know the Self? Through silence. How do I achieve silence? By knowing the Self. Again, how do I know the Self? By denying everything else and abiding in reality. How do I abide in reality? By keeping still as a body. And I never had a body as it were. This appearance of body is an optical illusion. I am beyond body, beyond appearance, beyond thoughts, beyond words. I am the imperishable self, I am that I am. I am Sat Chit Ananda, being knowledge and bliss. Not now, but every moment of my life, even when I'm not aware of it. Even when my feelings are hurt. Even when I feel depressed. I am still Satchit Ananda, always, in every situation, in every condition. 
Fire cannot burn the self, water cannot drown the self. The self is permanent, unchanging, eternal, quiet, peaceful, happy. The self is the witness to all my doings. Yet it doesn't seem to interfere. It is transcendent and also everything else. Self is like a self contained mirror. Images are on the mirror, but are not affected to the self. The self is not affected by images, but is always bright and shiny and free. For the self is like the flow of electricity. Electricity flows through the wires, and you can play your radio, your TV, your toaster, but you only see the TV and the toaster. But you only see the TV and the toaster and the radiator. You do not see the electricity. You also can't see the self. But the self pervades all things, and I am that. But as the self, I am a blessing to the universe. Just by my being, the sun shines, the flowers bloom, the foods grow, animals are born, everything functions. Action take place because of my being. I am grateful for this knowledge. But the world exists because of me. When I sleep, the world does not exist. But I still do. Therefore, I am greater than the world. I am the self. I am that which has always been, always will be, and never will cease to be. I am pure consciousness, absolute reality. I know that to the extent I still my mind, to that extent will I shine forth as absolute being, fathomless reality, pure intelligence. I be still and know that I am God. But there are no longer thoughts for me. There's no longer a past or a future. There's only the eternal now, in which I live, move, and have my being. And in that now, I am awake. Silence is eloquence. Talking is ignorance. Silence. I'm shanty, 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 shanty. Peace. Somebody called me on the telephone this morning and asked me the question: Is a psychic a sage? And I said, "Is day night? Just like day isn't night, so a psychic is not a sage. A psychic deals on the relative plane. If you put ten psychics in a room and ask a question, you'll get ten different answers. If you put ten sages in a room and ask a question, you'll get the same answer. For there is one truth, and a sage is tuned into that truth, so they can only give you one answer." I once had a psychic to one of my meetings, and she wanted to give me a reading. So I said, "Okay." So she said, "Robert, I see nothing in you." So I said, "Thank you." And a couple of months later, another psychic gave me a reading, and she said, "Robert, you come from a faraway planet, and people brought you here from that planet centuries ago. Then they touched you on the head and made you forget everything." So now you're walking around saying, "Who am I?" Trying to find out where you came from. So I said, "Thank you and no thank you." Channelers, psychics are all in the same category. When there's no one to channel, where does the sixty thousand year old man come from? Who created him? Do not get pulled into those things. Stay the way you are, centered. Realize the truth about yourself and become free. Any questions about that? S N. Robert, when you say, sit in the silence to find the self. Naturally, a river of thoughts flow, but it's okay to sit in those thoughts and just watch. Robert, when you observe your thoughts, you are sitting in the silence. S N. So that's okay. That's perfect. S N. Even if you sit day after day, and the thoughts may not even slow or anything, but that's okay because you're still sitting by yourself. As long as you're not identified with the thoughts, let the thoughts come and let them go. As long as you can be the observer of the thoughts, then you're in the silence. Sen, what if you don't? Then you're who you are. Then you're human. You're the body. You're the mind. Sen. So if you can't do that practice, what do you do? You ask to whom do these thoughts come, and you punch them down one by one. 
you keep asking yourself when every thought comes, to whom does it come? Where did it come from? Who gave it birth? Sn, and even when you get tired of doing that, then observe again, go back to observation. Sn, but you don't have to feel. Feel nothing. Sn, you know like you're not getting any progress? On the contrary. Sin, because the thoughts haven't stopped flowing that's not the idea? No it's not. Progress is made when you're able to absorb your thoughts into the self. And you absorb your thoughts into the self by observing your thoughts. The more you're able to observe the less your mind thinks and your mind begins to slow down. So keep catching yourself over and over again. Sin, so it's not a matter of stopping your thoughts. You can't stop your thoughts at once. But, as you observe them they become less and less. SG, well will there then come a point where there are no thoughts to stop? Robert, of course. That's the ultimate result, that's self-realization. When there are no thoughts, empty mind, nobody home. SK, is realization when no thoughts is permanent or extended. Robert, if you are really no thoughts, it becomes permanent. If you're really not thinking, it's a permanent way. SK, but is it true that one attains that state in the beginning at short intervals of time? People are all different. Some people can do it all at once, some people it takes time. But, if you want self-realization all thoughts have to cease. And all practices have to make the mind cease thinking. All the practices are to stop your mind from thinking, silence, quietness. When the mind becomes quiescent, still calm like a motionless lake, then it reflects the self. The mind rests in the heart, and you find peace, which is your very nature. S.H., who would be stopping the thoughts? Robert, nobody. They stop by themselves when you stop thinking. S.H., when you stop thinking, then your thoughts stop of their own accord. S.H., how does one stop thinking? Well then your thoughts keep on. S.N., um. Your thoughts keep on going. The stopping stops by itself. S.N., it stops by itself. There's no one to stop it. There's no one to stop it. S.N., then if there's someone who stops it then, then you have to get rid of that someone. Sn, that's the someone that. That causes it. Sn, the illusory someone. That someone has to go. Sn, oh then they stop of their own accord. Of their own accord. Sn, obviously no one can stop them. No, the harder you try the more thoughts come. So you just give up trying. You just rest in yourself. S.H., who is this you that you're always referring to as giving up the trying? Robert, the self. Is it the one and only self that is doing the trying? Robert, no, the self has nothing to try because the self just is. S.H., who's doing the trying? Nobody. S.H., nonetheless the trying is there. People are trying to stop their thoughts. They think it's like a mirage. They believe somebody exists who's making them think. Just like there's no body, there's no mind. S. H. It's like shadow boxing. Exactly. There's no body, there's no mind, there's nobody thinking. It's all an illusion. But, it appears real like hypnosis. Like the sky is blue. Like looking down the railroad tracks and they turn into one track. It's an optical illusion. Like the mirage in the desert. It's all the same. There's nobody thinking. S. H. laughs. We certainly keep that illusion universally alive. Because you refuse to give it up. S. H. like an all-day sucker. It's something that makes you use your mind. The mind is afraid to let go because it will lose its identity. 
sh, why should there be fear left, that's your freedom. Of course, but the mind is used to the everyday occurrences. sh, what mind? Mind that you don't have. Laughter, sh, well spoken. But obviously most people believe they've got a mind. sh, yeah. And they go to all the trouble trying to stop it. sh, it doesn't work. No. SH that just strengthens the stopping. Exactly. SH, the good old famous ego. What ego, like you say? What ego? SH, the illusion that we're all, most all are operating under. That's why when you speak words they become limited. You have to say you, me, my ego, mind. SH, Language is structured that way. Of course. S H. Language is structured according to the illusion. Exactly. S H. Too bad. We would be all better off if we were all deaf and dumb. Laughter. Really. S K. How about the functioning of the brain? Robert, the brain is part of the body. You are no body. You have no brain. S K. Yeah. Then I have to go to a relative level because absolute level no action takes place. But on a relative level, someone asked me to copy a few tapes for them. Though I get the tapes, I take them home. I copy them. I call the person up and I arrange to give the tapes. Robert, good, good, keep it up. Laughter. Or another example is. Someone who actually develops their brain, their mind, so that they can be more useful in the world. Robert, useful for what? Maybe that doesn't matter. Let's say the intentions are spiritual. Robert, remember your body is going to do whatever it came here to do, whether you like it or not. S K, and then goes along with the functioning of the brain. Of course it does. You don't have to concern yourself with all of that. S K, but can one be thoughtless and still manifest and do? Definitely, of course. S K, if one is, then one doesn't even contemplate. Well, today, I'm going to do this. Exactly. S K, then what happens? Your body will do it anyway. S K, it just does it. It seems that there has to be a thought process, like get your car keys. And put them in your pocket and walk. Robert, to whom does it seem? To your ego. S K, yea. So that can take place without any thought process. It will be done better than if you think. S K, how about deliberating what book to get to help you in a certain way? There is a mysterious power that takes care of everything. S K, so it will be done thoughtlessly. Everything will be done thoughtlessly. S K. When you read, are there thoughts? Everything will be done better than you can ever do it yourself. That's what I mean by total surrender. Give up everything to yourself and forget about everything. That does not mean that action will stop. Action will continue, but you will not be a part of it. S K. The action of reading a book seems like there would be a thought. It seems like that to who? S K to me. Who are you? S K. I'm your servant. Laughs. It seems like that, but I guess I don't know. Then don't try to know. Just try to be yourself, and you be yourself by keeping quiet, not by thinking, thinking, thinking. S H. But in the enlightened state, do thoughts also continue just as bodily actions continue? Robert, they continue momentarily and they go away. S H, the mind doesn't freeze and never function again. No. The mind continues spontaneously. S H, yes, to which includes all thoughts that may occur. Thoughts come and go instantaneously. S H, yes, and there's no one to elaborate on any of that. Yes, exactly. S K, and that would be called thoughtlessness. 
Robert, yes. Though it's some indescribable something or nothing. Robert, a Johnny is always centered in the present. There's no past or future for a Johnny. It's like Henry says, thoughts come for a second, they go instantaneously, they come and go, come and go, come and go. SK, and that would be called thoughtlessness. There are no thoughts, nothing holds them. SK, so that explains it. SN, Robert, when you were talking about the sages in the beginning and you said see what they do with their life. If they go out and smoke gynya laughter. Or what have you. Isn't it true that Ramakrishna smoked opium? Robert, no. It's just a rumor. SN, it's not true? No. You know who invented stories like that? Opium smokers. Laughter, SN, I thought it was very odd when I first heard that, I said that doesn't sound right. SH, the first time I'd ever heard it was when I was steeped in Ramakrishna when I lived in the Madonna Society. Robert, oh yeah. There's all kinds of strange stories about people. It's the pseudo-gurus that make up stories like that to justify the smoking of dope. It is true in India you find thousands of sadhus who smoke ganya, but they're nothing, they're nowhere. SN, in the beginning when you were talking about inquiry and devotion. In that handout we got from the last class that Bob picked up at San Diego. Robert, oh yeah. It described in the article, he called it devotional inquiry. Which I thought was a really a nice way to put it. And one thing that struck me with that article was he said that, you have to love the self in order to be the self and that is true bhakti. And I guess when we think of love the self we don't think of just mere infatuation, like I love this radio. Meaning love in the true sense of the word. Love above all other things and I think if we love the self, our self, above all other things, then we would find that self. Robert, he doesn't mean to love the self that appears to be. SN, of course. To love the self as you really are because that's what you are. The love brings it out. SN, but isn't finding the self in proportion to how much love we have for the self? Well you can't find the self because you never lost it, but what happens when you begin to love you begin to open up. And all of your coatings, so to speak, your wrappings melt, dissolve and you shine once again as you always did, that's all. SK, what if one does a bhakti practice quite intensely and gets to a pretty high state, then somewhere along the line, through association with other people maybe who are not doing spiritual practice or maybe a different type, somehow doubt seeps into that person and I know the answer to the question, but... Robert, if you get to a really high state, that will never come in. SK, yeah, if it was high enough there would be nothing to bring one down. Of course exactly. SK, if one got to such a state that one could still be brought down and gradually through time that happened, then it seems like because that state was attained as soon as one cleared whatever was going on in that respect, someone could quickly go back to that state that one was in. Well you never really were in that state because if you're in the higher state as I said, it never goes away. SK, well I just mean a state that is somewhat higher than self. Personal self well your practice must have been weak. Repeats, for if your practice is really strong nothing can take it away. But, if you fall back keep going up again. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off and try all over again. That's all you can do. S.H. Robert, the you you were referring to there would be the true self. You're addressing the true self, not the ego? Robert, yes. The true self. For there is only the true self, why think about anything else? But this is why I always remind you of the difference between a searcher, a disciple and a devotee. A searcher is a person who hasn't found a path yet. They go from meeting to meeting, different kinds of teachers, different kinds of teachings. 
From Sufi to Buddhism, from Buddhism to Hinduism, from Hinduism to Advaita and so forth, and they never get anywhere. Those are searchers. A disciple is somebody who has found one path, but is still running around to all kinds of different teachers on the same path. And each teacher explains it differently. So they still can't get anywhere. But, a devotee is somebody who gets absorbed in the teacher and becomes the teacher himself within. Because there's only one teacher and that's the self. And he begins to realize, Kiru, the self and the teacher are one. They're all one person and that's himself. And they become a devotee to themselves because there's only one self. So try to figure out where you come in. Where you're at. What do you do with the teaching? Remember when you read too many books you get confused because every path is a little different. It's true they all lead to the same goal, but the methodology is different. And it becomes confusing. But, when you stick to one path things happen faster, you have better experiences. What do you think of that? SG, then can one say that the silence dissolves the need for methodology? Robert, of course. For any methodology? Robert, of course it is. That's the ultimate truth. SK, so you will be really attaining that truth. Robert, if you'd what? You'd be really attaining that truth. Robert, yes of course. Pacify the mind to what not. Robert, if you can really stay in the silence then that's all you need. That's really true silence. Robert, but there are some teachers that go into all kinds of teachings, ancient civilizations, Kabbalah, Egyptian teachings and so forth. Those are all interesting but they do not lead to enlightenment, they're just good history. And therefore, it depends on what you're interested in. Are you interested in becoming free in this life or do you still want to play games? It's up to you. SN, Robert, do you get anything from books at all in reality? Robert, in reality no but relatively yes. Because relatively a book should motivate you to do something. SN, to buy another book. Laughter yeah, unfortunately that's true. SH, like an addiction. That's true, you're right? It's like drugs. SN, I mean I can look at myself and as you said, I've read every book in the world and I can compare myself to 10 years ago and where am I compared to 10 years ago? And I can continually say, this is the greatest book, this is the newest, this is the greatest, this is the only book. But now only recently I realize that through books alone you can read until doomsday. And I guess unless you do as the book says, I realize that only by sitting in my own awareness does progress come about. Not by reading books at all. In fact by reading the books you're exciting the mind, and that's just the opposite of what you want to do. Robert, that's true. I think the best thing that the book can say is shut the book and close the mind. Great book. And in fact, even a teacher, do we get anything from teachers at all or is what we get from within ourself? Robert, the teacher is just to show you that you are the self. To point the way to who you really are. SH, but a teacher can be a powerful indicator. Yes, to an extent. SH, you are. I don't know. SK, but a teacher is obviously much more in a sense that they can give a student a taste of that or just by being in the presence, it animates from the teacher. Robert, everybody's different. Tape break starts abruptly with question. SH, supposed to live with this patriarch and Santa heard one of the sutras being read and that was it. I don't know whether that's true but that's the story. SK, did you hear about the story where the teacher grabbed the book and hit his disciple on the head? Robert, sure I heard that too yeah. Laughter. Those things are possible. SN. Now we know what books are for. SH. Silence the mind.
Hit your head hard enough and it silences the mind. Laughter. Robert, that's right. Laughs. SK, so the problem, if a student sees that the teacher's attained by sitting in the room with the teacher and is confused with all this energy that the slight problem that could arise is that it's being projected out there. In other words, a student sees it outside of oneself even though maybe from that source it permeates everywhere. Robert, all that helps. Yeah, it helps a lot but it's still a projection outside, isn't it? Robert, it all helps, it depends on you. I'm projecting that the source is here and over there, and I perceive distance then that's not as desirable as I am. Robert, you have to have a great humility, a great compassion. When you become humble and you surrender at the presence of a teacher then things begin to happen. Though you have to have a great humility, a great love. And if you have great love for your teacher, you have it for yourself. Well, of course, it's the same thing. SK, so the idea is to saturate oneself so much in or settle into the realization of the self such that one is always with a teacher everywhere one goes. In other words, taking what's understood and satsing with one everywhere we go. Robert, well, in my own case, Ramana Maharshi is still alive as me because his presence is embedded in my consciousness. There's only one consciousness. SN. Is the presence of Ramana Maharshi different from the presence of anyone else? Robert, it depends, you mean in my case. His presence is omnipresent. SK. To the Ajani it's different, right? Robert, yes the presence is everywhere but you have to able to pick it up. SK, if one picks it up for whatever reason, does one want to be receptive to pick it up all the time, or you have nothing to do with it? It happens because of your devotion. SK, okay, in which case? In which case you pick it up. SK, and that's it. That's all you need. SK, and let it go and then if the situation stops, just let it go and just continue on in your practice. You no longer think about it. You just become it. You become the practice. SK, and the experience, let's say that someone experiences the presence of Ramana, but there's no practice being done. No practice has to be done. The practice is doing you. SK, right, oh I see, that's the sign of the practice doing one. Yes. SK, so one just continues the practice and that continues so let the practice do them and not worry or think about it. Just make it happen and see what happens. Let it happen. SK, let it happen or make it happen. Robert, let it happen and see for yourself. It's like God's grace. God's grace is everywhere available. It's in the air, but there are certain people who pick it up. Those who are attuned to it, like a radio station, you have to tune it in finely to the station to get the reception, otherwise you get static. Though a Johnny's get static, whereas Johnny's are finely tuned. That's all. SH, and the fine tuning just occurs on its own spontaneously. Robert, it occurs because of previous sadhanas and previous lives. Therefore it appears to come spontaneously. SH um. But you've earned it some time. SH, but there's no one who can do anything about it. No. SH, that just gets in the way further? Yes. SH, prolongs the agony. Laughs. Drew. SG, can one say that it occurs spontaneously because there's really no previous lives? In reality there are no previous lives, of course not. In reality you're not trying to achieve anything. SG, right. But can you absorb that? If you can absorb that there's nothing to say. See that's what I mean when we read too many books. 
We memorize all kinds of passages, and we can speak with eloquence about Buddhism, about jhana, about realization, and yet we never experience it for ourselves. We can just talk about it, and talk about it, and talk about it. So we have to catch ourselves doing that and stop. And develop a total humility, a loving kindness, a total surrender. Then everything will happen of its own accord. Break in tape as Robert continues. Robert, I am not the body. With your breathing do this. Inhale ask yourself who am I? Before you exhale say, I am absolute reality. And exhale say, I am not the body. Silence then Robert continues. Janti on peace. How do you feel? Is a meditation too much for you or we got used to it? SK, it's the same as sitting here whether there's a meditation period or not. Sometimes I'll do it for six hours. Are you up to it Henry? Are you up to sitting in the silence for six hours? SH, I doubt it. Laughter. An hour or two that's okay, six hours that's beyond my, well probably could. I'm sure you could. SH, I just haven't managed it. Just forget about your body and become absorbed. Tape damage then Robert continues. Robert, they think they have to leave and go. SK, someday I'll have to leave and go, I've got a cat to take care of. The mind is so strong, as long as you believe you have to go somewhere you go. You create your own heaven and your own hell, and that's where you go. SK, and so we're going to go nowhere, huh? Laughter. Is it true we're going to go nowhere? You can be in limbo. SK, so is that where we're going? Why should you go there? SK, maybe I'm going nowhere, so maybe that'll be limbo. But nowhere is everywhere. Nowhere is bliss consciousness. Somewhere is nowhere. And nowhere you're talking about is some place. But the real nowhere is bliss consciousness. Some people want to live in their bodies for thousands of years, and some people want to leave their bodies right now. SK, some people want to be fat, some people want to be thin. That's right. SK, maybe we should just divide it all up equally. Though all these Baptists and fundamentalists that believe in heaven and hell are right, because they created it. You go to what you believe. To watch your thoughts. SK, I've been going around looking at Ramana's books. The more I look at them the less I only look at them for the pictures. I looked at the color pictorial book. Robert, oh really? It's got so much. I look at it and I realize it's formatted and I look at the pictures of all the other people who went to see him and I realize that it's just another organization, Robert, whom. It's interesting. Robert, it is. This is my favorite photograph. Robert, that's a good one. This was in one of the mountain paths that was used. Robert, oh really? Tape break, Robert continues further. Robert, there is no change, what's to change? Only the relative world changes. SK, and that doesn't affect you? Consciousness has nothing to do with it. Consciousness is changeless. What could it change into? It's the origin of everything. SK, what should one do if one gets excited inside? Inside? SK, yeah. Thing. Yes, sing out, rejoice. SG, let it happen. SK, the excitement. Sure, it's okay. SK, it could go on inside. Don't hold it in, you'll blow up. You'll explode. There'll be a pieces of you all over the room. SK, sometimes there's a tendency to get excited from whatever one is doing spiritually because it's agitation of some kind, the excitement to fulfill it in worldly activity or what not. Yes, that's true where you can breathe deeply. 
SK, yeah. Or you can take a cold shower. SK, then you get more excited. No, a cold shower slows everything down. SK, or else try to recycle it back into ourselves. Students browsing photographs of Romana. Robert, he looks like a Westerner here, doesn't he? SG, wearing three piece suit. SK, my teacher's teacher, I need to show you a certain picture of him where he's standing up. Hey, break a student continues. Even if it doesn't turn into light, does it necessarily need to turn into light? Robert, it doesn't have to, but sometimes it does. But you're making it happen because you're feeling it strongly enough. And when you feel the presence strongly enough, you see its true nature, which is light. Sn, really, light is only a metaphor, right? Yes. At this point, the tape ends. Transcripts 19. Flow down the mind and let reality rush in. 28th, October 1990. Robert, how many of you are satisfied with your life? Laughter. Are you really satisfied with your life? You can only be satisfied with your life when you understand the reality. Otherwise, no matter what you do, there are always problems. Even right now, I can hear your thoughts. They're just chattering away, thinking, 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 and the thinking is always about the past and the future, never on the present. If you center yourself on the present, there's no time for the past or the future, and you cannot possibly have any problems. You only have a problem when you center yourself on the past and the future. Though I get a lot of phone calls, and one of the questions I'm usually asked is this: Why did God make the world the way it is? If the world is not real, why do I feel it so much? And no matter what I do. I can't get rid of the feeling that my body is reality. And this person was truthful who asked me this question because that's how everybody usually feels. It's good to talk about absolute reality. It's good to talk about absolute oneness. It's good to talk about nirvana and emptiness. But that doesn't solve the problem. Solve the problem, you really have to cry out for God. You have to give up the world in your mind. I mean, really give up the world in your mind. I don't mean quit your job and become a hermit. I mean, keep your job, stay married if you're married, stay divorced if you're divorced, stay however you are, but in your mind is where you give up. Surrender your mind to God. Now, who is this God? Because we always say, in reality, there is no God, there are no others. There is no enlightenment. There's no duality, and there's no non-duality. So who is this God? Well, as long as you believe that you are the body, God does exist. Do not fool yourself. Do not believe I am not the body, and God does not exist because you will suffer. God does exist as long as you believe you are the body-mind phenomena. So you don't walk around quoting scriptures and quoting truth. What you do rather is surrender. Total surrender in your mind. Not my will, but thine. That's the best thing you can do. To totally surrender everything, your entire life. You can say something like this: God, I don't care what you do with me. I want nothing from you. I need nothing. Just make me your own and do with me as you will. When you surrender this way, something comes over you. Peace that you never felt before, and in that peace you realize whose body is this, whose mind is this, what am I really? See, these questions come automatically when you surrender; they come of their own accord. But when you're arrogant, when you're aggressive, when you have no humility, when you're belligerent and you walk around voicing truth statements, they go against you, not for you. Be careful. Watch what you say. Don't walk around saying there is only the absolute reality. While you're mad at your neighbor, don't walk around and say there's only ultimate oneness. 
why you cheat your friends. Be truthful to yourself and you'll be truthful to everybody around you. And you've got to be careful about that. Do not analyze what I say. When you begin to analyze anything I say, your mind will contradict. The nature of the mind is to contradict. The nature of the mind is to upset you. To make you feel out of sorts. To make you believe something is wrong someplace. That is the nature of the mind. The mind always leads you astray. You cannot have faith in your mind. You cannot believe in your mind. Remember what your mind is. It's a conglomeration of thoughts of the past and worries about the future. That's all your mind is. But to come into truth, you have to stand naked before God. By naked I mean you have to give up everything. All your wants and desires. I don't mean you have to be like Ramana Maharshi. When he came to the temple in the beginning when he was a boy, he took off all his clothes and stood naked in the street, and it started to rain and he shaved his head. I'm not referring to that, you do not have to do this. But what you have to do is to empty your mind. You have to empty your mind of all thoughts. It's not that hard really. How do you do this? You simply observe your thoughts. You watch your thoughts. You become mindful of every act you perform. From the moment you get out of bed in the morning, you become mindful of what you're doing. If you wake up angry, you immediately catch yourself. You do not carry the anger with you. You either ask yourself, you inquire, to whom has the anger come? Or you simply observe yourself angry and say nothing. You do whatever you have to do to transcend the anger. You watch yourself becoming angry. You realize this has been my nature up to now. I'm an angry person, why? Maybe it's from my childhood? Maybe it's from Sam Scars from a past life? Who cares? The whole idea is I have nothing to be angry about. Then your mind will take over again and it'll say, well you've got to be angry about this. You got fired from your job last week. You were there for 12 years and now you're without money, without a job and you have no reason to be fired. That's why I'm angry. But then your wisdom should come in and tell you, nothing happens from nothing. Everything is preordained. And if everything is preordained, my getting fired from my job is correct. Therefore why should I be angry? When you have that kind of an attitude, you immediately transcend that state of consciousness and you go a step higher and you'll never be angry again. You will actually never be angry again. When you understand the principle of anger. Principle of anger is simply that it's preordained. It was meant to be before you came into your body. Everything was determined. Even the anger. Even my getting fired from my job. Once you've realized this your mind becomes weak. You begin to kill the mind. This is how you annihilate the mind. You reason out every situation. You realize where it came from. Say you feel belligerent. You may ask yourself, to whom does this belligerence come? And of course the answer will be to me. Then you hold on to the me. The me is only a thought. It is not reality. You hold on to the me as long as you can, and eventually the me will disappear into nothingness and so will your belligerency. Because your belligerency, your anger and everything else is part of the I thought, or the me thought. It's only a thought. It is not real. If you can't do that, again you simply become the witness to your belligerency. You watch. You watch yourself becoming belligerent and your mind will tell you why you feel like that. You say well my partner cheated me out of 10 million dollars now I'm broke. I have a good reason to be belligerent. No you don't. Something will tell you this was preordained. Or you may say I smashed my car into another car last week. I forgot to take out insurance. It was a new car and it was the other person's fault but I've got to pay $10,000 for a new car now. 
accident. No, we've got to understand that there are no accidents. Nothing happens by chance. Everything is preordained. Everything is determined. That alone should make you feel good. We realize the person who hurt me or the person I hurt that was also predetermined, and that will stop your anger. It will stop belligerency. And once you come to terms with it, what happens? Your mind becomes weaker again. Every time you do this, you weaken your mind. Every time you do this, you weaken your mind. And soon your mind becomes so weak that you're able to practice self-inquiry, and your mind will not interfere. But until that comes, you have to confront every situation in yourself. You have to admit it. You have to admit. I'm a no good as ob. I'm always screaming at people. I'm always scheming and planning. I always think something is wrong someplace. I'm suspicious of people's motives. Be honest about it. That's the first step. And then you realize who is this way. Who's suspicious? Who's doubtful? To whom do these feelings come? Who has these feelings? I do. What I am I talking about? What is the source of this I? Where did it come from? Who gave it birth? Does the I exist? If it does, where does it exist? As you think along these lines, the I will go deeper and deeper into your heart, and with it will go everything else. Never forget, everything in the world is attached to I, including your body, your mind, your belief that you are the doer, and all your feelings, all your senses. They're all attached to I. Subsequently, you don't have to get rid of feelings by themselves. Get rid of I, and all the feelings will go with the I. Then you can go to higher things. When the mind is weak and you seem to have a little control of your mind, you then can make the statement, "I am absolute reality." And when you make a statement like that at the time your mind is weak, but remember your mind has to be weak first. What absolute reality means will automatically come into your mind to take the place of your thoughts. Though the picture will present itself to you. That you are like a screen in the movie, and everything in the world are images superimposed on the screen. All this will come to you by itself. Can you see the difference? Do you know what I'm talking about? Most of us have been going around saying, "I am absolute awareness. I am emptiness. I am nothing. I am this, and I am that." But when we get down to the nitty-gritty, the first problem that confronts us, we become angry. Though we're really not that at all, and they're just dry words. But when you slow down the mind first, then a statement of truth will come to you automatically, and then you can make your confession, like I do every week. I am not the body. I am not the doer. I am not the mind. I am not any condition. I am unconditioned pure awareness. I am absolute reality. I am ultimate oneness. I am that I am. I am Satchidananda. And it's not you making this confession. You're not doing it. It is yourself that's making the confession. You do nothing. You've gotten yourself out of the way. Point I'm trying to make is: don't allow your ego to make you think that you're something you're not. Your ego mind is very powerful. It'll fool you all of the time. Be careful. Always watch it. Though remember, you do not have to make statements of truth at all. Why? They will come by themselves. All you have to do is to concern yourselves with slowing down the mind. And how do you do this? Either through self-inquiry, through observation, through mindfulness, through witnessing. Whatever way suits you. What happens when the mind slows down? Truth takes its place. When you hear the Buddhist term "empty mind," what that means is your mind is empty of all relative terms and relative livingness. But your mind is filled with the Buddha. Your mind is filled with reality. 
Your mind is filled with truth all by itself. Now why does this happen? Because your reality is your real nature, that's what you really are. Therefore you do not have to do anything to make it happen. You just have to get your bloom and nothingness out of the way. When you get yourself out of the way, reality shines forth and all the images come to you. You realize again you're like a gigantic screen. Screen is the entire universe and everything on the screen are superimposed images. They come and they go, they come and they go, they come and they go. But, you understand that you are like the screen and you're also like the images. Only the images are not real. But, the self or the screen is real. Then you can say all this is the self and I am that. For you realize what the self means. But, just to make empty word statements like that is absurd. It gets you nowhere. First you've got to slow down the mind, and then everything will pop in by itself because everything is already there. Now you may say well that's hard to do. If you think it's hard to do then you have to start from the beginning and say, to whom is it hard? Who finds it hard? I do. What is this I? And go right back to that again. Where does the I come from? Where does the images come from? The images that I am sick. I am poor. I've got problems. Something is wrong. And the question as far as the world is concerned, why does God allow evil in the world? Is answered by itself. And the answer is simply this, it's mass hypnosis. The world that you're talking about does not exist, and the examples will come to you of their own accord. Like the sky is blue. The sky appears blue, but in reality there's no sky and there's no blue. There's only space and space is consciousness. And all the planets and all the stars and all the worlds and all the people and all the insects and everything that you can think of, they're all superimposed on the space. And you can call space the screen of life and you are the space. You are not what appears to be. That's what it means when you say, I am not the body. Because you are really space. How do you prove this? If you were the size of an atom, and you know how small an atom is, and you found yourself somewhere in your body, all of your cells would be equivalent to planets and you would see so much space between each cell. Equivalent to the space between all the planets and you would be in a completely different universe. You would have no body. That's why this universe is sometimes called the body of God. It's all relative, and the absolute is space, the body's relative. So you are the absolute. You are not the body you think you are. Just like the sky is not blue. Just like in the desert, when you see a mirage, you see water. But, the closer you get it turns into sand. It's a mirage. We look at each other and we see people here. But, in truth I can tell you there are no others, there's only one and I am that. Of course when I refer to I am, I am not referring to Robert. I'm speaking of omnipresence. Every time I use the term I, I'm not referring to myself. I refer to omnipresence. Your true nature is omnipresence. Your body appears the way it appears because of relativity. But, your body is formless space. Your body is emptiness. That's why you can truly say, I am not the body. But from now on you're not going to make that statement, are you? What are you going to do? You're going to quiet the mind. And what will happen? When the mind is quiet, everything will happen by itself. The truth will come out of you. You will not have to think about it. You will be aware of reality and you will find unalloyed happiness, great joy, a great peace, a great love, and you will have a great compassion. And you will be kind to everything, to insects, to animals, to humans, to minerals, everything is alive and you will have reverence for all things. This feeling will come of its own accord. If you try to put it on it won't last. 
That's why some of you always tell me Robert I feel great when I'm here at Satsang, but as soon as I walk out the door, I feel bad again, why? That's why because you haven't developed a consciousness of the truth. When you develop a consciousness of the truth it can never leave you never. You do not go on and off like a light switch. Once you have a consciousness of the truth, you have it forever. And you have a feeling of immortality. You just know, you don't voice it, you just know, I was never born, I can never die and I do not persist while I'm alive. I am egoless, everything just happens. Comes through by itself. This is why I tell you so many times, not to read too much J, not to read too much because when you read too many books on Buddhism and Taoism on Ramana's books on Nisargadatta and everybody else in the world, total confusion sets in. Isn't it better just to sit still at home in the silence and stop the mind from thinking? That's the easiest way, it's the best way, it's the simplest way. If you don't believe me try it. Try it for a week and see what happens. For one week I would like you to experiment. I don't want you to read any book. Think you can do it? Don't look at any spiritual literature. Just sit by yourself as much as you can. And watch your mind, watch your mind. Do whatever you have to do to slow down your mind, and then you're going to be amazed. You will laugh at yourself. For when the mind becomes quiescent, reality will rush in. And you'll see it's so simple, it's so simple. Why didn't I know this all the time? I used to believe by reading volume after volume I'll become enlightened. But, it was so easy I just had to quiet my mind. Those of us who met yesterday, if you remember we're going to be silent every Monday. Do you remember? Do you think you can do it? Just for one day, one day, tomorrow be silent. Do not say a word to anybody. Try to spend that day by yourself if you can. If you have to go to work for a living, anybody work for a living here? Laughter, for some reason all the people we attract don't work, students laugh, but if you have to go to work, be silent in your mind. Now here's how you work this. If you have to talk to your employees or your employer, talk to them but shut it out of your mind. Do not entertain what you say. Get rid of it immediately after you've finished. If you talk about a work problem, resolve the problem and then go back to silence. In other words, do not carry it with you. Do not carry it with you at all. It reminds me of the story of the two Buddhist monks. They went shopping for some groceries in town. It was raining. And they saw a beautiful young lady trying to cross the street. There was a big puddle so one of the monks took off his jacket said to his fellow monk, Here hold this. And he ran over and picked up the girl and carried her across the flooded area and he put her down. And they went about their business. They shopped and went back to the ashram to the jendo. And that night when they were eating dinner, the other monk looked at him and said, Do you realize what you did today? We took an oath never to look at a woman, and you picked her up and actually carried her across the flooded area and put her down. How can you do that? And the other monk said, Well I put her down this morning, but apparently you're still carrying her. And isn't this true of us? We always carry with us old hurts the past. We never get rid of it. We carry our past mistakes, things that happened to us when we were kids. We have to let go of everything. And remember the way to let go. You either ask yourself, to whom does this come? And follow it through, or you observe your mind in action and do nothing about it. You just observe your mind in action and watch it burn itself out. But whatever you have to do, by all means do it. Though I will repeat again. When you learn to slow down your mind, the reality will rush in of its own accord because your true nature is reality. Your true nature is emptiness. Your true nature is pure awareness, pure intelligence. That's what you really are. You don't have to try to find it, you've got it. Simply let go of the other. 
Seth, as you were talking earlier about one of the ways of dealing or confronting stuff that comes up is realizing that everything is preordained. How can we do that without it being a belief on our part or on my part that this is actually so? Robert, well then, you practice self-inquiry. If you realize that you exist, you don't have to do that. And you'll come to that realization by yourself. You should have a little faith. I know I always tell you not to believe a word I say, but you've got to have a little faith in yourself. And if that helps you to stop the noisy mind, by all means use it. Because when you realize that everything was predetermined before you came into your body, you sigh with relief, you say, ah, why should I react? It makes you feel good. But, if you cannot use this method, you have to practice self-inquiry. Then you have to realize that I is having the problem, and follow the I to its culmination, to the source and there will be no problem. You have to use whatever method you need at the time. Whatever you have to do, that's what you have to do. But we share all these different methods so you can do something. SF, as the mind becomes quieter, as we surrender then we would automatically use the best method? Yes, to the extent your mind becomes quieter, to that extent does your reality become seen or felt, and it's intuitive. It will tell you what to do. It will guide you and lead you in every direction. But, the mind has to be quiet, that's the first requisite. And to quiet the mind use whatever method you have to. I know some people who really get angry with their mind, and it worked for them, and they shout at it, they say shut up mind, I don't want to hear a word you say, keep yourself still. I can't stand you anymore. Shut up. I don't believe you, you don't exist. And they had a talk with the mind for about a half hour and the mind quiets down. You have to use whatever method you have to use. But the whole idea is to quiet the mind and everything will happen of its own accord. Believe nothing, just practice and see what happens. SB, Robert, the mind can be quiet but isn't also the presence necessary. Because a lot of the Buddhist texts say, they speak of the person whose mind is quiet but they kind of like, their consciousness is hazy, they're like in a daze, a daydream, they're not present awareness. Robert, the presence is always there. What happens when you quiet the mind the presence becomes more dominant. SG, I read in that book that you showed me that said that there was a disciple of Ramana who sat in the hall for long hours and he was able to stop thinking, but he wasn't in the correct state and Ramana made him go for walks and everything. Robert, oh yes. What was that all about? If he was his mind was quiet and yet it wasn't a correct state? Robert, well because fear was coming in. He began to be fearful. He picked up a lot of fear. The way he quieted his mind, whatever method he used caused fears to come in more powerful. SH, but how can you call it a quiet mind if there was fear present? Robert, it wasn't really quiet. It was never quiet. But, there was fear so he made him walk around. SB, oh so it was a feeling of fear. It was a feeling of fear, yes. SB, so that's also a mental construct, fear and emotions. Of course. That's why I say you don't have to use one particular method to quiet your mind. Do whatever you have to do to quiet your mind. And everything will take care of itself. Everybody's different, what's good for you may not be good for somebody else. So that's why I never say, this is the only method. You have to do what's right for yourself, practice, find out. If you read too much you can never find out. Be alone with yourself. Find out what makes you tick and everything will work out. SH, well, reading is after all mental activity, isn't it? Robert, of course it is. There's no way of getting away from that. Robert, exactly. That's why, the more you read the more numb you become. Student laughs, really. You actually become numb. 
you become a person with a feeling, I know everything now. I've read everything, I know the whole thing I don't have to learn anything else. But you never have an experience. You're still unhappy, the problems bother you. You have fears, frustrations and haven't turned into a living Buddha. SH, you have it all worked out conceptually and you're completely out of touch. Laughs. Yes, exactly. And there are too many people like that, unfortunately. Do you know there are people who are like that who don't know they're like that? They think they've got knowledge, but you can tell. When was the last time you got annoyed at somebody? When was the last time someone rubbed you the wrong way or you have doubts, suspicions, bad feelings? That shows something is wrong someplace. You've got to have humility, and that again comes with total surrender to yourself or to God. I think humility is the first requisite that you have to develop. If you want to find yourself again, humility is very important. So what if someone kicks sand in your face? What difference does it make? If you remember the stories about Romano, when thieves broke into his house and his disciples wanted to fight them off and he said, no, don't do anything, give them what they want. It's their dharma to steal from us, and it's our dharma not to resist. So give them what they want. Then again, when Ramana was walking around the mountain, Aaron Achala, he stepped in a hornet's nest. Instead of pulling his foot out and cursing the hornets, he left his foot there, and he spoke to the hornets, he said, Sting me, it's your right to sting me because I broke into your home. So sting me all you want. And he came home that night all swollen. Does that sound stupid? If you think about it, it sounds stupid. But if you don't think about it, students laugh, then you'll understand. S.B. Well, Robert, what is real humility? Real humility seems to only be a break in tape. Robert continues as tape restarts. Robert, quiet your mind. You'll be stronger and you will not react. You're right. S.B., most of the saints talk about being humble or just as big egotists you can find. Robert, this is true. Because they're trying to be humble. Robert, you can't if you try. But, when you quiet your mind again, humility comes of its own accord. But, even if you think about humility, it'll make you quiet your mind. So you can develop the quality. One thing leads to the other, so you might as well act humble. Act like you have humility, it'll help. Everything helps. SM. If one has humility does one automatically have compassion, Robert? Robert. Yes, humility leads to compassion. SM. Compassion for every living thing, right? Compassion for the mineral kingdom, for the animal kingdom, for the vegetable kingdom, for the human kingdom, and for everything else, everything is sacred. Have reverence for all of life. SK. If you forget to do that, if you don't have thoughts of doing that, I imagine in the thoughtless state that would happen automatically without having to think about it. Robert, when your mind becomes quiescent, still, quiet, all the realities come out by themselves. SH. Is your mind permanently quiet? Robert, not all the time I have thoughts that come and they disappear right away. They don't stick around. SH, they don't stick around? They know better than to stay. SH, they're immediately witnessed and disappear. Robert, that's it as soon as I confront them, they're gone. That's the reason I can sit in a chair at home for maybe four to six hours, and it seems to me like five minutes passed. Because I draw a blank. But, in the blank in the void, there's power, fantastic power. It's not a blank, it's unexplainable. But, there's a feeling of boundless love. It's as if my own individuality has melted into boundless eternity. S.H. Into what? Boundless eternity, and I just rest that way. Another question somebody asked, they say, Robert, if you are consciousness, why don't you know what's happening all over the world? 
Why can't you know what's happening in Europe and Iraq what somebody else is thinking? If you're everything how come you don't know? Who can answer that? SG, there's no one else to know. Robert, you're on the right track. SG, there's nothing else to know. Consciousness is self-contained. Consciousness has nothing to do with the relative world. Though if you are consciousness, you are beyond the relative world. The relative world does not exist for you. Though how can you know anything relative? S. H. How can you say it has nothing to do with it, when it all occurs within consciousness? Robert, that's the appearance. What occurs in consciousness is an appearance. It is not reality. S. H. But without consciousness nothing would occur period. Exactly, but consciousness knows itself as consciousness. It does not know itself as anything else. S. H. Oh I see. You say that. But, if it's consciousness, it's consciousness. And everything is superimposed on consciousness. But, consciousness only knows itself. S. H. Otherwise it would be relative. Of course it would be relative. S. H. Right. S. B. But some of the saints are able to do that. They're able to know what's happening. Robert, oh they've got all kinds of powers. SB, powers that they can know what's happening in other parts of the world and to other people. People develop Siddhis, but that's dangerous. SL, what is it called? SN, it's actually Siddhis. Siddhis, yes. SH, psychic powers. SB, that's of the mind, isn't it? Robert, of course. Though they're limited? Robert, all the books tell you avoid those things. SK, so then there's another group of saints who they come spontaneously to them, and they spontaneously arise for the help of other people. Robert, to help other people? Yeah. Robert, well to an extent, but the highest way to be is to know yourself as omnipresence. Then you become other people. And how you help them? S.K. Ramana knew the heart of everyone who came to him. Robert. Sure. He didn't know anything, that's why he knew the heart of everybody. He was empty and everybody claims that he helped them. And he said me, I didn't do anything. But they attributed all kinds of miracles to him. If you're empty how can you do anything? There's nothing to do. SL, Robert, when you say sit in the chair for 45 hours. Robert, 45 hours. Laughs, for 4 to 5 hours, but anyway that's a long period of time, and what position do you sit in? Robert, just like this I sit like this. I sit still. SB, Robert during that time do you sometimes feel a great ecstasy or is it always the same? Robert, it's always the same. There's nothing to feel anything nobody's home. SB, but it's very pleasant right? It's blissful it's always even right now it's blissful. It doesn't go away. SB, more like self-sufficient. When I sit by myself it's not to gain anything, it's just to be. SB, so that state or that place is self-sufficient happiness unto itself. It's unalloyed happiness, it never goes away. SL, that's just to be. Just to be yourself. SH, are you always in that state without exception? Robert, nothing ever happens to take me out of it. SH, is that what they term a Sahaja Samadhi? Sahaja Samadhi. You can cut my fingers off, you can put a needle through my head, I guess I'd feel it to an extent, but you can't take away my bliss, so to speak. SH, I wouldn't try. I want you to have your bliss. How can you take it? SH, where do I want to? It's yours too. SH, yes it has to be. 
If you've got it, we've all got it. We're all one. That's why I do not have to do anything to make myself happy. Some people always invite me out. Once in a while, I go to a movie with Dana to make her happy. But I'm happy just the way I am. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to do anything. S L. Then what is the purpose of us in our false reality of being here? Then, Robert, what do you mean? False reality meaning that if we're not enlightened, then our body is just here to reach that state of enlightenment. Robert, well, you're saying that you're not enlightened. S L. Yes. But I see you differently. I see you as myself. I don't see what you see. I see you as myself, an extension of me. S L. But I am not enlightened, so I don't see myself as an extension of you. Who says that? S L. I do. Who are you? S L. I don't know. Find out. S M. Robert, you were born this way. We don't have a way to be born again to become enlightened, do we? Robert, nope. Everything can be done now. S F. Just one thing about the letter that you shared with us last week is that. Robert, which one is that? The letter. It's a very nice letter. Robert, oh, the fellow from New York. But one of the things that occurred to me is that it gives out that it's possible. Perhaps it's possible for any of us. Robert, of course it is. There's no question about that. Robert, is it inevitable for us? Robert, it's inevitable. It's unavoidable. It's your nature. S H. That's good news. Laughter. Of course. S H. The best. S B. But it might take many, many lives, right? Robert, why? Laughter. S K. Thursdays and Sundays is what you need. Why? Why not just awaken right now? S K. Yeah. Just wake up. Stop playing games. Just wake up. All you've got to do is become tired of the world and just wake up. As long as you have desires, wants, and needs, you cannot wake up. So how many of you are ready to give up all your desires, wants, and needs? Not too many. That's why you can't wake up. Because there's something in your mind that's very important to you. Get rid of that, and you'll wake up. Even if you're thinking right now, I can't wait to go home and eat dinner. That's a strong desire. That prevents you from waking up. Or when I leave here, I'm going to see this movie. That's a desire that prevents you from waking up. To wake up, you've got to be desireless, total desireless. That's in your mind, of course. It doesn't mean that you have to give up anything physically. You have to give it up mentally. As an example, if you're attached to your car, and you're always thinking about your car, how you love it. You hope nobody steals it. Those thoughts have got to go. Enjoy your car. Drive your car, but do not allow it to possess you. In your mind, that is. So you really don't have to give up anything physically. Everything is given up mentally. S B. Robert, is it because when a desire is in the mind, consciousness cannot be pure? Robert, no. Any desire is a thought form, and a thought form takes the place of reality. So when the thought form is subdued, reality ensues. Therefore, all thought forms have to go. A desire is a strong thought form. S B. So a thought form is like a modification that's preventing something whole and pure and emotionlessness. You can say that, yes. S M. So Robert, is it predetermined that we were all to come here to be with you? Robert, definitely. Nothing happens for nothing. S L, I'm still puzzled about if we were not enlightened or if we did reach a state of enlightenment, then we'll just be attached to our bodies. Robert, no. If you reach a state of enlightenment, you become your natural self, and as your natural self. You go about your business like you always do, 
but you are not your business, you are not the doer. Your body does whatever it came to this earth to do, but it has nothing to do with you. You separate. SL, thank you. In other words, you do not have to go to a cave or a jungle retreat. You can be in the world and do whatever it is you have to do. But you're not attached. SB, so basically, you're identified with consciousness, where there's identification with consciousness instead of identification with me. Robert, yes, you have the realization that you are the mirror and the reflection at the same time. You watch the reflection, but you know that you're the mirror and not the reflection. The identification is with the mirror. SB, it's a very mysterious kind of a state or a very mysterious kind of a place to be, it's like not knowing anything. You know plenty. SB, it's a total mystery. That's how it appears to the Ajani, but it's beautiful. SL. When you're enlightened could you go back down to experience any level that you want to? Robert, no. You don't do that. You stay that way. You stay awake. SL, so you wouldn't delve into the Siddhis? Is that what it's called? The dies are powers powers. SL, okay then, so you would not go into that area. You have no need to, no desire. SL, because you don't have any desire at that point. You've got everything, what else do you need? You have become everything. You are the source of the Siddhis, the source of the power. SL, so at that point, you would not even want to necessarily know anything. You don't even think about it. SK, yet sometimes spontaneously something arises for them, maybe to tell the disciple that it's helpful for that disciple. They're not delving into that, they haven't a desire to know. It just arises. Robert, that's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Robert, that's why we have satsang. SL. Yes, I've noticed that at different satsangs sometimes different people have spoken about different things. Before you came here we talked and discussed, and you brought in your discussion at different times and different people had different things that were spontaneously brought up in discussion per se. Robert, that happens. SG, yes it does happen. You do talk about things that are very pertinent. To think at least for me personally that have been on my mind. It happens almost every time. Robert, as long as it helps. SB, you started the Sunday satsang saying that we're always self-involved and we're always focused on ourselves and that there was no space in our consciousness for reality to shine. Robert, okay. And then that was the first part of it, and then you talked about divine ignorance. Robert, okay. What's the point? The point is it seems to me the fact that we're always self and ego, self-involved, self-meditative and living from the point of view from the me. That seems to be the obstacle to realization. Robert, for a person who is practicing self-inquiry, nothing else is necessary. Meditation is not necessary, reading is not necessary. Only sad saying self-inquiry is all you need. If you're not practicing self-inquiry, everything else is necessary. Tell, so self-inquiry is, who am I? Robert, yes. I am not the body. Robert, forget about I am not the body. Ask yourself, to whom do my thoughts come? SL, and try to answer your own questions. No, the answer will come by itself, they come to me. And when you can say, it comes to me, hold on to the me. Follow the me into the heart center. Hold on to me. SL, meaning asking who is me? Who is me? No, when you hold on to me, ask nothing. Just hold on to it. But, if another thought comes to interfere, and you ask to whom does this thought come? By holding on to the me, I mean you follow the me thread to the heart. How did me rise? Where did it come from? 
and of course if you follow it to its culmination, you will realize it does not exist. Me just doesn't exist. There's no me. It's like the sky is blue. Me is only a thought. Again that's why I say when you stop your thoughts me vanishes. I feel it's the best way, fastest way. You just say to yourself I I. You can do it with your breath. Inhale, you say I exhale and say I I I I. I is the first name of God. That's very powerful. SH, that's the best mantra for that purpose. Robert, oh yes. Student says different mantra. Robert, that's different. I don't want to get into Buddhist mantras. But, I I, is the most powerful one there is. SH, it is ha. Huh? Yes. You have to use a mantra. SG, so even saying the I am. Robert, you can say I am too if that suits you. Same thing? Robert, same thing with your breath. Inhale you say I am exhale. But remember self-inquiry is not a mantra. Who am I is not a mantra. Only the things I tell you are mantras, you can use them as mantras. Let's play some more music. Music played questions start up again. ST, when you say the name God, you don't mean something outside of yourself. What's the use of God, the name God, is it something like, not a part of? Robert, as long as you believe that you are the body, then Godish, Farah, the Lord of Karma, exists for you. When you realize you're not the body, that type of God disappears. But that God is very real as long as you believe that you are the body. ST, but you use the words God the belief in God, but that is part of ourself, isn't it? God is none other than yourself, exactly. But it becomes egoic when you say, I am God. Better to say, God is myself. ST, and the term preordained, well that's not from without. That's what? ST, well that's not separate from ourselves preordained. As long as you believe in the body, there's reincarnation, there's karma and everything is preordained. As soon as you find out who you really are, it all disappears. It becomes redundant. ST, then what is preordained? Preordained means everything was planned before you came into your body because you believe that you're the body. Everything was planned before you came by Ish, Farah, the Lord of Karma. Sounds a little confusing because it doesn't really exist. ST, yeah, that's what I was wondering. But as long as you believe you're the body, it does. ST, everything is preordained as long as you believe that yourself is the body. Yes. SH, does it really exist, or does it appear to exist? Robert, it appears to exist. SH, yeah. Actually it has no reality. But when I say that or you say that, it sounds like it's easy to get rid of. It's not. It's very powerful or it appears to be powerful. Laughter, SH, it's been preordained that way. Laughter. Exactly. SH, then who preordained it? The preordainer. SE, the preordainer who doesn't exist. Laughter. Robert, exactly. But, you see to some people, especially new people, when you talk like that, that nothing exists, they take it for license to act the way they want to act. So you've got to be careful. SH, let the ego go hot wired. Exactly. ST, but yet we're all meant to be here. Robert, all meant to be what? All meant to be here with you. Robert, it's preordained. But we don't believe in our body anymore. Robert, you don't believe in it. If I pinch you, will you believe in it? Student laughs. See, that's what I was talking to you previously. It's not what you believe, it's what you really are. 
If you take it a step further, none of us exists the way we think we do. None of us are bodies. But that sounds ridiculous to talk about because you feel you are the body. And it's only when you get into the transcendental state that you realize that you're not the body. Though the thing is to work on yourself. Then you won't ask the question. Sen, so in a way the idea is to get rid of the question. Robert, get rid of the body first, then there'll be no question. SB, but aren't we aware already we're already rid of the body because we're the one looking out of it. Robert, you're rid of the body but are you sure about that? Do you know definitely you are? When was the last time something disturbed you? S, six seconds ago. Laughter. That answers the question. It's easy to make statements of truth. I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am this, I am that. But, when you have to live your everyday life, that's when you catch yourself. SK, that's why it's kind of good to live in Ella laughs, Robert, you can say that. Maybe we should have a field trip and go down the rocks or somewhere to see how. Robert, you can go first and tell us what happens. I've worked at several places, really rough places in the city, while working at night. Thaw a stabbing and stuff of things like that while working at night. Robert, what kind of work did you do? Tile work setting tiles. Robert, at night. Yeah, at the shoe stores when they close, downtown LA. Robert, laughs. He's a tile setter at night. S.H. You would get double the pay. Smart thing to do. S.K. Yeah, double the education. S.L. Robert, have you seen God? Robert, no, God is myself. S.G. Robert, again, a question came to mind. Robert, what mind? Laughter. The mind that I believe that I have. Laughter. The question is why if my real nature is self-contained unlimited why would I believe that I'm this thing with all these problems and all this stuff and everything, why would I get into such a... Robert, who is the I that believes that? You're not the problems, don't you see? You don't exist the way you think you do. It's like the sky is blue. You're not like that at all. But you've been hypnotized to believe you are but you're not. SG, and the way you get unhypnotized is to still the mind. Fill the mind, and know the truth, and the truth will make you free. SB, so it's a case of mistaken identity. Robert, you can say that. Like Sherlock Holmes movies. SK, do you ever watch someone who has been watching a movie and they start crying? And you're sitting there thinking, if the movie's not real why are they crying? They feel like it, they want to get involved, through desire and the feeling they get from it. Robert, there's more to it than that. I remember watching the Ananda Maya movie yesterday, tears came to my eyes. SL, at what part? Just observing her, just watching her in action. SL, why? Why? Who knows? Does there have to be a reason? See, many people have a misapprehension that self-realized people are cold and nothing disturbs them, nothing bothers them, they just walk around like a stone, not so. You feel and you have compassion, you have joy, you have bliss. You have total understanding of your fellow man. I am you and you are me. There's no separation. So when you hurt I cry. That's what's wrong with this path because a lot of people who follow Advaita think you have to be cold and calculated, no feelings, no emotions, don't care. It's not so on the contrary. SB, Robert, if there's no one home, there's no ego, who is it that is feeling the crying? Robert, don't ask me. Laughter. Got himself? Robert, who knows? I have no idea. Asel. Watching a movie, is that similar to you, not you but the one watching themselves as if he were looking at a movie? Robert, 
No, I was just watching a movie, just like you watch a movie, nothing special about it. SL, before you said that when we're just looking at ourselves, we need to look at ourselves as if we were watching a movie. How do we go back one step again? When I see you, when I watch you, I see what you're doing, but it comes in and goes out and disappears. Though if I see you hurting, I can cry because you're hurting, but I don't feel it emotionally. I feel it differently, I can't explain it. SL, what about ourselves? How are we supposed to view ourselves, our body? Quiet your mind and it'll take care of itself. SL, and you said we should just kind of observe ourselves, what we're doing. Come mindful, yes. Start it tomorrow morning when you get out of bed. Observe your feet going on the floor. See how you stand. Going to the bathroom, brushing your teeth, eating breakfast. Come mindful of all of your activities. Watch yourself, see how long you can keep it up. SL, being present in the here and now. Yes, same thing. And that quiets the mind too. Don't worry about the future and forget about the past. Stay centered. But, again, it's hard to do unless you quiet your mind. The self-inquiry and mind quietening comes first. Sammy? SG, could we say on a certain level that this is all God's dream? Robert, well, there's no God to have a dream. So who's dreaming? Nobody's dreaming. It's an illusion. SG, the self. The self doesn't dream. It's like the sky is blue again, there's no sky and there's no blue. Though so nobody's dreaming about anything. SM, Robert, is this a big mystery that it's revealed to one when you become realized? Robert, what's revealed to one is that you are the self of all. SM, that's it? That's it. Laughter. What else do you want? You want your cake and eat it too. SM, there must be a purpose for all this misery we go through. When we think there's a purpose, because we have a body, so we think there's a purpose. But, when you understand that you're not the body, there's no purpose. There's no purpose for existence. SB, couldn't you also say it's for the joy of realizing there's no purpose? Robert, no. Laughter. Or for the joy of realizing that you are the existence? Robert, who needs that joy? Does the self need that joy? The self is self-contained. It needs no joy that you're talking about. SB, to realize its unlimitedness. That's relative joy. SB, so the self has realized its unlimitedness. When you're not realized, then you realize it, then you have joy. But, for the self there's no joy because the joy's already there, it needs nothing to be joyous. You do. S. H. Touche. Robert. Touche. Students laugh. S. L. He quieted your mind. Laughter. S. H. That takes care of you bud. Laughter. Robert, see again, let me explain to you that I have no idea what I am. People call me names. Students laugh, you should hear some of the names they call me. But, I don't go around saying I'm a Johnny, I'm a Johnny. Because that's a word that you give me. But, I don't even know what it means. I'm just myself. That's it. We have all these profound ideas about self-realization, and that's what keeps you back, because of your profundity. Stop being so profound. Just be yourself and forget the whole thing. Right, Arnold? S.A. Right. So simple and we make it so complicated. What do we do with all these tapes? Laughter. S.B. It helps support my ego. Robert. I don't know what you do with the tapes, but I get calls from New York, New Zealand, from every place in the world. And they talk about the tape. Students laugh. Where are you sending all these tapes? SB, we sell them on the black market. SM, 
our tapes are the best way to stay centered. I listen to them before I go to bed. I listen first before I get up in the morning, sometimes I listen at night and I'll listen to them all night long and I'll wake up and they're still going. Laughs. Robert, but I'll have to say that's fine as far as it goes but the best way is to stand naked before God, nothing, no crutch. Take me the way I am that's the best way. St. Before God. For yourself. Remember as long as you believe that you are the body, there is a God, so before God. Until you understand that I am that. St. You mean you're using that term for us? Yes. St. But you don't use that term for yourself though. No I don't. S.L. Robert. Is that true that as long as you believe you're the body, there's a God? Is that true for atheists? Students laugh. Robert, well atheists don't believe in God at all. But whether they believe it or not there's a power that moves them around like a puppet. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 20 For I am 1st November 1990 Robert, let me ask you a question. Where do you think you were, or what were you prior to consciousness? What do you think you were? Who can tell me? In other words, before you came into this body, before you became conscious, what were you? S.H., you mean prior to individual consciousness? Robert, yes. Not prior to consciousness per se? Robert, both. Is there any prior to consciousness? Robert, yes there is. Says, what the witness? The witnessing that I perceive in the dream sometimes? Robert, not really. S.H., prior to consciousness, would that be consciousness at rest? Would that be no content? Robert, exactly. What were you prior? Does consciousness relax? Robert, what were you prior to that? There is no prior. Robert, there's no prior. Are you sure? Yeah. Robert, any more answers, any more bright answers? Students laugh, there can't be. It's absurd. St, why can't it be though? Why would you just dismiss it entirely? Sh. Because consciousness is fundamental. Consciousness is all. It's all there is. How can there be prior to totality, to all that is? Robert, tell me Glenn. S.G. Potential. Oom, any more bright answers? S.E. Anything that would be said would only be a concept, and would be in phenomenality. It would miss the point entirely. Robert, that's the answer, you got it. As long as you can describe it, it's not that. It's a mystery. It's beyond description. Finite can never comprehend the infinite. Though as long as you can describe it, and you can talk about it, it's not that. And this is something you should always remember. Though the answer is silence. That's the correct answer. You are space and now you appear to be the image superimposed on space. Now you identify with the image but prior to consciousness you were not the space really, nor the image. The reason I say you were not the space is because we can talk about it, so you have a concept of space, and again, as long as you have a concept of space, it's not that. The only way you can find out is by not saying anything, by catching yourself between thoughts. When you have a thought and you're trying to figure out what it is, and when the thought stops, before your next thought enters, that's it. The space between thoughts is what we are talking about. So the thing to remember again is as long as you can talk about it, as long as you can describe it, as long as you can argue about it, as long as you stick up for your rights and say it's this or it's that, you're wrong. You're not really wrong, you're just on the wrong track, because if you were wrong then something is right, and nothing is right, so there's nothing wrong. It goes beyond duality concepts. 
That's why I tell you to spend so much time alone when you don't watch television and you don't listen to the phone ring where you can cut yourself off from the radio. Just sit and be yourself. Then you will experience pure being. For as long as you search, you'll never find it. After all, ask what you are searching for. You are searching for something that you already are. That's why you can never find it. If you were not that, then you would search but you're already that, so searching becomes fruitless. And what is that? That is the space between your atoms. Every sentient and insentient thing is composed of trillions of atoms, but the space in between is consciousness. Again, we use the word consciousness for want of a better word. Tape break as Robert continues. But again, we have to function in the world, so we don't walk around trying to be smart. Instead what we do is function in the world as ourselves. Be yourself. If you are yourself then you're safe. In other words, you're not trying to be anything. Just be yourself. What does it mean to be yourself? To live spontaneously. Most of us live from the past as you know and then we worry what we're going to do in the future. If you learn to forget about the past and the future, you're safe. When you live spontaneously you have no time to think and that's when you become the witness. Your thoughts are simply about the past and the future. True. When you learn to act in the moment, when you're acting in the moment you can't think because you're acting. Therefore your thoughts are only on what you're doing and when that stops there are no thoughts and you go on to the next thing. But. You do not try to analyze the thing at all whether everything will work out, whether it's good or bad, whether you're making something out of it or not, whether it's in your favor or against you, all that's got to go. I received a call from a lady in Santa Cruz the other day and she started to tell me about her marital problems so I stopped her. I told her I didn't want to hear anything about any marital problems. Does she know who she is? That's all I care about she knows who she is, then she goes beyond marital problems. She goes beyond concepts, longings, wants, desires. She'll be safe. For once you lift yourself up, nothing can touch you again. The world no longer has any power over you. The world only has power over you when you identify yourself as a body. If you identify yourself as a body, then the world becomes real, objects become real, situations become real, the universe becomes real, God becomes real, everything becomes real, and you live in duality. The one day you're suffering, the next day you're happy. Happiness leads to suffering, suffering leads to happiness. Of course that's human happiness I'm talking about, human suffering. But, as soon as you learn to go beyond that, and again that happens by living spontaneously, all suffering ceases. After all, for who is the suffering? For the one who identifies with the thoughts. As an example, somebody gets fired from their job. They start to worry about that and this leads to worrying about the future, because when you worry about the past, getting fired, you're going to start worrying and thinking, how will I pay my rent next month? How will I buy food? And the mind loves that. It starts feeding you more. Pretty soon you imagine yourself evicted from your house and you see yourself in the welfare lines and you see yourself become a homeless person and sure enough you do because that's what you believe. That's where your mind is leading you. As long as you feel you have a mind, it becomes very, very powerful then you can say that thoughts are things, for your thoughts will materialize in this world of effects, that which you believe is real. Subsequently, if you start worrying about your job, being terminated, and you start worrying about food, and you start worrying about evictions and all that stuff, you're really saying to yourself mentally, that's what I want to happen, and you always get what you want. You've got to watch yourself. The secret is not to change your thoughts, but to get rid of your thoughts completely. We're not trying to change negative thoughts to positive thoughts, for all positive thoughts lead to negative thoughts, negative thoughts lead to positive thoughts, that's duality. 
We're trying to transcend the whole bowl of wax to go beyond and that's what happens when you live spontaneously, it happens by itself. Living spontaneously is a meditation. Do not concern yourself with the fruits of your efforts. Everything will take care of yourself, of itself. In other words, what I mean by that is, if you're in a job for 24 years, do not concern yourself if you get terminated or you don't, that's not the point. Point is who do you think you are? Do you believe that you're that frail human being that has been terminated, or that frail person who has lots of marital problems, or that frail person who doesn't know if he's going to die or live? Forget about all these things, go beyond it. Identify with the absolute awareness. Identify with the total reality which you really are. You do not identify with those things by affirming them. You identify with those things by what? By silence. You see the difference? There are many schools that tell you, change the negative into a positive, but that's based on the world of relativity. You'll have to experience both and there will be no end to it. But, when there's silence in the mind, that means you get rid of all concepts of all desires of all needs of all wants of all hurts. You become oblivious to everything. Then the real self begins to take over which is you and you'll automatically do or gravitate to the place where you have to be. It will all happen by itself, but don't think of that. Think of nothing. Learn how to quiet your mind. Learn how to make your mind quiescent like a motionless lake. A motionless lake can attract or image reflect the sun, the stars, the moon, trees, grass. A lake that is noisy cannot reflect anything. So when you learn to quiet your mind you reflect yourself, and yourself is always harmony, always bliss, always Sachet Ananda, always the absolute reality, always absolute oneness. That's your real self. That's who you really are. It's all up to you. What do you do with your life every day? How do you live your life? This doesn't mean that you have to sit home and meditate all day long. It means you can go about your business. You can work. You cannot work. You can go to a movie. You can watch TV. You can do whatever you like, but never identify with the object. Never identify with what the body is doing. Let the body do whatever it came here to do, but you keep the mind and yourself on your heart on the light on consciousness. Quiet your mind any way you want, whatever method you use. Become the witness to your thoughts. Use Atmavachara self-inquiry, whatever method you have to use, do it, but do it all day long, that's the secret. Not just when you come here, not just an hour a day, but all during the day. So how would you handle it if you go to your work and they terminate you? Instead of worrying, you would ask the question to yourself, to whom is this happening? Who's going through this experience? I am. Hold on to the eye with all your might. Follow the eye to the source. Look at the eye as a thread that seems to be connected from the source to what you're thinking about. And all of your thoughts are attached to the, that thread, to the eye thread. All of your fears, all of your frustrations, all of your desires, everything is attached to the eye thread, and as you hold on to it tight, you follow it, follow it into the heart center then it will just seem to disappear. The reason I say it will seem to disappear is because it never existed to begin with laughs, so it appears to disappear. But, once that happens you're free and you will not be disturbed by any mortal condition, and you will be happy. But, when I say you'll be happy I am not referring to human happiness. I am referring to happy 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 hour really happy for no reason. Again because your true nature is happiness, your true nature is bliss. When you get rid of the other stuff, your true nature shines forth effortlessly. That's why we call this the pathless path, because there's really no path. There's only a quietness of the mind, following the eye to the source. 
then all of a sudden you become omnipresence, you become omniscience, you become omnipotence. Then you can say I am that I am, but there will be nobody left to say anything really. You will just bask in the sunshine of your love, of your happiness, of your bliss. Somebody else called and asked me to explain, and I've done this before but I'll go into it again, what is the difference between a seeker, a disciple and a devotee? We talked about it a couple of times, but some of you are calling and asking me about it, so I'll just touch on it again. Seeker is a blessed person because of previous experiences in different lives, has been fortunate enough to begin searching for truth. A seeker spends many years, perhaps many incarnations, seeking truth. But, the mistake they make is they go from to to from Hatha Yoga to Karma Yoga, back to Yoga to Kundalini Yoga. They go from Christianity to Hinduism, from Hinduism to Buddhism, from Buddhism to Zen, from Zen to the Tao. And the searcher keeps going from one to the other, from one to the other, from one to the other. The searcher has not yet practiced anything. They just listen at different meetings. They read book after book on all kinds of subjects. They become very intellectual as far as truth teachings are concerned, and they are able to discourse everything under the sun. They can talk about everything. They have all kinds of rhetoric. They know about all kinds of spiritual subjects, yet they have never had a spiritual experience. And this can be dangerous if they do not find an efficient teacher who will explain to them what they're doing, for they can go on like that all of their lives and go from one life to the next, one life to the next, one life to the next. They will remain a seeker, because the path becomes interesting. You know what it's like. It's like a king has invited you to the kingdom to share the kingdom with him. And he lives on two hundred acres of land. The land is beautiful. So you drive in the front gate and you're on the way to the king's house, but you see beautiful flowers and you become fascinated. You forget about the king and get into agriculture and start planting new flowers and get involved in planting flowers. But, then you remember the king and you start driving. But, this time you see beautiful caves and rock formations. You become fascinated so you stop again and get involved in rock formations and caves. You forget about the king. Years pass you remember the king again. Though you go forward and this time you see dancing girls dancing in the weeds, in the flowers, in the brush. You get fascinated with that and you spend years on that subject and so forth and so on. You never get to the king. If you get to the king, he would have shared the kingdom. That's what a seeker does. A seeker becomes fascinated by different teachings and buys every book about that particular teaching, becomes well read, but never has a spiritual experience. Now we come to the disciple. The disciple is a seeker who has been touched by a teaching. The disciple discovers Zen and just loves it. But, Instead of staying with a teacher, the disciple goes from Zen teacher to Zen teacher to Zen teacher. Not like the seeker who goes from one teaching to the other. At least the disciple has settled down and he stays with the teacher a while, then he goes to another Zen teacher and then to another Zen teacher. And they go on like this from incarnation to incarnation. Now a devotee is completely different. A devotee has found the path they are looking for and the teacher that they want. So they become the path. They become the teaching and they become the teacher. They take care of the, that particular path they are on. It becomes reciprocal thing. A devotee realizes that the teacher of their Zen path has given up everything to teach the path, so they take care of the teacher's needs, they make sure the path is right for everybody, and they devote themselves completely to that particular path. So what happens to that kind of devotee? Pretty soon they merge with the teacher's consciousness and they become one and they become realized and that's the basic difference between a seeker, a disciple and a devotee. Any questions about anything? 
SG. Is there even a choice for a seeker to be a disciple and a disciple to be a devotee? Or is choice an illusion? Robert, no, not really. You're right. It's just their tendency for it. Robert, yes. You're going to do whatever you came here to do. But, the only choice you have in life is not to identify with the body. Though when you don't identify with the body, you will actually gravitate to where you are supposed to be and everything will happen. But you're right, we have no choice. SG, there is no me. Exactly. This is why I say those of us who have come here, it is not by choice, it is no accident. You're here because that's where you're supposed to be, that's the way it is, and I'm here because it's where I'm supposed to be. I never chose to be a teacher. I never chose to be anything. But, I'm here and you're here. So what are we going to do about it? Why complain? SH, if there is no choice, then you can't choose whether or not to identify with the body. Robert, that's the only freedom you've got. SH, do you have that freedom? You have that freedom. SH, but that's plain out and out choice. That's the only choice you have. SH, I was under the impression that there was no choice whatsoever, period. There is no choice whatsoever, period, except not to react to conditions and not to identify with the body. If it weren't for that we would be automatons, but we're not automatons. But, the awareness in us, the reality, makes us have that choice, not to identify with the body and not to react to any condition. Everything else is predetermined. SK, to the extent I don't believe that then I have a me. Robert, no you don't. SK, or I think I have a me. As long as you believe you have a me, you have a choice. In reality you don't have a me. But, if you were speaking from reality, the question would be redundant. There would be no need for the question. SK, I don't quite understand that. As long as you believe that you have a me, then you have a choice. SK, a choice whether I am going to be a seeker, a disciple, or a devotee. No. The choice is again whether to identify with the body or not. SK, I understand that. That clearly I understand. That's the only choice you've got. SK, but I don't believe that though. You've the choice because you are a me. You believe you are a me. And when you don't believe you are a me, and you are not a me then nothing, that's it. SK, yeah. Nobody to talk about a choice. SK, so the question is, according to how much I think I am a me, and I don't believe that things are predetermined. In other words, I seem to think or feel that I have a choice as to whether I want to be a disciple or a devotee, or I'm going to go somewhere, or not go somewhere. Robert, it appears that way but again you're speaking from an ego viewpoint. SK, right, and that's the me that is blocking from understanding whether that's actually true or not what you're saying. If you were not a me there would be no one to ask that question. That question wouldn't even come up. But, as long as you are the me, then you're thinking whether you have a choice or not. Just the thinking about it shows that you are a me. SK, whom? You follow? SK, yeah. Though this is addressed to me's. Laughs. SE, I think what is arising with you, and possibly with you, and bothered me for a while, is that Ramish teaches that all you need to do is to believe you aren't a me. And the teachings itself will perform their work even though they obviously are still feeling like a me. In other words, he obviates practice and says that practice is not necessary. But, I think it becomes a kind of conceptual advaita that way, because he says practice is not necessary just listening to the teachings, and there's no practice, and I don't think there's much enlightenment from that point of view. In other words, he says believe you're Krishna and deny that you're Arjuna, 
even though that you really are Arjuna in the everyday life. Robert, he's got a point to an extent. It's like the razor's edge. The reason I don't like to say that is because for new people it gives them license to do what they like, to become arrogant and belligerent, and they say, I am total awareness, it makes no difference what I do. I can kill animals, I can do anything, nothing matters. I've seen many people with those attitudes who are beginners, so you've got to be careful. That's why Ramana Maharshi was so wise and he taught there are two ways, one of Bhakta of self-surrender and one of Atma Vichara. And they're both correct. SG, if you're kind of a tamasic tendencies, Ramish says that if you have these tendencies to go out and be arrogant, it wouldn't matter if you listen to those teachings or not, you're going to go out and be arrogant. There isn't any choice. Those tendencies will take you that way anyway. Robert, this is true, so the secret is not to identify with the tendencies or the body, but to identify with the self, and that will take care of everything. But, to identify with the self is sometimes not the easiest thing to do, so you have to practice certain disciplines, certain meditations, surrendering yourself to God, and things of that nature. And this will make you humble, and it will give you humility. And that will automatically lead to Atma Vichara, self-inquiry. And everything will happen of its own accord. We have to be very careful, especially we as Westerners, not to believe that I am consciousness, and I am God, and I am ultimate oneness. We realize that this is the ultimate truth about ourselves, but then watch yourself, watch your actions, See what you're really all about. Don't use truth to cover up your weaknesses. For example, if you were a drug user, it is true if you come to satsang, and if you understand the realities, eventually you will stop using drugs. But in the meantime, you do the best you can, physically, mentally and otherwise, to stop the habit. And it's all preordained anyway, but you do the best you can. And as you follow the teachings, Everything will take care of itself. What do you think of that? SK, could it lead to a neurosis? Robert laughs, you're trying the best you can to do something and it's preordained for that to happen, so you keep trying and keep trying and it's... Robert, well the only neurosis you have is that you believe that you are the body, that's a neurosis. When you take your mind off the body, then you will know what to do to stop the drug habit. SK, but what if it's not preordained that you're going to stop the drug habit? Then you won't do it. But if you realize your choice is not to identify with the drug habit, not to identify with the body, not to react to it, that feeling alone will cause something positive to happen. SK, like possibly not having drugs in your life? Exactly. SK, all right, okay, so that whole question I had is answered. If you say so. Laughter, SK, I mean this preordained matter is not like a set box. I hate to use those words sometimes, because you may say to yourself, well if it's preordained, then maybe I should keep on taking heroin. SK, right. And we go for the rest of our life taking heroin, we say well. It's preordained, what am I going to do? I might as well enjoy it. Laughter. Though you've got to be careful with that. It's preordained to the extent that you identify with the situation that's preordained. Though as soon as you start to identify with the self with total awareness, then things begin to change. Changes will come, they have to. SK, yeah that's totally understandable. S.H., and that will happen when it's ordained to happen. Robert, yes, it will. S.H., there is no you that can make it happen. Exactly. Everything is preordained, predetermined. Is that clear enough? S.H., how can you get in the way then if it's all preordained? The separate me, the separate you appears as though it's getting in the way and slowing down the process and dragging its heels. Of course. SH, that's the appearance. 
that's the appearance. It's H, but actually it isn't so. Things are going exactly the way they're supposed to go. Yes. S H, precisely. But do not identify with that. Identify with the self. S H, yeah. And that will take care of itself. Then you will have no time to think how slow things are, or how fast they are. S H, O I C. As I mentioned earlier, if you work spontaneously, if you stay centered in the now, then there will be no time to feel sorry for yourself or think about your habits, and by not thinking about habits, pure meditation takes place. They stop of their own accord. S H U. Nobody stops them, they just do it automatically, spontaneously. Because you never really had them. S H, well they appeared to be there. And the appearance comes that you stopped it too. S H, no, I didn't do anything. Exactly. S H, I'm just watching the show. There is nothing to do. S H, and no one to do it. And there is no one to watch. S H, right, but there is watching. Who watches? S H, no one. There is just watching only. Watching doesn't even exist. S H, which is awareness. That doesn't even exist. Awareness does not exist. As we spoke about it Sunday, remember? Those are just terms, concepts for the Ajani to talk about pure awareness. S H, then it will be reduced to silence because any term we put up, you'll shoot it down. Robert, yes. Now you've got it. S H, okay, fair enough. Again, it comes to the mind shutting up, shutting down. Though so ask yourself, who has to shut up? Nobody. There's nobody home. S H, hum sounds good. Robert laughs, has the smell of freedom, perfect freedom. S G, in practicing vichara, every thought that starts, as soon as it's recognized inquiry takes place, from where does it come? Then you go, it comes to me, then who am I? Every thought with no judgments or not. Robert, boom. And it's just constant, there is never that writing the thoughts to its duration? Conceptualizing? Robert, no you're not writing any thoughts and there is no conceptualizing. I guess there is no suppressing either? Robert, no. Tape break as Robert continues. Robert, the self you always were shines forth. So we really don't want to get too technical because simplicity and realization are synonymous. We don't want to read voluminous works and go into all kinds of concepts and meditations and things we have to do. We just want to in a calm way to realize that there is nothing to realize, students laugh, and be free of the whole thing. Laughter See, when I was in San Francisco, I visited Alcatraz. Robert, did you? And they had these 8 by 12 cells. And some places had doors that would close because it's an isolation cell, and you have this thing that you wear that tell us about how the prisoners spent 20 to 22 hours a day in their cell, the rest of the time exercising. I felt how marvelous. Not having to do anything, just be able to sit there and get the meals. And Karima was appalled that I had that attitude. Laughter. Robert, well you know you're right. Because look how many monks live in a cell, in a monastery, in a jendo, in an ashram. They choose to live in the little cell for years and years and years. SK, that's a recurring joke. When are we going to go to prison? But of course the other aspects are probably bad. But you have to go to a hardcore prison. To get those special cells. Laughter, SK, it's not worth it, is it? What are they using Alcatraz for now? SE, tourist attraction, just bring tourists to look at the prison, and they make money doing that. It has become a preserved park now. I think we ought to take it over. 
Laughter. The Indians took it over in the 70s. Time for the Johnnies to take it over. Laughter. Get a piece of the rock. Laughter. S.H. Take over the rock, Robert, and we'll all come and join you. Robert, with machine guns. S.E. I have noticed a difference. Two years ago, when I ran into Nisargadatta's teachings, and I only encountered emptiness inside. Now, having been with you for a month or so, I feel very definitely the sense of Ines located in this area, and it's sort of like painful and blissful and love at the same time. But it's definitely there. The emptiness is no longer there. And I have a feeling that it has to do with the nature of the teachings and the teaching style. You're more into practice and into concentrating on the I. But Nisargadatta talks from the absolute point of view, and there's no I. There's just emptiness. I have a feeling a shift has taken place in the focus of my awareness because of being with you, Robert. Certain people attract certain teachers. That's all. S K. There seems to be a difference between the conceptual practice and practice. Also, it seems to me that a lot of people who I saw at Ramish's teachings were also into conceptual stuff, and I think that same danger comes out as maybe not as much license to do something, but they think they've attained something. They think they've attained something substantial. A substantial realization when they just understand conceptually what it is they should be having an experience of. So they take a really sound conceptual understanding to be the experience itself, and maybe are deluded. Robert, who knows? I don't compare teachers. I don't even know what I am doing. I don't have a teaching. I'm just here. Nothing is planned. What method I'm going to use? Laughs. S H. No format. No format. This is not even a teaching. It's nothingness, emptiness. You can call it whatever you like. S H. Are you able to share that? With who? S H. With me. But you don't exist. S H. Well, theoretically speaking, us those who come quote to sit at your feet. It's up to you to pick it up. I'm just here, S H. But that depends entirely on the rightness of the teacher. That's right, because to me, there is no one with whom to share, because I see you as me. There's only one, S H. We all appear exactly that way, all everywhere. Everything is the same, S H. Not just here, everyone you see. Again, it's like a mirror and its reflection. I identify with the mirror, but I also see the reflection. But I realize the reflection is the mirror. S H, the mirror bamboozling itself, the mirror creating its images, reflections. S H, the mirror creating its mistake in conceptions, mistake in mystery images, but they don't really exist. S H. If they're illusory, they don't really exist. They don't. S H. That's a strange thing for the mirror to do, doesn't it? Ever get tired of this nonsense? Well, the mirror is not really doing it. It appears to be doing it. S H. Then what is doing it? Nothing. S H. Nothing is doing it. There is no doing going on. S H. It's just occurring. Nothing is done. S H. It's just plain not occurring. It's not occurring. S K. So that's why everything is peaceful when there is no mind. That's why when your mind is quiet, you find bliss. S T. I don't understand why Ed feels I in his chest, though you talk about nothingness. Robert, that happens. Of course. But before you come to nothingness, you can feel it in your chest. That's happened to lots of people. We talk about nothingness, but are you experiencing nothingness? Talking about it and experiencing it is two different things. S H, and there are different levels of that also. 
Ed was feeling that there was nothing there, he was nothing at some level, but evidently it wasn't the deepest level because now the sense of an eye is recurring, causing him some pain. Robert, to some people there appears to be levels. That's another illusion, okay? The illusions certainly appear as if they were there. Momentarily, you know they are momentary, but while they last they look to be there. Robert, well, this is why I always bring up the sky is blue. Always think of that when you get confused, because in reality, there is no sky and there is no blue. Laughs. There's just space. But, we think the sky is blue. And the snake is the rope, and the rope is the snake. We think in the dark a rope is a snake but upon investigation we find it's a rope and once we find it's a rope we'll never be tricked again. So once you find your reality, you can never be fooled again. But like the mirage in the desert when you see water upon investigation there's no water, there's only sand. Though so we see things we see images. Our senses tell us there are images all over but upon investigation you will find that there are no images at all. They don't exist. There is only space. And the images are superimposed on space. But, the images do not exist of their own accord. If the self did not exist, there would be no images. S.H. So the self is producing the images. Apparently. S.H. Apparently or actually. Apparently. Because the self really does not produce anything. But, it appears to. S.H. It induces them indirectly. The self is contained in itself. The self is self-contained. It does absolutely nothing. But as long as we are an image, or we believe we're the body, the self appears to project images. But, when you realize that you are not the body that all stops. Sage, that's the Maya of it. That's the Maya, the Leela. Sh, too much Leela. Laughter. While many people enjoy the play because they wish to continue. They keep identifying with their conditions and their situations and the problems with their health, with their bank accounts, with their wives, with their husbands. They keep identifying with those things, and as long as you are attached to anything you cannot find freedom. I'm not saying you shouldn't have anything. Possess all you want, but never be possessed by your possessions. S.K. Or anyone else's possessions. S.E. I was talking to one woman who saw you that I recommended come here and she said Robert is too advanced for me. I like Maya, I just want it more comfortable. Laughter. Robert, that's the state of most people, of course. See, but she was clear about it. That's why the world is in the precarious condition it's in because everybody is involved in their own game, so to speak. SK, that's why this is particularly a sharp razor blade, the path. It's like a razor blade. It can cut you. SH, it would be all right. If nobody interfered with my game, then I could carry my game out totally and completely without any trouble, Robert, that's right. But it's in conflict with everybody else's game. Robert, exactly. That's the irony of it. Laughter. S.K., are there some people who can have their cake and eat it too? S.H., we're all trying. Robert, as long as you still call it cake, it's like there's something here for you. What's the cake? SK, the cake is living and enjoying the world, and the icing is having realization. When you realize the truth, it's virtually impossible to enjoy the world. SK, well yeah that's what I'm thinking. Because the world keeps changing, changing, changing. SK, there's no really way to have the cake and eat the icing too, right? Again, the world is not cake. SK, I think there's only one person in this room who can do that. Robert, who's that? Damn. 
assess Sim replies, what? Laughter, Robert, he's been eating a lot of cake. It wasn't cake. Robert, Ramana Maharshi, said that the only problem you've really got is that you believe that you were born. St. That was your leading question today. It was. St. What were we before we were born? Prior to consciousness. St. Which is really at the time of birth, isn't it? What is at the time of birth? St. Consciousness. Yes, at the time of birth consciousness takes place. But, prior to consciousness there was nothing, space. SK, there wasn't even potential for consciousness. Robert, absolute zero. But there was something there which was a concept before. Robert, as long as there is something, it's not that. There's no thing whatsoever. It's beyond words and thoughts. St. But there is something. What is it? What? St. If we were never born then that means there was something before we thought we were being born. What was it? Who thought? St. Oh I'm sorry. I use that word. No but what was it? Who was the something? It's a mystery. Nobody knows. T, we don't know what but there was something. There's nothing. But, nothing is beyond the senses, so it sounds stupid. When your mind is quiet and peaceful, and you sit in the silence, then you become that you're referring to and that's none other than yourself. But, don't try to explain the self. Once you try to explain it, it's not it. That's what I mean when I always tell you just be yourself, be yourself and you will be safe. Don't be this and don't be that, but be yourself. Don't be a woman, don't be a man, don't be anything. Just be yourself. SH, the self then is just a word pointing to something that is wordless, indescribable and cannot be possibly explained. Yes SH, but it indicates, it's like a finger pointing. Like an arrow. A finger pointing to the moon. Silence. Robert, as we sat in the silence for a couple minutes just now, what thoughts came into your mind? Don't tell me, just think to yourself. Whatever thoughts there were, good or bad, they've got to go. Even if you were thinking what a wonderful satsang, that's got to go. All thoughts have got to go, for your wonderful satsang will not bring you realization, emptiness will, nirvana. Many times I tell newcomers in the meeting, Please do not believe anything I say. Why should you? But experiment on yourself and see what happens. But just don't accept what I say blindly. Find out for yourself. Do not let a day go by when you do not practice something on yourself, by asking the question, by being the witness, by using the Who Am I mantra. Who Am I is not a mantra, remember, but a method we teach if you want a mantra with your breath. Who am I with your inhalation, I am Brahman between breaths, and I am not the body with the exhalation. If you practice these things, it should keep you busy from thinking. That's the only purpose. To make you unpointed, so you can stop thinking so much. For many people come and tell me, the direct path is very hard for me because I can't stop thinking. I'm always thinking about something, thoughts just come to me. And even when I ask, to whom do they come? I can't stop them. So I give them that mantra, and then they can substitute for a while. And as they substitute, they become stronger and the mind becomes weaker. They become stronger and the mind becomes weaker until the mind stops thinking. Of course the other way is total surrender to God, or to yourself. Even when I say total surrender to God, some people still believe they have to surrender to some kind of outside deity, but there is no outside deity. Total surrender to God means to surrender to yourself, to give up all your desires, all your needs, all your wants, all your questions, and just say, I will be done. That's it, and let yourself or God take care of everything. Have no anxious thought about anything. 
and if you really totally surrender to God, you'll be okay. You'll be taken care of. Whatever method you use it will only lead you upward. SG, sometimes I found that with Vichara the mind is quiet. Other times there's like a barrage of thoughts. It's like skeet shooting, and it's like I need a machine gun sometimes for every thought that goes by. Robert, yes. Then sometimes I find where I think, I have it quiet, all of a sudden there's like a movement of thoughts that's not words but it swoops there's one, like a big fish under the ocean. Robert, yes. Well first, observe it and don't act and then ask, to whom does it come? So do both, observe and ask the question. SG, it's actually a fun game. Yes it is. Prashad is served. Robert, okay, here's to consciousness. ST, that's just like saying here goes nothing. Nothing is what you are. You're good for nothing. Are you happy I told you that? ST, oh I don't believe that. You're good for nothing. Nothing is everything. ST, oh okay I'll accept that. Laughter, SG, are we all good for nothing? Of course. Tape break then Robert winds up satsing. Robert, remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to pray to yourself, to find joy in yourself because God dwells in you as you. Peace. Thank you for coming, and I love you all. Have a good life. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 21 Robert's Experience 4th November, 1990 Robert, ask yourself, what am I doing here at the satsang? Why did you come? Ask yourself. Did you come to observe the speaker to compare him with other speakers, or are you tired of playing games and you want to get on with it? What is the real reason you came tonight? You had nowhere else to go. You saw all the movies, all the TV programs? Looking for a new face? Ask yourself. Your life is very short. What are you doing with it? Unless you awaken in this life, you will come back again and again, and keep playing this game over and over again, until the day comes when you awaken. The only freedom you've got is to turn within and not react to conditions. I usually do not talk about myself, but I received an interesting phone call today from a lady in Santa Cruz. She said, Robert, if you don't say something about yourself, nobody will know where you're coming from. They will think you got this information from a book or from another teacher. They will not know it comes directly from the self. Though I thought about this, and for a few minutes I will discuss my life up to the age of 14 years old. That should bore you enough. I was born January the 21st in Manhattan, New York. From the very beginning, as far back as I can remember, when I was in my crib, a little man with a gray beard and white hair used to appear before me at the other end of the crib, about two feet long, two feet tall and speak gibberish to me. I thought this was normal and everybody had that experience. Of course being a child, I didn't understand anything he said. It's only in the later years when I started to read books that I realized this person was Sri Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. But, nevertheless he appeared before me until I was about seven years old, then it stopped. Then something very interesting happened to me. Whenever I wanted something, a candy bar, a toy, I would say God's name three or four times and it would appear from someplace. For instance, if I wanted a candy bar I would say, God, God, God. Somebody would bring it to me or it would come from some place. When I went to school I never used to study. When we had a test I would say, God, 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 and the answers would come. Once I wanted to play the violin, and my mother told me that it would be too hard for me to play, so she wouldn't buy me one. So I said, God, God, God 
and a few hours later my uncle appeared, who I hadn't seen in about five years, and he brought me a violin. He thought I needed a violin. And this went on and on while I was going to school. When I was fourteen years old, a strange phenomenon happened. I was in my junior high school class. There were about thirty-five children. The teacher's name was Miss Riley. She weighed about three hundred pounds, and when she got angry she used to jump up and down, so of course we used to make her angry. What I would do was I would borrow a bobby pin from a girl and there was a hinge in the back of the seat. I would stick the bobby pin in the hinge and twang it and she would go crazy. She didn't know where the noise was coming from and she'd jump up and down, a very interesting phenomenon. Anyway, it was the end of the term, and we were taking our finals test. This was a math test. I never studied for it, so I didn't know anything. So I said, God, God, God. Instead of the answers coming, the room became filled with light, a brilliant bright light, a thousand times more brilliant than the sun. It was like an atomic bomb, the light from the bomb, but it was not a burning light. It was a beautiful bright shining warm glow. Just thinking of it now makes me stop and wonder. The whole room was immersed in light, everybody, everything. All of the children seemed to be myriads of light particles, and then I found myself melting, sort of, into radiant being, into consciousness. I merged into consciousness. It was not an out-of-body experience. An out-of-body experience is when your soul leaves your body. This was completely different. I realized that I was not my body. What appeared to be my body was not real. And I went beyond the light into pure radiant consciousness. I became omnipresent. My individuality had merged into pure absolute bliss. I expanded I became the universe. Feeling is indescribable. It was total bliss total joy. The next thing I remember is the teacher shaking me. All the students had gone. I was the only one left in the class. The teacher was shaking me and I returned to consciousness, human consciousness. That feeling has never left me. Now what does this have to do with you? Everything for when I say, you are absolute reality, absolute bliss, when I say, all this is the self and I am that, I am encompasses everybody, everything. I am that encompasses the whole universe. I am that pure intelligence ultimate reality, Sat Chitananda Parabrahman. I am speaking from my experience. Death becomes a joke, there is no such thing. Your real nature is immortality. Your real nature is unalloyed happiness, ultimate oneness. This is what you really are. Awaken to it and be free. How do you awaken? Well in reality, you are already awake, but you are dreaming and you don't know it. It's like when you go to sleep and in that dream there's an earthquake. Everyone is dying all around you, and I come to you and I say, this is not real. You're having a dream, don't you know? And you tell me you're crazy, Robert. This is not a dream, this is real. Can't you see the earthquake? Can't you see people dying all around you? But I say, no, it's a dream. You refuse to believe me. Then all of a sudden you wake up, you find yourself in this world. The only difference between this world and the dream world is that this world is a little longer, but it's a dream. The world is not real by itself. Ultimate reality, pure intelligence, emptiness, space, that is reality. It is like a gigantic screen that takes up the entire universe. That screen is consciousness and all the worlds, the planets, the suns, people are all images on the screen. The screen weren't there, there could be no images. Therefore, you cannot say that the images are real. They're only real as long as the screen persists. But, if the screen is taken away, there's no place to show the images. 
in the same way, your true nature is consciousness, pure consciousness. Your body is superimposed on consciousness. You have made the mistake of identifying yourself with the body and mind. Therefore, the body and mind seems to control your life. But as soon as you switch identities, as soon as you begin to identify with consciousness, everything changes for you. You become happy, peaceful, joyous, blissful. It happens by itself. All you've got to do is to switch identities, identify with reality. How do you do that? Every image that comes into your mind you negate it. You realize that's not the truth and you ask the question to whom does this come? To me. You hold on to the me. You find the source of me. The source of me is none other than yourself. Once you make the identity and you awaken to yourself, all your problems are over. Think of the problems you're thinking about right now. Think. Who has a problem? Your real self cannot have a problem because that's bliss consciousness. The problem comes to the ego. Only the ego has a problem, nothing else. Everything else is free happy, no problems. Find out who you are, discover yourself. Dump within yourself. Be yourself. Become free. Nothing exists as it appears, nothing. Everything is consciousness, and everything is an image superimposed in consciousness. All of your thoughts, whatever is going through your mind, it has no basis, no cause, no ego. Everything you see is a projection of your own mind. You can put a stop to it by finding the source of your thoughts. Where do your thoughts come from? Find out. Go within. Ask yourself. You start in the morning when you first get out of bed. You watch your thoughts. Observe what you're thinking. Observe what you're doing. Whatever comes into your mind, ask yourself the question, to whom does it come? I think this. Follow the I thought to the source. Hold on to the I and wait. Do nothing. Do absolutely nothing. Keep still. When another thought comes, use the same procedure. To whom does this come? To me. Who am I? Follow the I thought to the source. Do nothing. Remain in the silence. Do not try to analyze anything. Do not try to come to any conclusion. If your mind becomes argumentative, ask yourself, who is argumentative? I am. Everything belongs to the I. The whole universe is attached to I. When you find the source of I, everything else disappears. Find the source of the I and become free. Life is really simple. Why make it complicated? Why allow all your thoughts to control you, to control you, to control you? Why you give in to your thoughts? If you want to become free, you have to stop thinking completely, totally. When your thoughts come to you, no matter what they tell you, you have to ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? Who gave them birth? I did. Well, who am I? Do not allow your thoughts to be your master. What you call realization is only empty mind. When your mind is empty everything happens by itself. Reality shines forth. When your mind is full of garbage, you become belligerent, arrogant, wild and you have no peace. So observe yourself, watch your thoughts. See where they lead you. Take control of them and become free. I am not a lecturer. I do not give speeches, I do not give sermons. I'm only here and I'm available to you. So, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer if I can. Feel free to discuss anything you like about spiritual life. S.M. Robert, if this is all a creation of the mind, what about the grand dissolution of everything? Is there any point to that? Robert, the grand dissolution is also of your mind. Everything that happens, everything, is a projection and manifestation of your mind. 
when you realize that you are not the body-mind phenomenon, everything stops. The whole game stops and you become free. For that person there is no such thing as birth or death. Everything remains still and quiet. Everything stops. There is no dissolution. There is no desecration. There is only peace. But, you have to stop your mind from thinking and the best and fastest way to do that is through Atmavachara self-inquiry. That's the fastest way as far as I know. You simply ask yourself the question, for whom is desolation? Who experiences these things? Find out and you'll find that you are ultimately free. You have always been free. You have always been the self free blissful and happy. That is your real nature. Even as I talk to you look at the thoughts going through your mind. Look at all these thoughts that are going through your mind. Why do you allow them to control you? Why? It only hurts you nobody else. Only the thinker suffers. Of course it's difficult to stop thinking, but by asking the question, to whom do these thoughts come? Your mind begins to slow down and finally merges in your heart, and then you are no longer controlled by the mind. You are no longer controlled by anything. Your individuality will merge into the infinite, and you will become free. S.B. Robert, how is it that these little subtle thoughts have the power to obstruct? Robert, they don't because your thoughts do not exist. How can they have power? Only what is real has power, and what is real is consciousness, absolute reality, total awareness. Thoughts have no power. They appear to have power. You have given them the power. You yourself have given your thoughts power by believing in them, by worshipping them, by doing what they command. Your thoughts tell you to go kill, you go kill. They say go scream, you go scream, go be belligerent, you go and become belligerent. You are controlled by your thoughts. But the wise person will stop and think, and look within and ask, to whom do these thoughts come? Where do they come from? Find out and you will realize they never existed to begin with. It's all an optical illusion. Just like the rope and the snake you've all heard about. You think a rope is a snake because it's dark and you can't see, but once you find out the truth that it's only a rope, you will never be fooled again. You will never be afraid again. So the thoughts are like the rope and the snake. They have no power, but you fear your thoughts therefore you give them power. Once you realize they are non-entities, they are nothing then you become yourself and you're free. Silence. S.G. Our problems are only existent for the ego. Isn't it the ego that takes us to the spiritual path or practices? Robert, the ego appears to practice and take on a spiritual path, but there is something deeper than the ego. The self is pushing you from itself. The ego tries to resist. The ego is for one reason only, to destroy itself. Only when you destroy your ego, do you use your ego to do that. That's the only purpose it serves. Otherwise it controls you totally and completely. The ego and the mind are synonymous. The mind is only a conglomeration of thoughts about the past and worries about the future, that's all the mind is. The ego enhances the mind. They're both the same. The ego is like the light for the mind, but by self-inquiry the light is extinguished so the mind vanishes of its own accord and you become free. Do not give your ego power by believing in it. Look at it like you do outside in the sky. When you say the sky is blue, everybody will agree with me that the sky is blue. But when you investigate, you find that there is no sky and there's no blue. It's just space. In the same instance, everyone believes there is an ego, but upon investigation you will find out that it never existed. It does not exist. Only the self exists and you are that. So investigate find out for yourself. Don't believe a word I say. 
Check it out. Experiment. Find out and see. Take breaks here. SL, what can I do when I see the misery and torture in the world? What good is it just to concentrate on my mind? Must I not forego this indulgence in the self by looking at myself and help people in the world? Robert, you are omnipresent reality and you are compassion. It's only when you know yourself that you can be an asset to others. When you become the embodiment of love which is also consciousness, everyone around you feels it, and that's how you make this a better world in which to live. However, in the beginning you don't confuse yourself with that. If you want to help the world and help others, first find out the truth about yourself. If you don't, it's the blind leading the blind and everybody falls into the ditch. Now again, when you find out the truth about yourself, yourself is not an individual. It is omnipresence, so you become the universe. Therefore, you can say all this is the self and I am that. Take a look at your dreams. Where does a dream come from? It comes from your mind. You're sleeping and you're dreaming. It all emanates out of your mind, and in that dream you're riding in a jet plane, you go from country to country, you take up golf, you get married, you have children, you grow old and you die. All that is in the dream. Where did the dream really come from? Your mind and so it is in real life. Who was dreaming about wars, who feels this, who sees this, who's afraid? Ask yourself, find out, investigate, and you will amazed what you find. Tape starts here again. Robert, when you speak of love and compassion, do normal people really have love and compassion? They only have love when somebody gives them something. If a person loves you, you say you love them. When they leave you for somebody else, you hate them. Though the love and hate come. They're two sides of the same coin, but real love is beyond human love. Real love is the infinite. It cannot be described. It's consciousness. It's absolute reality. Real love is your real nature, and you can never really know how to love until you know who you are. SL, I feel that when I practice I go beyond my mind and you feel peaceful. How do you go beyond that? Robert, if you really looked at your mind, and your mind really disappeared, there would be no need of the question because you would feel ultimate peace. But, what really happens to some of us is that we think we're going beyond the mind, we believe we're looking at the mind, but something is wrong because we don't. Once we really observe the mind and realize it's no thing, we are already beyond it, we're free and happy. But, sometimes, as I said, we think we're doing that but we're not. And you can tell. Once you catch a glimpse of self-realization, you'll never go back again. There's no turning back. You've either got it or you haven't. There are no steps to it. It's like when you're in the room of darkness and you find the light switch. The darkness just dissipates. There are no gradual steps. It doesn't become lighter and lighter and lighter. The light just goes on the darkness dissipates. When your mind is really empty, realization comes of its own accord. SL, when you say to look at the mind what you're looking at is a thought. Robert, the thought, your mind is thoughts. If you see the thoughts then they disappear. Robert, as you observe the thoughts they disappear, but more come, more come, and even when you're finished with them from this life, they'll come to you from a previous life. It never stops. Though you have to keep asking the question, to whom do they come? To whom do they come? And keep observing and following the I thought and doing nothing and one day, it will all be gone and you'll be free. But, you have to have patience and persistence. Remember it took us so many years to be the way we are screwies crazy insane. So now it's going to take a little time perhaps to get over it. But, don't worry about it because we're all hellbound for heaven whether we like it or not. Everybody gets there, sooner or later. 
Our job is to be relaxed and calm peaceful, to observe ourselves, not to react to conditions. Remember every condition that comes upon you is karmic in nature. It's no accident. When you react to a condition, all you're doing is accruing more karma for yourself, and it will never end. The secret is to just watch, to observe the situation, and not react. As an example, if you're driving home tonight and you have an accident and you hit somebody's car because they passed a red light and even if it's their fault physically in reality it's nobody's fault. If you react to it by becoming angry, belligerent, all you're doing is accruing more karma and you'll just have to go over that situation again and again and again and confront situations similar like that until you give it up and stop reacting. Then you win the battle, and you do not have to have a situation like that again in your life. SL, you said you'll never have that situation again in your life. Robert, never if you confront it and you do not react to it, then you're finished with it. Whatever you do not react to is gone, it's finished. It's like when you have a friend, and your friend is talking to you. If you do not react to your friend, you do not answer or say anything. What happens? Your friend leaves you. Drew? It's the same thing with a condition. If you do not react to a condition, the condition leaves you. It goes away. It never comes back. SL, do you have to gradually eliminate the reactions to get to complete freedom? Robert, you simply observe yourself. You watch the way you react to conditions. You do nothing but watch. In the process of watching your mind will slow down. It will become weaker and weaker until it's gone completely, then you'll be free. Sell, so you don't have to ask the I thought, you just have to watch the mind? Robert, you automatically ask it when you're watching. As you are watching you will ask the question, to whom does this come? And you will find out that it does not come to you at all. It comes to your ego. Though so again, you watch the ego, and you ask the question, to whom does the ego come? The answer will come to me. Hold on to that me. Find the source of me. It has no source. There is just emptiness, quietness, and you become free. But for one who knows that he is not the body or the mind, there is no prerabda karma for that one. But, for the onlooker it appears to be so. For the ajani there appears to be prarabdha karma, not for the jani. In other words the ajani may see problems, and that's the karma coming to its conclusion, but for the jani there are no problems. Do you follow? What do you think? Why do we worry so much? We're always concerned about something are we? Why? The world was going on without you for many years before you came millions of years. And it will go on after you leave. So while your so-called existence in your body is here, why do you worry? Why do you fear? What are you afraid of? Be peaceful, be still. Learn to love one another, have compassion, practice loving kindness, be yourself. Always remember your real nature as absolute intelligence, as ultimate oneness, divine harmony, bliss consciousness, sat chit ananda, parabrahman. That's who you really are. Identify with that and be free. So what do you think of that? SH, the ego position is just consciousness temporarily playing at being that particular ego? Robert, not really. Where else can it come from? Robert, consciousness is self-contained therefore, the ego is not really part of consciousness. It is an optical illusion, it doesn't exist. It appears to exist. S-H, yeah. And it didn't come from any place. It comes from your imaginings but consciousness never gave it birth. S-H. The identification of consciousness with the body-mind produces the ego. It appears that way, but it's not true. 
consciousness does not really identify with anything because it is self-contained. Consciousness only knows consciousness. Everything else is an optical illusion that just doesn't exist. Even if the appearance is strong, it does not exist. And you can always think about these examples. When you're in the desert and you're dying of thirst, you see a mirage that's water, water, and you crawl to the water and what have you got? Tanned. But the water appeared so real to you, didn't it? In the same instance, all the things of this world appear real, but they're like the optical illusion, they're like the mirage, like the sky is blue, like the sand that appears as water. It's false imagination, misidentification. Turn back, go within, dive deep within to yourself, identify with the self, and become free forever. I think what some of us do is we read too many books, and we make it too technical, and we think we have to do things. We have to do this, and we have to do that, and we give everything names, and we say consciousness is the light that shines in mind that becomes the ego. We don't have to know about these things. All we have to know is, that I am not the body-mind phenomenon. I am absolute reality, that's all you've got to know, and follow the absolute reality, become it, do whatever you have to do to become it. Practice observation, mindfulness, watch your thoughts, vipassana meditation, self-inquiry. Whatever you have to do, do it, to quiet the mind, and then you will see something brand new. You will realize that you were never born, that you do not persist right now and you can never die. You are free. SF, Robert, there is no stuff out of consciousness. Robert, no. SF, nothing is out of consciousness. Consciousness again is self-contained. SF, right, but nothing exists beyond consciousness. Nothing exists beyond consciousness. We give it names like pure awareness. SF, thoughts are mind in that respect. How to? How to stop them? SF, no I mean, if nothing exists beyond consciousness, thoughts as well as mind have to be within consciousness, part of it? Not really because thoughts and mind do not exist. If they existed as an entity, they would be part of consciousness. SF, illusion per se. It's illusion. SF, illusion by definition, is non-existent. Exactly. So they never really existed, therefore they cannot be part of consciousness. If they were part of consciousness, it would mean that they existed, and consciousness gave them birth and now we have to try to get rid of them. But there's nothing to get rid of because it didn't exist. You're fighting nothings. SF, so illusion by definition, would be something without consciousness. It will be nothing, no thing. It never existed and never will exist. It's part of your false imagination. Where did it come from? It came from nowhere because it just doesn't exist. SU, then the awareness of this mirage also doesn't exist. Robert, that's true, you're right. Consciousness doesn't exist either. It's all a concept. The finite can never know the infinite. There are no words to describe it. You have to dive within yourself and experience it for oneself to realize it. There are no definitions. Everything we say is a preconceived idea concept. Go beyond that and you go beyond that by stopping your thoughts, stop thinking. That's how you go beyond it and you stop thinking through self-inquiry and through observation and through awareness watching becoming the witness. St. Robert, isn't it a possibility that a lot of us, or at least all of us, from the early times that we can remember as a kid, always had a part of us set aside that was watching, and from time to time we have a feeling that our lives are unreal, maybe from desire to co-create or whatever and we feel a prisoner because of all this, and yet we live our lives and have these definite strong feelings that that's not all there is, the body is not all there is. I never got to the mind myself if that was a valid thing but, 
Robert, okay so what's the point? Point is if a lot of us that feel that way, and still if we have a duality of living our lives, especially when we're young we have strong desires, then as they fade we still are imprisoned by as perceiving a body. Robert, this is why you have to ask yourself who is imprisoned. Who has these thoughts and feelings? To whom do they come? Go beyond everything you just said. Go beyond it. Forget about what you just said and simply go beyond it. Ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come about imprisonment, about being young, about being old, about thoughts? None of that exists. Go beyond everything by asking the question, to whom do these thoughts come? To me? Who am I? What is the source of the I? Follow the source and become free. Follow the source into the heart and do nothing but observe and watch and you will find there is no source, it never happened. You've always been free. You've always been bright and shining. Everything else is nonsense. St, you mean it's just a memory? Of course, it's memory, it's concepts, it's preconceived ideas. It's all those things, but don't think about those things. Forget about how you got there, how they came. Realize who you are now. I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am not these thoughts. I am not this condition or situation. Then who am I? Then stop and ask again, then who am I? And as you keep asking like this you will notice that the space between the who am eyes has become larger and larger, and in that space you will find your freedom. Silence. Robert, there's nothing new under the sun. Do we have any announcements? Asen, some people were suggesting that we move the Thursday night meetings up a little bit for they don't get out of work by 4 o'clock. Though that's kind of open for discussion. General talk and discussion. SL, when you were traveling where were you staying? Robert, Ramana Ashram. You were staying there? Robert, yeah, as a base. What were you doing there? If you were free, why were you staying there? Robert, just for the peace, just for nothing, no reason. It was very nice being, it was beautiful. Robert, boom. SG, how did you do on the test, Robert, the math test? Robert, zero, I didn't take the test. I didn't take it. SB. That's a good trade-off you fail a maths test and realize God instead. S.G. Who's Regangewar? Robert, he's the editor of the Mountain Path magazine. Though are you still associated with that ashram? Robert, I'm not associated with any ashram. S.N. He was there when Ramana was there. S.K. Does everyone experience reality in the same way with light? Robert, there is no particular way it happens. It's different with everybody. The reality comes after all that stuff, after the light, after the experience. Reality is void, nothingness. SB, Robert, all these people on the path for 20, 30, 40 years, read all the books you know. Most of them seekers, they've been to India a few times, they've had five, six gurus, They've done all the meditations, how come they don't realize their self you know? Robert, because they're still seekers. They have to stop being seekers and get down to business. Laughter. SK, but who are these people that you are describing that have not realized the self? I have not met anyone who hasn't realized something. SB, really? Do students respond with, I am one? SB, well, everybody has had little experiences but something that has lasted and not just little inner experiences. SX. Student explains an experience he had but finds that he has a problem with believing that the physical universe is illusory as Robert explains. Robert, that's good. Okay, let's imagine you're having a dream. 
and we're talking just like this in your dream, and you point to the chair, you're sitting in the chair and you say, I can't imagine that this is illusory. And you're telling me the same thing that you're telling me right now, and then you wake up. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing. SX, the same student gives his understanding of what he feels a dream is. Okay, so what's the question? SX, the question is I can't see how this duality can be resolved. There seems to be duality everywhere. Here we are. We're sitting in a room, and it's apparently very solid. It is to me. It cannot be resolved until you understand that you are not the body or the mind. Sex that I'm not what? Body or the mind? Sex, I'm aware of that, totally aware of that. If you were totally aware there wouldn't be any problem. Then you wouldn't ask the question. Sex, well, it's not a problem. It's not something that troubles me. It's just. D. Just by asking the question it shows that you're not aware of it. If you were aware of what you're saying there would be no question, do you see? SX, okay that's your reality, not mine. Robert laughs, in other words, the dream and the waking state are both projections of your mind. We can be talking right now and you can have an awakening and wake up, and all this would be all gone you'd see a completely different universe. When you actually dream, your mind projects the dream and you have all kinds of experiences, they're both the same, there's no difference, except this is a little longer, that's all. SK, when you dream you think it's real in the dream. Robert, of course. Sex, so the existence of something doesn't really depend on my recognition of it. Robert, of course it does. The existence of something for me depends on my recognition of it, but the existence of it itself, through right inference, doesn't appear to me to be dependent upon whether I recognize it, see it, or am aware of it at all. And as a matter of fact the gentleman just said a while ago, don't worry about the world, the world has been around for a long time. Long before you got here. Now that denotes to me that even in his reality, that it has an existence. Has some kind of an existence. Robert, the only existence it has is the words that are spoken to try to explain it. SX, aha. Uh -huh. That's as far as the existence goes. We could be having a dream and discussing the same subject and talking about Troy and talking about what you just said before. It can all be in your dream, same thing. There's no difference. SX okay. The thing to do is to forget about that and ask yourself, who's dreaming? SX who what? Ask yourself, who is dreaming? Who's having this dream? Inquire within and find out. Find out what's a dream and what's not. Ask yourself. The answers are within you. I cannot give you the answer, it's within yourself. I don't want you to believe anything I say. SX, well I'm obviously not doing that. I'm not disbelieving it. Good find out for yourself. SX, but I have to give some credence to the way I think, whether the thinking is an illusion or not you know. Who does? Who has to do all this? SX, well, I don't have to do all of it, but it's a you know. Ask yourself, who has to do this? And you'll find that there's nobody to do anything. SX, okay then I'll try that, I'll work on it. Really? SG, actually, when you ask yourself that question, who's unhappy or anything? It disappears. Robert, it does you right exactly. So when it disappears, what's that? Robert, what's that? There's nothing. Robert, only the self remains. Well that's it then. Robert, the self is emptiness, the void. That's right, it's true. Laughs Robert, and it's total joy and peace, but you have to discover it by yourself. Pause, now, what I usually do at the end of a meeting is that we have a meditation to help you, 
and as you practice this meditation it will actually help. Though make yourself comfortable. Take 10 deep breaths from your diaphragm in order to relax. Breathe deeply, slowly and gently. With every exhalation feel your body relaxing deeper and deeper. Now begin to breathe normally. Do not emphasize your breathing. Become the witness of your breathing. Observe your breath. Do not emphasize your breath. Watch your breath and observe your bodily sensations. Observe the sensations of your body. If your mind wanders, simply bring it back again. You are observing your thoughts, your mind, your sensations. Simply watch your thoughts. Do not try to change them, just watch. Whatever your mind is telling you, do not react to it. Just watch your thoughts and watch your bodily sensations. Now ask yourself the question, who is the observer? Who is watching? Who is observing? And the answer comes, I am. I am observing. I am. This is the meditation. If you're breathing, when you inhale, you say I, and when you exhale, you say am. I am with your breath. Do not try to analyze anything. You simply inhale and say I, and you exhale and say am. I am. Pause. Feel how peaceful you are becoming just by doing that. Silence. Um shanty shanty shanty. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 22. Lease and Predetermination. 8th November 1990. Robert, it's good to be with you again. The days go by so fast. The years fly by. Your life flies by. Before you know it you'll be out of your body and where will you be? Where will you be? This is determined by what you know. If you know who you are, you will be nowhere. If you think you know who you are, you will be somewhere. Where we go is dependent on our thoughts. The mind is the same even after death, so called. Your thoughts determine where you go. As an example, if you believe in heaven and hell, if you believe in hell more than heaven, you will find yourself after you leave your body in a hellish situation. But, you have created that situation. Nobody sends you there. There's no one to send you anywhere. You create the place you go by what you know. If you believe you deserve to go to heaven, you'll find yourself in a heavenly place. But, that's only for a short time. Then the law of karma takes over and brings you where you are supposed to be. You may incarnate in this planet again. You may go to a different planet. So the smart person doesn't want to go anywhere. The smart person never dies. Because the smart person was never born. There's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do. You just merge into consciousness. You become consciousness. You become omnipresence and you're always happy. So for a Johnny there's no birth and there's no death. There's no coming and there's no going. There's absolutely nothing. But, the nothing I'm referring to is called bliss consciousness. The nothing I'm referring to is, you don't lose your individuality, your individuality expands and you become as omnipresence. Now you may ask the question, how can everybody's individuality expand the same way? Then there'll be trillions of individualities? No. There's only one individuality and that one is the self. And that one is you. You are the ultimate reality. But, right now with your finite mind it's difficult to comprehend that. This is why you have to understand that you are not your body-mind phenomena. As soon as you get rid of the body-mind concept, you become free. Therefore you work on yourself. The spiritual sadhana that you do, is simply to awaken. To awaken to yourself, to the one reality. In the one reality you can have a body or not have a body, it makes no difference. But, even if you have a body, you really don't have a body. The body only appears to the non-jani. It appears as if the Johnny has a body. 
It appears as if the Johnny is doing something. But the Johnny does nothing. The Johnny is immersed in consciousness and has become the self, the total reality, the pure intelligence, the absolute awareness, the Sat Chit Ananda. Many people ask me this question, so what I'll do is ask you the question and the question is this, if it's true that everything is predetermined, in other words, when I lift my arm like this, that has been predetermined. If that is the truth, what does it matter what I do? What if I kill someone or cheat someone or rob someone? What difference does it make if I eat meat or I don't? If everything is predetermined, I'm going to do anyway. So why should I behave myself? Who can tell me? From the teachings, who can tell me that? What's the answer, guess? S.A. Can you say it delays awakening because it creates more negative karma that has to be lived through? Robert, true, you're on the right track. Any more answers? SK, by what you do now you're creating a future of predestined karma, so to speak. Robert, but if everything is predestined what difference does it make? SK, I don't know, I don't necessarily accept what you're saying literally on that level. Robert, get out. Laughter. But I'm glad you don't. S.E. Your punishment is also destined that too. If you kill then the consequences are also there, society kills you. Doesn't really matter one way or the other. Robert. Okay. Any other bright answers? S.R. It can only make no difference if you know that it makes no difference, but if you don't know that it makes no difference, if you are under the bounds or the illusion that there is karma, it's going to make a difference. Robert, that's the answer, you're right exactly. If you have the consciousness of a Johnny, that question never comes up. It's only for the Ajani that that question comes up. Because the Ajani is bound by the laws of karma, Ishvara. It's Ishvara who meets out your karma. As long as you believe you are the body-mind consciousness, you're under the laws of karma. And anything I do to him comes back to me. I have to pay for everything. Whatever I do to somebody else always comes back. Though the average Ajani, the non-Jani or the average person, is always accruing karma, just by reacting. This is why the only freedom you've got is to understand that you are not the body and keep silent or not react to any condition. But that's not only physically, it's mentally. There are many people who sit in a meditation posture for days, but their mind is going, 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 going. The mind never stops. The mind doesn't know the difference between the body taking action or the body not taking action. The mind moves by the very thoughts you have. It is only when the thoughts stop when they cease that the mind stops moving. And when the mind stops moving, all karma ceases. When there's no karma, you are out of the jurisdiction of the Lord of Karma, Ishvara. Ishvara no longer has any power over you. You have become Ishvara and you're under no law. So there's no thing for you to do and you're free. There's no longer birth or death for you. There's no longer any coming or going. You actions become valueless because the action is only seen by the Ajani. In reality the Ajani takes no action. In other words, everything we see is an optical illusion. This is why the world is a joke, a cosmic joke. Because the only thing permanent in the world is change. Everything changes continuously in this world, especially your thoughts. You know yourself, one minute you're thinking one thing, the next minute you're thinking something else. And somehow, if you want to find freedom and liberation in this life, you have to slow down your mind and stop your thoughts. It is your thoughts that keep you in bondage. The only thing your thoughts think about is the past and the future. But, somehow you've got to get yourself to become centered in the moment and become totally spontaneous. I know it sounds sort of crazy when you think about it. Because you say to yourself, well don't I have to plan for my future? 
Don't I have to learn lessons from my past? Don't I have to work toward my goal to achieve something in this world? Those are all human tendencies. It sounds very logical when you think about it. But notice what I said when you think about it. Now, what do you think would happen if you had no thoughts? I can assure you, your life would become better than it's ever been in the world. You'd have a better life than you ever had in your life. Take that tree outside. That tree can't think, and yet it's been here for hundreds of years, perhaps. All of the leaves fall off, and new leaves grow. Let's take a sea, a rose seed. If a rose seed were able to think like us, it would probably say something like this: "Do you mean to tell me that I'm going to turn into a beautiful rose?" That sounds impossible. I'm just a little old seed. How can a seed become a rose? It doesn't sound logical. By those very thoughts, the seed would destroy itself. It would never become a rose, because it cannot think. It turns into a rose by the laws of nature. In the same instance, when you think, what do you think about? You think about your bodily comforts. You think about food, lodging, work, and money, health, and whatever. It's those very thoughts that keep you away from your highest good. If you were able to stop your mind from thinking, a mysterious power would take over, and you would find that you're in a better position than you've ever been in your life by not thinking. But every time you think, you worry, don't you? You worry about the future. You worry about man's inhumanity to man. You worry if your relationship is going to last, if you're going to get fired from your job. This is going to happen. If that's going to happen, those very thoughts cause those things to happen. Therefore, it behooves you to turn the mind within itself. When the mind is turned within itself, it automatically rests in the heart center, and the heart center is nothing but consciousness. Consciousness is your true nature. Consciousness is omnipresence. Then you become like a gigantic screen, a gigantic universal movie screen, and all the images of the world and the universe are superimposed upon you. You awaken to the fact that you are the screen, or the screen is consciousness or pure awareness, and you realize that everything is a projection of your mind, that everything is the self. And you can truthfully say, everything that I behold is the self, and I am that. So, what do you think about that? S N. Student moves places. I can't hear too good. Can I squeeze in here? That's good. Thank you. Robert. After I finish talking, now he moves over. Laughter. I think I've seen you before. Robert. Yes, you have. In the valley, there was a lady who had kidney trouble. S D. Oh, that's you. I thought I recognized you. S N. It's been a long time. Probably a year. S N. Yeah. Robert, how have you been? S N. Something happened a few weeks ago that what you're saying about is integrating. I can't put it in words, but something did happen. I can't put it in words. I just can't say anything, Robert. See, this is the reason why I don't give lectures and I don't preach. Many people come and want to hear a lecture. They want to see a philosopher. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a lecturer. I'm no thing. And when I'm talking like this, I'm talking to myself. If you want to be part of myself, you're welcome. This is why this is called satsang. It is not the average meeting. I really don't know what it is, but as long as it helps you to awaken, that's all I'm concerned with. Why I am sitting here and you're sitting there, I don't know. But there's no difference between me and you. I'm nobody special. You've asked me to sit here and talk, so that's what I do. But I don't talk too much. Because if I talk too much, you forget everything I say anyway. The way I talk, isn't that true? Most of you have read so many books, have been to so many teachers that you don't know what to believe. But I'm telling you not to believe anything. 
stop believing a thing. Dive deep within yourself and yourself will guide you where you're supposed to be. And yourself will tell you what to do in every situation. Because yourself is omnipresence. Therefore your being here with me is no accident. Because yourself is myself, there's one self. And you're here because you're supposed to be here. If you weren't supposed to be here, you would be somewhere else. Laughs. But you're here so what can I do? I never really invite anybody to these meetings Henry does. Because it makes no difference to me if there's one person here or there's nobody here. There was a time when I used to talk to myself. I still do but silently. SD, to what end? What was the reason for talking to yourself, making a confession? Robert, I was just confessing the truth to myself, yes. Usually I don't do anything. Sometimes I like to say something to myself, because myself gets lonely. It's lonely in there. Laughter. Not really. Esti, Robert, what did you mean when you said earlier that we become ish, vera because on the highest level there is no ish, vera is there. Robert, no that's why you become ish, vera. Esti, I don't really fully understand. Shvara or God has always been you. When you awaken everything merges into oneness. The Wishvara has become you. Esti and always was. Always was yes. But you have given it separation. As long as you give it separation, you're under the law of karma. Sn, you can't help but give it separation. Robert, why? Because it's the way we are. Robert, on the contrary, if we couldn't help it nobody would ever become enlightened. Sen, I understand that I agree with you on that, but I'm saying programming for me is so strong that even what has happened to me, I repeat over and over what happens but sometimes something will happen that comes to me that I have no control over, it just happens. Robert, do you practice sadhana of any kind? Sn, who? Dadana, spiritual practices? Sn, do I practice any spiritual? Yeah. Sn, no. That's why. Sn, that's why. That's why things are like they are. Sn, I'm reading Wayne Dwyer, I think he's such an incredible person, the psychologist, psychiatrist, Dr. Wayne Dwyer. Robert, I've seen his book. Really? He wrote this latest one, When You Believe It You'll See It. That's the title and most people say when I see it I'll believe it you know. Ed probably knows about this stuff. But, it doesn't make any difference, it can be through a psychologist or meditation or through you, what'll happen will happen there's no one to say how it's going to happen. Robert, this is true to an extent, but most people should practice some type of meditation or do something to themselves to help. Otherwise you can say, I want to play the piano but I'm not going to take any lessons. Sn, that's not a good analogy. It'll happen, it'll happen. Why? Sn, that's not a good analogy. How many years you meditate, Ed? Ed, a long time. A long time years and years and years. I've meditated too and all I did was get a blank and a wall and I said I'm not going to do this. And I haven't. I know I'm speaking for myself. Robert, of course I understand. I'm not adverse or opposing you. Robert, I know. It's okay if you were. You have to look within yourself. That's where all the answers are. You have to ask yourself the question, who has these feelings? Sn, who what? Who has these feelings? To whom do they come? Then you have to find your I and discover who I is. You've got to do something. There are very few people who do not have to do anything. Maybe you're one of them, I don't know. But, like you say if the years pass, and nothing happens from doing no thing, 
then get involved in some spiritual practice and give yourself over to it. Like bhakti for instance, devotion. To render your life to God and let God take care of all your problems, give it all away to God. Are you willing to do that? Give everything to God. Let God carry the load and become free. Any more comments about that? S.E. I've known Nate for many 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 years. I don't think there's a practice he hasn't practiced or a teacher he hasn't followed to a large degree. He struggled I've watched him struggle for year after year after year and he still feels a kind of frustration with the progress. I know him very well, he has really tried almost everything. Robert, then don't give up. Sen, feeling sorry for himself, I don't know what to say. SK, Robert when you say by all means do something, really what you're saying is do nothing. Robert, in the ultimate you do nothing. So that's the whole process it seems. Robert, but you have to realize that you are nothing first and if you're confounded with all kinds of material things you can't see that yet. SK, it seems so logical for me because I've done much meditation and coming across this path, the idea of self-inquiry as you say all things are attached to the self, the I. Until we find out about this I, what is the use of practices or reading books, who's practicing, who's reading books to what end? Robert, that's the practice to follow the I. But really it's not so much practicing, it's not practicing in a sense. Robert, true. Though I'm trying to make a point that as long as, well, just can't make the point. Robert, I know what you mean. You meditate to learn that you don't have to meditate in other words. Robert, yes. You are that. Robert, yes. Turns to Nate. But Nate, the whole problem is yourself. You've got to get yourself out of the way and let the divine circuits take over. Sen, I am aware of all these things in fact I don't want to talk because sometimes people laugh and... Robert, nobody laughs. Some of these people are afraid to ask questions and things like that. I'm aware of getting yourself out of the way then the question, how do you get yourself out of the way? And there's no how, it's like going in a circle. Robert, then you should take one of the answers. Sen, one of the what? Answers that you get and follow it through. Like when you get up in the morning. The first thing to realize is, I exist, and then you realize I slept, I dreamt and now I'm awake and I exist. So who was the I that was present during the waking, sleeping and dreaming? I. Sen, I would like to say that in this book, I only read about half of it. Dwyer he has made some connections, no doubt about it, he explains how he does it. But, he explains how the waking dream and the sleeping dream are the same. He does such a beautiful job that you think when you're reading it that the waking dream and the sleeping dream are the same, it's really succinctly put. Robert, well that's great does he tell you what to do to get there? S.N. You know I'll tell you what happened since you asked me. Laughs. I read about half the book, but I must be on some mailing list, but I receive, he's in Chicago, and I received a set from Dr. Wayne Dwyer. I'll send you six tapes and keep them for 30 days. If you feel they are of value to you, send me $40, the price. If you don't send the tapes back. Well, I've never heard anybody give a presentation like that. So I called up the 800 number in Chicago, and I expect the tapes any day. I'm curious what they're like, I think he might have something. Robert, that's good, perhaps they can help. SN, perhaps. But in the last analysis, Nate, nothing can help you but yourself. SN, that's the self that's the problem since I'm expounding. Then for whom is the problem? SN. My ego, my searching, my wanting. Follow it through, rather say the problem is for me. I have the problem. Then what is the source of the I? SN, 
I've created the problem with wants or desires. No, follow the I. All the things that you are saying, they're all attached to the I. If you solve the mystery of the I, everything else will go away with it. Because everything, the world, the body, the mind are all attached to I. So when you ask the question, who am I, or from whence do I come, or what is the source of I, and you keep silent, everything else will be diminished, all your problems will all go away with the I. Then, what was that Gurdjieff expounding the different eyes? Remember Gurdjieff? Robert, yes. Perhaps he was, but no matter who's expounding it, practice it, do it, make it happen, that's the whole thing. There are so many teachers, but you've got to be your own teacher, and you've got to work on yourself or do something, until something gives way. No matter how long it takes, never give up. SD, did you get the tapes? SN, no they haven't come yet. I will share with, he said you play them over and over. And each time you play them, you'll hear something different. Students laugh. SK, subliminal. SN, no not subliminal. SG, you got the tapes playing over and over and you don't know what he's saying. Why don't you just burn up the tapes? Laughter, SN, that's true. Robert, well again, your being here is no accident. So let's see what happens to you. You've got my blessing. All is well. What difference does it make what happens to us if we do not react? The secret is just not to react, come what may. And the only reason we get upset is because the world is not turning our way. SG, that's right, it's true. He agrees. SG, I absolutely won, 100%, no doubt about it. At least I've got somebody who agrees with me. Students laugh, see what Shakespeare has said, nothing is either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. SG, that's right. Therefore when something happens to us of a negative nature, it's not because something bad has happened. That's just the way we see it. It's our perspective, our concept. We have preconceived ideas what's good and what's bad. Though we expect the good things, and we want to avoid the bad things. But, the so-called bad things are just the other side of the coin of the good things. As long as you believe you are the body or the mind, you have to experience both, good and bad, everybody does. You cannot avoid it. It's only when you stop reacting that you transcend your karma and you become totally free. What do you think of that? And as I mentioned before, the fastest way to become awakened is to stop the mind from thinking. There's no faster way. And the way you do that is by investigating your mind. Investigate what your mind is. You will soon discover it is nothing but a bundle of thoughts about the past and the future. And if you stop and watch those thoughts, observe those thoughts, become the witness to those thoughts, then you become silent and the thoughts diminish. You ultimately become free. And that's the way you do it. Any questions? SH, can you witness? If there's a you witnessing, then it's not witnessing. Robert, in the beginning you have to use your mind to destroy your mind. So you use your mind to witness, and then the witness goes from the mind to the self and observes everything and does not react. SH doesn't react. But in the beginning you're using your mind. Like Ramana used to say, it's like a policeman becoming the thief to catch the thief. Do you use the mind in the beginning to subdue it? SH, the mind is the ego mind. The ego mind. The ego and the mind are simultaneously alike. They're the same thing. You simply observe your thoughts. You observe yourself thinking, you watch, you observe everything around you. You react to nothing. You just observe. As you keep doing this day after day, day after day, day after day, the mind energy begins to slow down. 
As the weeks and months go by the mind slows down until the mind is conquered. Then you will realize there never was a mind to begin with and you've been fighting nothing all these years. The mind is an optical illusion, it appears real. Just like a dream appears real. So the mind appears real. And as long as the mind appears real, it projects and manifests the whole universe. Therefore the whole universe, especially all of your affairs, are nothing more than a mind's projection. When you turn yourself inwardly and ask, to whom do these things come? You will soon discover that there's no me and you will be free. How does that grab you? SH seems like a lot of nonsense. Robert, that's what it is. No sense. Laughter. No sense. SH, you've no sense to you. Thank you. SH, there was never a you or a separate you or me in the first place, so all this has gone through just to arrive at that obvious fact. Why not just awaken right now? SH, why not? And forget the whole thing. SH, great idea, but it's an idea. Do it. Make it happen, become centered. There is no past or future for you. Your ultimate oneness, you're free right now. I said to take it, it's yours. Enjoy it. SA, Robert, I have a question. Robert, sure. It seems to me that if we accept the teaching and the practice, you said again and again, you can pursue your ordinary life, except that you pursue all of your activities with non-attachment. With detachment, indifferent to what happens. You said this many times. But, it seems to me that if you do this, if you go along with the teaching and the practice that eventually it becomes very difficult to live in the world and that your physical world will change greatly and that it's almost impossible to pursue this life unless you have some type of organization, some type of support which allows you to persist in it. Robert, that's how it appears to you right now. But, that's not true. As I mentioned before, your body's going to go through the motions and do whatever it came to this earth to do, but it has nothing to do with you, that's your body. When you awaken, you observe your body just like you observe everything else in the world. But, you understand it's not you. And your body will go through the motions. So if you're going to be an artist, you'll become a great artist. If you're going to become a musician, you're going to become a great musician. But, you will realize this has nothing to do with you. Take break. Robert. If you see a lot of evil in the world, you realize that you're seeing yourself. And you must ask yourself, to whom does this come? Who sees all this? And again the answer will be, well this all comes to me. Hold on to the me. Follow the me to the source. There is no source, there is silence. And in that silence you become free and liberated. So the highest teaching is silence. Now remember when I speak of silence. I'm not referring to you just sitting still like a statue. Because when you're sitting still like a statue, your mind is still chattering away. I'm talking about silence in your mind and your thoughts. Quietening the mind, making the mind quiescent, calm, still by not reacting to person, place or thing. Then you'll always be happy. If you don't react, you'll always be blissful. What do you think of that? S.H. All reaction is the activity of the notion of a separate self. Robert. All reaction is the activity of the mind. S.H. Same thing. Boom. Robert agrees. S.H. There's no mind in separate self. How do you get rid of it? So ask yourself. To whom does this come? That's how you get rid of it. Who reacts? I do. Well, who am I? What is the source of the I? And follow it to its culmination. Then you will realize that you've always been free. 
that there are no problems. There never were any problems. There will never be any problems. Simple, why make it difficult? SD, I cannot quite understand how non reacting really relates to bliss. I would think it would relate more to nothing. Robert, nothing is bliss. The nothing that you're referring to is the ultimate reality, absolute oneness, bliss, that's nothing. SD, and everything. When there's something that's duality. Something is always duality. SD, how is nothing different from the void? The void is the same as nothing. What Buddhism means by the void, they mean Buddhahood, absolute bliss, nirvana, emptiness. They're all synonymous with bliss. SD, I guess that's a nuance, so in our culture we don't usually relate. Of course not. That's why I always tell you when someone says to you, you're good for nothing, say thank you. Laughs. SG, I have a question relating to the self. You mentioned happiness. Is happiness really important for one to have in their life? Robert, we're not talking about human happiness. We're talking about unalloyed happiness. Happiness that comes from the self. A happiness that is everything so it needs nothing. A happiness that is omnipresence, God, Parabrahman, complete total happiness. That is foreign to us because we associate happiness with things. And this is beyond things. There's some things we can't understand finitely. We have to close our eyes and go deep within to find that happiness. SD so it really requires an active faith to continue self-inquiry for years and years since we can't conceive of it with the mind and we're using the mind to try to conceive of it. It's really faith we're talking about, isn't it? Robert, no not really, it's Atmavichara self-inquiry. We're not asked to believe anything, we're asked to ask ourselves who has this body come to? Whose mind is this? To whom does it come? Who's going through karma? Who's experiencing cause and effect? To whom does it come? That's what we're asked to do. Not to have faith in anything. SD, well in a way, maybe it's just semantics, but it seems like you have to have faith that that would work. It's more scientific. You just practice something and want to see the result. SD, even many of the books that Maharshi wrote many have complained for having tried for years. Yes. SD, so that's the point we're talking about, so it's obviously them feeling phenomena. And he told them to continue. SD, whom? That's the kind of faith I'm talking about here. Know what you have to really do is analyze your life and look at your past and say, do I want to keep going through this again? SD, no. Laughs or do I want to go somewhere else? Though so you keep on practicing. Laughs. SC, it also depends on whether you're practicing self-inquiry as part of a goal to reach some state or for its own sake because you don't trust anything else. If you're practicing self-inquiry just for the sake of self-inquiry because you don't like the way things are, it's an entirely different thing than practicing in order to gain enlightenment which sort of spoils the whole process. Robert, yes. Because it's colored by the goal of attaining something. Robert, very true there are no goals. Due to the fact that you can't attain anything that you already are. There's no thing to attain. It takes a waking a process to just wake up that's all. S.E. When I first read Nisargadatta for the first time I had utter faith in a teacher's teachings in Advaita Vedanta. And when I first met Robert he shook me out of that faith and I've started self-inquiry again and they're complementary but they're different. Robert, boom, agrees. S.A. How are they different? S.E. One from Nisargadatta's point of view it's like you accept that you're the absolute and you don't do anything. From Robert's point of view you recognize you're still a limited human being and have the power to investigate that I-ness and that there is something you can do, 
at least that's how I conceptualize what's happened to me, and I like the latter better because it feels more real. It's more of an acceptance of your limitations and your humanity as you are. Self-inquiry is more gentle than the kind of coldness that I felt with Nisargadite. You just accept that you're the absolute and pretend you're God, or you pretend you're Krishna, and then wait for enlightenment to come to you. There was a coldness that I had with that that I don't feel now. SL, I think you get that with Nisar, Gadata's teachings like you know when people who go to see Nisar, Gadita, and who say things like, oh I'm God I'm. SE, yes I know. It's true. Now when I read Nisar Gadeta, I reasoned very differently, a very different understanding now. It was Ramish's Nisar Gadata that. SL, that was the mind's Nisar Gadata. Yes, exactly. Robert, it's interesting how we can look at a book and then come back to it and get a different meaning to it completely. S.E. Yes. S.L. That's an example of his projection of the mind. Robert. Yes. They're just projecting their own mind. It's meaningless. Robert. This is why I say we should destroy all of our books and have no crutch whatsoever. And lean on yourself. Be what you are and where you are and take it from there. When most people don't feel too hot and they feel out of sorts, they take out a book from the library shelf and they read something and they say, ah, now I feel good. But the book becomes a crutch. Whether it's the Bible or whatever you read. You've got to become the living essence of the Bible. You've got to become the living essence of the book that you read and you do that by contemplating yourself. Whenever you feel out of sorts, do not go to somebody external by taking a book or anything like that. But, simply ask yourself, who feels out of sorts? Who has these feelings? To whom do they come? And follow it through and the feelings will disappear of their own accord. Silence. SL. It's interesting too, you know. It depends on what ears this falls on. For some ears people get really sour when they hear this. Laugh to Robert. Sure. Laugh some they smile. SE. In most it falls only once. SG. That's the truth like a hammer which keeps hitting over and over again until it gets through. Could you say about what Ramana was like? Could you say something a little bit about it? Robert, what can you say? It's like looking in a mirror. When I saw Ramana I saw myself. SD, but you also have said that you asked immediately what you could do for him. Was that love of self or love of what he represented? I saw he had physical difficulties, so I asked what I can do for him, and he just told me to be myself. Ramana was just like a rubber ball, his attendees used to just push him up the hills, carrying him along, push him on the bed and he'd just go along with everything. SD. Well that Ananda Mayamar she was sort of the same way, she was. Oh yes. SD. Always serene and out of the clutter and cluster around him. And you seem that way. You're always the same. Boom. But what else is new? Turns to student. Do you have something to read? Narada always brings good things to read. SK. He doesn't follow your advice at all. Laughter no he takes up our time and gives us something to do. Though when you go home you can say. I was at a long meeting. Narada. This is from the latest issue of the Mountain Path from Ramana Ashram. Magic Quest, Know Thyself. Popularly attributed to Socrates has gripped the attention of the greatest seers, sages and thinkers of all ages. It is the essential experience welling up from the heart of yearning souls belonging to every country of the world and giving expression to it, the terminologies, the words and the language may differ but the essence and its contents is the same. The command of Vedanta is, Atmanam Vidi, Know the Self. 
In fact, this experiential dictum is at the back of all Eastern religions. Though it is true that the basis of this dictum is too fundamental to be classified under any philosophy or thinker or age. That is, knowing the knower, is the aim of all spiritual strivings, in all ages, and of all religions. Not to know the knower and yet to know all else is termed total ignorance, hence very great importance is given to knowing oneself. Know thyself is the same as know who you are, or asking, who am I, or seeking, whence am I this ancient quest is the ground and fundamental teaching of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. Simple being is the self, said Maharshi. This being is consciousness. The very living principle of each one of us is this consciousness. Any form of awareness is embedded only in this vast expanse of consciousness. The triple principle dominating man's activities is called tripudi comprising the knower, the object known, and the act of knowing occurs only in consciousness. Experiences are classified into Atavata, Tiriya and the waking, the dreaming and the deep sleep states, which also take place only in consciousness. Likewise the pair of opposites like right and wrong, good and bad, day and night or concepts like being and non-being get exposed only in the backdrop of consciousness. Thus consciousness is the ground or secret on which they play. While one is aware constantly and gets involved deeply in this drama, the basis substratum on which the play takes place is totally forgotten by whom? To turn one's attention from the details or activities to the source of activity is called introspection. This turning inward is the beginning of spiritual effort called sadhana. Taking a right turn about, turn from total consciousness is the positive key to open the gates to know oneself. Becoming conscious or aware of something else brings in the triple tripedia pacta turiya. But, pure consciousness is pure awareness per se. It is the basis for all motion while remaining motionless, unaffected by any movement. Perhaps an analogy will help us understand consciousness as our basis. Electricity flows through a wire. It is invisible and intangible. When the electric bulb is connected to the wire, the lamp gets lit up. The color of the glass of the bulb determines the color of the light. When flowing through a fan the current makes the fan rotate. Connected to a pump it lifts water. The current flowing in all these cases is one and the same, but its effects are different. Similarly when the pure light of consciousness passes through different physical, emotional, mental and ego vestitures, it looks as though it is limiting itself by taking the color and texture of that particular vestiture. Since the bulb, fan and pump are visible to the eye and not the electricity, the utility aspects engages one's intention, the root or the cause, the electricity being ignored. Likewise man's activities ensnare him and make him forget his very nature as consciousness. When consciousness is confined to an individual or the body it gets clouded by the manifestation. This descent results in the ego, the non-self mistaking itself for the self. Conversely ego fluctuating through the physical, emotional and mental fields has the power to cloud or veil pure consciousness. Ego has no existence apart from the self. Like the gold ornament has no existence apart from the gold. But, the self exists always. Ego is only a shadow of the self. It catches hold of the body and through it projects itself as the self thus ego thrives in the world as conscious perceiver and enjoyer of the world. It hops from one form to another since no form is permanent. Such impermanent movement is called the cycle of birth and death. This limitation is technically termed samsara. Freedom from such bondage is called moksha, release back into total consciousness. Absolute release into pure consciousness is the ultimate goal of human life, the release from the ego. How to effect it? 
through introspection, deep inquiry, atma vichara, self-inquiry, release from the bonds of ego is gained. This is the process of, who am I? Inquiry. The technique to know oneself. The bondage is the ego. The bondage is for the ego. Consciousness, conditioning or identifying itself into a body is this ego. The ego exists say the scriptures do to non-inquiry, avichara. This avichara is sustained and strengthened by ignorance. Consciousness is pure attention alone. When the attention is held unmoved, there is no place for ego or non-attention. To hold the attention on itself, to dissolve or transform non-attention into total attention, total consciousness, the quest, who am I, is the vital process. To turn one's attention on oneself is the essence of true knowledge. Such self-attention is the key to open the mystery gates of the immeasurable treasure, knowing the knower. The knower known there is none else, nothing else to be known. To remain as pure consciousness is the secret in meaning of know thyself. Bhagavan Ramana put it all in a sutra of aphorism. He summarized the whole process into four pregnant words. Aham naham koham soham. Daiham, body, symbolizing all objective and subjective perceptions. Naham, I am not. Koham, who am I? So, hum, I am consciousness. Rid of all vestiges, vehicles, maps, abeyances, and camouflages, pure consciousness alone will shine if the inquiry, who am I, is relentlessly pursued within. The Chatmavichar releases one from the bondage. Release from bondage and drawing of wisdom are simultaneous, as the coming of light and ending of darkness are simultaneous. In this grand journey within, the Guru's grace is absolutely essential. For one who is ready to plunge within, the Guru's grace is totally assured. This grace is felt by one dedicating himself to the pursuit of self-inquiry to a deepening peace, welling up in him, independent of life's circumstances. Robert, thank you. These articles are written for the Ajani. They're very wordy, they're good but they're wordy. For instance when it says, consciousness takes up all form and becomes all forms. The question you should ask is why? Where do the forms come from, that consciousness becomes all forms? Well, the highest truth is, there are no forms, there's no body, there's no mind, there's no world, there's no universe, there's no God, there's no coming and going, there's no ignorance and there's no enlightenment. So why do we see it all? That's a mystery. It's an optical illusion. It does not exist. Go back to the dream state. When you dream it becomes externalized, and in your small mind a universe is created with people, places and things. Why? It doesn't really exist. When you wake up it does not exist. The same as this world, it appears real. We appear as bodies, there's a sun, there's a moon, there's an earth, there are trees, there are birds, there are ants yet they do not exist, no thing exists, only the self. And you are that. This is the highest truth. The reason I share with you the various methods of meditations, jhana meditations, is because those of you who are really involved in the world and your mind is always thinking, 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 if you practice the meditation, your mind will begin to slow up. Let me ask those of you who have been practicing, what has happened to you? Would you like to say, anybody? Nobody's been practicing? That's why I had a personal experience that I had. Robert, well you haven't been here before. We're speaking. That's why, what meditations exactly? The jhana meditations, yes. That's okay. S.E. While my depression went away and I have twice as much, three times as much energy as before. Robert, oh that's good. 
and life seems more real in a sense, rather than empty. Robert, that's a good sign there's hope for you yet. Laughs. S.H., can it be hopeless? Robert, yes. No hope. Laughs. S.D., how do you mean life seems more real? S.E., I feel my body more and feelings more and reality seems much more clear and bright. It's like my old days when I used to practice meditation a lot. The trees are beautiful and shining, and the sky is very blue. S.D., some things are heightened. Yes, and I don't read any more. Robert, anybody else? Remember on the path of Jhana Yoga, Jhana Yoga, and Jhana Marga, there's really no meditation involved, but there are some people that have to use it, and as I said before, to clear your mind out, it causes your thoughts to decrease. There are three types of meditations we use, we'll share one right now. So make yourself comfortable and close your eyes to remove obstructions. Forget about the world for a little bit. To relax you more, take 12 deep breaths from your diaphragm. Break in tape. Tape restarts after meditation. Peace, peace. If you practice this form of meditation, preferably in the morning or the evening, it will help. Any questions about that? Remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to pray to yourself, because God dwells in you as you. God bless and peace. And that's it. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 23 The Law of Cause and Effect 11th November 1990 Robert, any people here for the first time? Welcome. I hope what I say doesn't shock you because I say strange things. Laughs. I had an interesting vision this morning. In that vision, I saw myself in a beautiful emerald room, and into the room walked President Bush students laugh, and Saddam Hussein more laughter, and Shamir of Israel and a couple of other people I didn't recognize. Gorbachev was there too. And they all sat around a round table and they just stared at each other. So I went to the stereo and started to play some African music. At first they just smiled. Then they started to tap their fingers on the desk and pretty soon they were shaking to the rhythm. And then they got up and started dancing. And they all hugged each other and talked about peace. And they realized how foolish it was to hate each other like they do. They decided to take away all the boundary lines and make the world one united world. And then I opened my eyes. Whatever that means it was interesting. Somebody asked me to talk about the law of cause and effect. We never really talk about these things because it's on a relative scale. We talk about absolute reality. Ultimate oneness. But, yet, if we're aware that we're body conscious and mind conscious, we fall under the laws of karma or cause and effect. Therefore I'll shortly talk about these things because it helps. Cause and effect exist because of time and space. If there were no time and space, there would not be cause and effect. In reality there is no time and space and there's no cause and effect. But, in the relative world, there is. Cause and effect is another name for the law of retribution. For as you sow, so shall you reap, or the law of karma. And as long as you are under that law, you have to deal with the god of that law. That god is called Ishvara in Hindu, Jehovah in the Hebrew religion, Allah in Muhammad religion, and it goes by many other names. Those gods exist as long as you believe that you are the body-mind phenomena. And so does cause and effect. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. That's the law of physics. It's the same as the law of cause and effect. Everything you do ends up in a result, there's no escape from it. Unless you turn within, and you no longer react to anything. Then you transcend the law, and become free. But, 
as long as we are still body conscious, we are under that law. This is how it works. If you want to grow oranges and you do not know anything about seeds, you would grab a lemon seed, plant it in the ground and expect an orange mint lemon tree, tree to grow. The cause is the planting of the lemon seed. The effect the lemon tree. The seed is planted in the earth. The earth is your mind and the seeds are your thoughts. And the effect is the result you get from planting seeds. Though you plant a lemon seed and a lemon tree grows. But then you start crying and screaming about it. I wanted oranges. You say, I demand oranges. And you have a tantrum, you have a fit. Nobody cares. You planted the seeds and this is what you're getting as a result. Lemons. Of course you can always make lemonade, but you wanted oranges. So why did you plant a lemon seed? You don't know. Maybe you planted a lemon seed in a previous life. You set up the cause at that time. For the effect can back to you many lifetimes from now, as an orange tree is a lemon tree rather. And you'll still scream, why did I plant a lemon seed, I wanted oranges instead. Though it is when we see things we do not understand. For instance, when Mahatma Gandhi died, he got shot. Why would an honorable man like that get shot? The last word he said to his attacker was, I forgive you and thank you my son. For he realized that in some other life he had set the cause in motion. And this is the effect he gets back. This is called delayed karma. Now, there's instant karma. Like when you step on the edge of a rake. You step on a rake, what happens? It hits you in the head. That's called instant karma. Who takes care of this karma? The God of karma is Ish, Vera, Allah, Jehovah. It is he who hands out what karma you're going to experience in each life. Let's take another example. Henry invites me to his house. I come into Henry's house and I go to the refrigerator. I say what's to eat? I eat him out of house and home. Then I say Henry can I borrow your car? And Henry's a good guy and he says sure. So I borrow his car and I wreck his car. Break his headlights, his windshield and come back and park it like nothing happened. And Henry being the good guy that he is, doesn't say anything. Then I say Henry can you lend me five hundred dollars? Though Henry being a good guy says sure. And I never expect to pay him back, I just take his money. Now what happens? By not reacting Henry becomes neutral. When you're neutral, you do not accrue karma again. You're finished with that part of your life. When you react you accrue karma. What happens to me? I've got to experience the effect sometime somehow of what I've done to Henry. It's got to come back to me somehow. Maybe not even in this lifetime, but it will come back, there's no escape. This is why when we see certain things in life, and we do not understand, we should never judge because everything is working out like it's supposed to. All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. Another example. People go searching for a sack through a teacher. They go to everybody they can find. And what do they do? They try to learn everything they can. They suck the sack through dry. They try to take all his knowledge. But do they give him their hearts? Do they surrender to him? Do they take care of him? Do they do anything for him? Most Westerners do not. They just come to take but not to give of themselves or anything else. And when they've heard enough they go to somebody else and do the same things. So twenty years pass, then they wonder why they have not made any progress. Life is a reciprocal thing. Both parties have to give and then they merge into one. But, if one party gives and the other party takes they come under the law of cause and effect. And they get exactly what they put out. Here's another example. I decided tomorrow that I'm going to rob Security Pacific Bank. 
So tomorrow comes and I write out a note, and on the note it said, I've got 25 hand grenades, a bazooka, and a submachine gun in my pocket. Give me $500,000 immediately or I'll blow up the bank. So the teller of course is frightened. And she gives me $500,000. And I get away clean, nobody catches me. I go to Canada. Ten years pass. I go into business and I'm successful, but then something happens and the tax people come after me. It winds up a livy on all my dealings of my business, and I owe them $500,000. Which they get back from me. It makes me bankrupt and I'm back where I started. Do you see how everything works out? There are no mistakes. The law's exact. The only way to get away from that law is by not reacting to anything that comes to you. Because everything that happens to you is karmic in nature. If you react to it, you are setting yourself up for more karma and you are accruing more karma. If you realize that you are not the body-mind phenomena, you become totally free and absolved and emancipated. And there's no more coming or going for you. You become absolutely free. Basically, that's how it works. Any questions about that? SD, I have a question, maybe some tips on how not to react, since that it seems so difficult. Robert, it's simple whenever you're faced with a challenge or a problem you act but you don't react. What's the difference? When you act you're spontaneous. You do what has to be done, it's over. When you act you plan deliberately what you're going to do. The thoughts have to come to you when you react. And the thoughts of fear, anger, jealousy, rage, frustration, getting even, whatever and then you react. But when you act there's no thought. You just do it and it's finished and you go on with your life. That's basically the difference. SD, then what about emotions? I mean we react to emotions? Same thing. Your mind does not know the difference between a thought and an action. You do. Though when you're planning to kill somebody, your mind believes you've already acted and you've done it. Even if you never carry it through. And that accrues more karma for you. Thoughts are things. For instance, the mind does not know the difference between a cancer and a cold. But you believe a cancer is deadly and a cold you can get over fast. So if you catch a cold, your system will make you get over it fast. But, if you get cancer your system believes that's like death. So fear comes in, worry comes in and ultimately you die. But, you have set the cause in motion by your belief that's how it works. Though so thoughts and actions are the same. There's no difference. The idea is to free your mind from thoughts. Not to think further than your nose. Catch yourself every time you think. And ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? Who thinks these thoughts? To whom do they come? And you'll realize they come to me. I think these thoughts. Everything is connected to the I. All your thoughts are connected to I. Get rid of the I and all your problems go with it. Follow the I to its culmination. Concentrate on the source of the I. And you will find that I does not exist, and you'll become free. SD, did you say that you will find the I does not exist? I does not exist. SD, does not exist. Right. I leads to nothingness, to freedom, to liberation. As long as you have a sense of I, you have problems. Because you always say I am sick, I am poor, I am happy, I am unhappy, and so forth. And you're living in the world of duality. So when you follow I, all the concepts disappear with the I and there's nobody left to think. You ultimately become free. You should also ask yourself, for whom is karma? Who has to experience karma? Who has to experience cause and effect? You will soon realize that that is only for your ego, not for you. You are free and have nothing to do with it. When you transcend the ego, karma goes. And you become totally free. 
SD, who are you addressing as you? Yourself. Yourself. SD, and that's not the same as I. Theme thing, yes. Me, I, it's all the same. You ask yourself, to whom does the karma come? And then you say to me. Hold on to the me, like holding on to a rope, and going down to the end of the rope. When you come to the end of the rope, there's nothing. So when you come to the end of me, reality exists. And reality ensures of its own accord. So we're not to look for reality, we're not to seek reality, we're not to find reality, we're simply trying to let go of the other things. To the extent that you let go of the other things, to that extent will reality come of its own accord. And you will be free. Now, last week, I think it was Thursday I saw Nate was here. He made the statement that he had been meditating for 20 years and nothing is happening. He's seen 3 to 5 teachers or more. And still nothing is happening. I told him to hold on and keep going, he didn't like that. So when I went home I opened one of Ramana Maharshi's books and I just happened to come to that page that we're talking about. Mary would you like to read it? Mary, sure. Robert, start over here, go to here. Keep this, read this and go to here. Keep this part. Now listen to this very carefully. Mary, a visitor asked Bhagavan what one should do for the betterment of Atma. Bhagavan said, what do you mean by Atma and by betterment? Visitor, we don't know all that, that is why we come here. Bhagavan, the self or Atma, is always as it is. There's no such thing as attaining it. All that is necessary is to give up regarding the not-self as self, and the unreal is real. When we give up identifying ourselves with the body, the self alone remains. Visitor, but how is one to give up this identification? Will coming here and getting our doubts removed help in the process? Bagven, questions are always about things that you don't know and will be endless unless you find out who the questioner is. Though the things about which the questions are asked are unknown, there can be no doubt that a questioner exists to ask the questions. And if you ask who he is, all doubts will be set at rest. Visitor, all that I want to know is whether satsang is necessary, and whether my coming here will help me or not. Bagvan, first you must decide what is satsang. It means association with sat or reality. And one who knows or has realized sat, is also regarded as sat. Such association with sat or with one who knows sat is absolutely necessary for all. Tinkara has said, Bhagavan here quoted the Sanskrit verse, that in all the three worlds there is no boat like satsang to carry one safely across the ocean of births and deaths. This morning questions were put by a visitor by name, S. P. Tahil. Mr. Tahel, I have been making sadhana for nearly twenty years and I can see no progress. What should I do? Agvin said, I may be able to say something if I know what the sadhana is. Mr. Tahel, from about five o'clock every morning, I concentrate on the thought that the self alone is real and all else, unreal. Although I have been doing this for about twenty years, I cannot concentrate for more than two or three minutes without my thoughts wandering. Bagvan, there is no other way to succeed than to draw the mind back every time it turns outward and fix it in the self. There is no need for meditation or mantras or japa or dhyana or anything of the sort because these are our real nature. All that is needed is to give up thinking of objects other than the self. Meditation is not so much thinking of the self as giving up thinking of the not-self. When you give up thinking of outward objects and prevent your mind from getting or going outward and turn it inward and fix it in the self, the self alone will remain. Mr. Tahel, but what should I do to overcome the pull of these thoughts and desires? How should I regulate my life so as to attain control over my thoughts? Agvan, the more you get fixed in the self the more other thoughts will drop off of themselves. 
The mind is nothing but a bundle of thoughts and the eye thought is the root of all of them. When you see this eye is and whence it proceeds, all thoughts get merged in the self. Regulation of life, such as getting up at a fixed hour, bathing, doing mantra, japa, etc., observing rituals, all this is for people who do not feel drawn to self-inquiry or are not capable of it. But, for those who can practice this method, all rules and disciplines are unnecessary. Robert, thank you, Mary. This is why I always say, I do not give lectures, I do not make speeches, I would rather sit in silence than have to talk. For talking gets you nowhere. You know yourself, you listen to me tonight, by the time you go home you forget everything. And then you will look at one of the magazines and you will see a new teacher on the block and you'll say, let's go hear him. And this will go on forever. You've got to get down to the business at hand. You've got to make up your mind that you don't have, that you are tired of playing mind games, jumping from teaching to teaching, from book to book and living your same old life to reversing the whole procedure. You stop reading, you stop running from teacher to teacher, and you settle down doing the work of self-inquiry. Then you become free fast. Otherwise, you will go lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of searching, searching, searching and never getting anywhere. But, if you start practicing self-inquiry soon you will start arriving at certain feelings that the world, people, places and things, the universe, God is a concept of your own mind. You have created God in your own image. And he exists for you as long as you believe that you are the body-mind phenomena. So get to work and do something good for yourself. Any questions? Don't look so serious. Students laugh. SG, if this karma and stuff carries over to the next life who's it carry over to if there is no individual? Robert, as long as you believe you are the body, you pick up new bodies every time. You drop the old one and pick up a new one. SG, is that a completely different one or does it carry over from one to the other? It's a carry over. You don't look the same. But all the attitudes, samskaras, opinions, they all come back to you until you transcend them completely. So, you do not transcend these samskaras by trying to get rid of these each one at a time, you can never do it. For when you get rid of anger, fear pops up and so forth. Rather find out to whom these samskaras come. Who experiences these things? And find the source of the I. And it will all go and never come back, and you won't have any problems. SD, so are you saying, Robert, that from lifetime to lifetime, assuming that one learns something in any given lifetime, that there is a certain progress? Robert, definitely you carry it over. For instance, with most of you that come here. For some reason you don't make it in this life, what would happen to you most probably, is you will be born in a spiritual family of Johnnies. You will be that far ahead of the game. And you will carry on where you left off. But, if you're selling drugs out in the street, you will be born to a family of drug addicts and you will carry on from there. Everything is up to you. SD, so that sort of ties in with the idea that it's all evolving even though that's not exactly what we're seeing. As long as you believe that you're the body the soul evolves. But, in reality there's no soul and there's no body. As soon as you can grasp that you wake up and you become free. ST, is it possible to understand that completely if you're sitting where I'm sitting you know? Laughs, Robert, you don't have to understand with your human mind. Okay. Robert, you just have to be and open your heart and everything will happen by itself. Seth, what do you mean by open your heart right now? Robert, it means let love shine through compassion, love, goodness. Have no opinions, have no concepts. No preconceived ideas. Just be open in your heart with love and everything will come. That's what satsing is all about. Don't be like the fellow who heard a story like this and decided to become a Zen Buddhist monk. 
So he quit his job and went to Japan and had an audience with Oroshi, a head monk. And he said, I want to become a Zen Buddhist monk. And the Roshi said, Okay, and gave him all the rules and regulations. And he said, By the way, I forgot to tell you, we take a vow of silence here, we only speak only three words every ten years. So he said, Okay. Ten years passed, and he an audience with the Roshi, and the monk said, The food sucks. Laughter. And he went back to his quarters. Another ten years passed. He had an audience with the Roshi and he said, The bed's hard and went back to his quarters. Another ten years passed and he went to the Roshi and he said, Hey, I quit, and the Roshi said, I don't blame you, you've been bitching ever since you got here. Laughter. Don't be like that. Let's sing some more songs if you feel like chanting by all means do it. Tape break and continues after music and chanting is done. You now have an opportunity to ask any spiritual question you like about anything, and we'll see where we go. SL, about reincarnation I take it the soul is dependent on the ego. Robert, the soul is dependent on the ego and the mind as long as you believe you are the body. But when you give up the body belief, everything becomes redundant. It does not exist for you any longer. Though all these things exist, for as long as you identify with your body. SL, so as long as there's an ego there's reincarnation? Yes. There's a God and there's karma and everything else. SL, after liberation there's no more soul. There's no soul, there's no God, there's no world, there's no universe, there's no liberation, there's no duality, there's no non-duality. SL, what is the difference between the soul and the ego then? The soul is the part of you that carries on. The ego is the force behind the soul. The ego is the doer. That makes you believe that I am the doer. SL, so it's then, just the identification that exists after the death of the body that carries over to the next so-called life. Yes. SD, isn't the same ego carry forward also? I mean aren't the soul and the ego sort of interchangeable in that way? Robert, the ego's always the same. The ego, soul, concept and principle are always the same. They go from body to body and body to body they carry over. The thing to do is not to concentrate on that but to ask yourself, for whom is reincarnation? For whom is there a soul? Who's going through all this? I am. Well, who am I? What is the source of I? SR. Robert, we talk about these things as if they were solid entities or objects, you know ego, soul, etc. And somehow I get confused in that because I seem to remember Bagvin's teaching like there is no ego, see what's really there, and that's simply the teaching, and not that they are there to get rid of. Robert, exactly. And sometimes I feel a sense of confusion of, is there an object to be destroyed? Robert, there is no object to be destroyed. It never existed. Right. Robert, but as long as you are having difficulty with your life, they appear to exist. And if they appear to exist, we have to question why. Where do they come from? To whom do they come? And they will disappear. We work with what we've got. SR, so we're questioning appearances essentially. Yes. SR, what seems to be? We're questioning the world. Where did the world come from? Where did I come from? SG, it's like when you ask the question, who am I? There's a kind of a blank spot. A blank space before anything comes up, is that what you say consciousness is? Robert, space is consciousness correct. The space in between who am I is the real self. Abide in that. If you continue the practice after a while, the space will grow longer and longer and longer. 
you will say who am I and pause and you will sooner get lost in consciousness. Then you start thinking again and you go back to who am I and there will be another long space until who am I stops completely and you become yourself. Though as you continue the practice, the space in between becomes longer and longer. S.F. Robert Is the self clear space or a blank or the perceiver of the space or the blank? Robert, the space is not a blank. It is not a perceiver. It is nothing that you can qualify. Nothing that you can discuss. Nothing that is known. For space to be known, there has to be a knower. And as long as there's a knower, that's not it. Though you have to go beyond that. To silence. Consciousness is silence. Silence is consciousness. They're both the same. SR. Robert, in a sense the space is not an it, but I, and that is a problem in a sense, that we see it as it and not I. Robert, you exist. You exist where there is space, and you exist where there is I. So who exists as space? Who exists as I? Ask the question. Who exists? Confer. Follow the existence. Follow the I. And you will come to nothing. You will come to consciousness by itself. But do not believe that the void is it. Many people experience the void, and they think the void is it. But, don't you exist in the void? Tape break as Robert continues. Robert, there is nothing that can be explained. As long as you can explain it, it's not it. So what is left? Silence quietness. S.Y. Why does the music or song help to realize the consciousness or unexplainable? Robert. The music quiets the mind. It makes the mind quieter and quieter. It makes the mind one-pointed. So you can get rid of it and become still quiet. Yes, you, so we can use music to quiet in our mind. Robert, yes. If you come home after a hectic day's work, if you listen to chanting music like this, you'll become quieter and quieter. You'll become more and more relaxed and you'll be able to go deep within yourself. Deeper and deeper than you've ever gone before. That's how the music helps. Sam, that's not connected to the emotions of transcending, is it Robert? Robert, what's that? Emotional transcending from listening to music? Robert. Oh, it quiets the emotions. Oh, I see. Robert. It transcends emotions. It transcends anger and fear. It's good for you. It's good for the soul that doesn't exist. Laughter. All of you still look pretty serious, I don't know why. It's not that bad you know. This is fun. Laughs. Put the right finger in here and left finger in here and pull. Robert puts fingers in corners of mouth and pulls. Laughter. Smile. Do not take life serious. SF, I just had a feeling, I'm glad to be here. Robert, I'm glad you're here. The material life is a series of changes. The only thing permanent in life is change. So when you chase life or possessions for things for people, you will always become disappointed. Find yourself first and everything else will work out. Go ahead. SG, if there's no free will is there only predetermination that's all? Robert, everything is predetermined. The only free will we've got is not to react to conditions and to turn within. That the only free will we've got. Everything else is destiny karma. Even when I lift my hand like this, it's been predestined. SD by whom or by what? Robert, by the Lord of Karma by Ishvara. Which you said doesn't exist. Robert, of course not. But, as long as you don't know that because you believe that you're the body, then you've got to be careful. 
students laugh, otherwise I'm giving you license. You may really go and hold up a bank tomorrow, it doesn't matter because you think there's nothing. On the contrary. S.E., it's taking a thorn to remove a thorn. Robert, yes. S.D., so would a Johnny reincarnate. Robert, no. Because he'd be off the karmic wheel, right? Robert, exactly. Though so attaining or being a Johnny is the last time you'll be on the earth plane, right? Robert, a Johnny has nothing to do with the world or the universe. S.D., but I mean the body of the Johnny that appears to continue existing. Is the last physical existence. The body of a Johnny appears to the Ajani. That's how the Ajani sees the Johnny. But, in truth the Johnny has no body. There's no coming, there's no going for the Johnny. There's no birth, there's no death for the body. But, the Ajani sees the body. Asti, but for example, if you were born in a Johnny and you achieved enlightenment in a given lifetime, are you saying that the body would disappear or just from your perspective it would never have existed? Robert, to the Johnny it never exists. But those around you would still see a body? Robert, yes. Do you want to read something? Ed, you know I was all those years in the Zen monastery. Every morning we recited the Prashna Paramita for Daya Sutra, and for twelve or fourteen years I never understood, and I tried to stop to understand after a while. I would like you to comment on it after I read it. Robert, okay. It's very short. Ed reads, a buck Logitashwara was practicing deeply the Prashna Paramita, and he perceived clearly that all five stundas are empty and pass beyond all suffering and distress. Oshirya Putra form is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from form. Form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And so also with sensation, thinking, impulse and consciousness which are also like this. All these things have a definite character of emptiness. Neither born nor dying, neither defiled nor furori, neither increased nor lessened. So in emptiness there is either form or sensation, thinking, impulse nor consciousness. No eye, no nose, no ear, no tongue, no body, no mind, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object of mind. No element of I nor any of the other elements, including that of mind consciousness. No ignorance and no extinction of ignorance, nor any of the rest, including age and death and extinction of age and death. No suffering, no origination, no stopping, no path, no wisdom and no attainment. The Bodhisattva, since he is not gaining anything by the Prashna Parami, has his heart set free from all of the hindrances and with no hindrances of the heart there is no fear. Far from all perverted dream thoughts he has reached the ultimate nirvana, nirvana. By the Prashna Parami, to all the Buddhas of the three worlds have the utmost right and perfect enlightenment. Know then that the Prashna Paramita is the great spiritual mantra, the great radiant mantra, the supreme mantra. The purest mantra that removes all suffering, the true, the unfailing. The mantra of the Prashna Paramita is taught, and it is taught thus, Gate Gate, Para Gate, Parasam Gate, Bodhai Swa. Gone, gone, gone beyond, altogether beyond, awakening fulfilled. Robert, that's very good. If you're inclined toward Buddhism, you would follow the path that he just described. Depends where your feelings go. What your karma is, what you're inclined towards. We say exactly the same things with different words. Though I can go with everything, it's very true. We're all inclined differently. Some of us are inclined towards Buddhism, some of us are inclined toward jhana, some of us are inclined toward new cars. Everybody's different, but it's all good. Make it simple. Buddhism has a tendency to make things a little hard. 
because you've got to remember all kinds of things. The only thing that you have to know is that you exist. You exist while you sleep, you exist while you dream and you exist right now. Ask yourself, who exists? What is that which exists? Ask yourself. And when you find out, you'll be free. We try to make it very clear and very simple. The simpler the better. For pause. We always teach also the best time is to start in the morning. When you first wake up. You simply ask yourself, who woke up? I did. Who dreamt? I did. Who slept? I did. I was present in all three states of consciousness. Then who is this I? Follow the I. Grab hold of the I. Concentrate on the source of I and you will become free. And you will carry it through the day and your days will become happier and happier. Just by doing that. SL, what if you follow the I and it just stops, when you're just saying, who am I? Robert, that's good. And you just keep repeating who am I for a while. Robert, no, focus on the stop. Where it stopped. Put all of your attention into the place where it stopped. SL, and repeat who am I. You only repeat who am I when thoughts come. SL, so just try to have a blank in who am I. Your mind becomes blank but you still exist. So, you really go beyond the blank mind. SL, how like I don't quite understand. You simply ask yourself who is a blank mind. To whom does it come? That has to go. Everything has to go. As long as you believe I have a blank mind, you're still caught in the trap because I is still there. So it's not having a blank mind. It's going beyond the blank mind into total annihilation of the mind. Where there is total freedom and bliss. Don't be afraid of going back there so far. A lot of people are afraid because they think that they'll disappear. You don't disappear. You become blissful, happy under all conditions. SG, Robert, it seems when I do this with my eyes closed, the space gets more elongated. Is this done like a formal meditation practice? Robert, not really. When your space gets longer, it's a result of thinking. It is the mind that causes this. You have to go beyond that. Dive deeper. Dive deeper and deeper by asking yourself, to whom does this experience come? Who is feeling this? Who is going through this experience? No matter what experience you have asked the question. Until all experiences cease and there's a deep silence. And that deep silence is reality. It comes by itself. SD. I get the impression when Gail asked the question that she was talking about that deep silence were you? SL, that's when I had my blank mind. Robert, well the term blank mind is not too good. Blank mind is what? Robert, it's not too good of a term. SD, not a good term but the experience is what you were talking about Robert. Robert, you want to lose all sense of I and merge in consciousness and the silence quietness. But then I think Goram Premish was saying that, what comes after deep silence or is that it? Robert, that's it. But as long as you can explain it, it's not that. SL, do you just taste the pull of it? Robert, that's right. It's not just having a quiet mind. Can you tell me why? Because you believe you've got a quiet mind. SL, ah. Uh, you've got to go beyond the belief of mind. There's nothing. There's no one left to say that. There's no one left to make any statement of truth. Everything has been transcended. There is no light and there is no darkness. There's no happiness and there's no unhappiness as we know it. There's a total bliss consciousness which cannot be comprehended or explained. Remember the finite can never know the infinite. So you can't explain it. Seth, 
It's only afterwards that you can realize that there was nothing. Robert, afterwards there's no one left to realize. I mean when it's not permanent. Robert, when there's nobody left when it's not permanent, then I will realize everything. If it isn't permanent, thoughts will come and you'll just be like you were before. It's only temporary. But, if it's permanent there are no thoughts. There's no I. There's no explanation. There's nobody left. SD, so there's nobody to come back. There's nobody to go anywhere or to come back. There's nobody home. SX, so who's minding the store? Laughter, Robert, nobody. Dennis, nobody. Laughter. Robert, who's on first? Laughter. SD, no wonder I think the ego is afraid because it's facing the mask of existence. Robert, of course. That's the last thing it wants. Is that because we feel earthbound or we feel like if our ego didn't exist that, then we don't exist? Robert, it's part of the karmic pull to believe that you are existence as a body, as a mind, as an ego. And when it starts disappearing, it'll make you afraid. Whereas you just said, you think you're going into nothingness and you're afraid to do that. But, you have to push forward until everything is gone. Then you'll really be home and it's a different ball game. SD, so things that might come up would be fear of annihilation and things like that, right? Yes, and a lot of things from past lives will come up. You have to get rid of everything before you become realized. But, when you get rid of the I, all the dormant seeds of past experiences are attached to the I. When the I goes, everything else goes. That's why that's the fastest way. SH, what sort of a ball game is it then? Robert, it's beyond explanation. There's no one to say. There's no one left to explain. You become yourself. SL, so the senses, is that like everything that makes you a separate individual or a separate person is erased? Robert, yes. You become omnipresence. You become radiant bliss and you can say all this is the self and I am that. SK, and I was never anything else. Robert, yes. SD, I'm sorry what was his question? Robert, he didn't ask a question. He said I was never anything else. Let's sing some more songs. Laughter. Take break as Robert continues. Robert, he means he's not attached to things. There's nothing wrong with relationships or owning something. But, do not be attached in your mind to it. That's how you become free. By being non-attached mentally. SU, how do you do that? Simply by knowing the truth about yourself. SU, because before earlier you were saying to feel from the heart. You feel from your heart in the beginning and then that leads to a higher consciousness. Where you see everybody is yourself. All fear disappears. And when all fears disappears, you can be totally honest with people, you can own things, you can get married or not get married, you can live in a house or a tent, it doesn't make any difference and if someone takes something from you, it doesn't matter. As an example, in the story of Ramana Maharshi, when he lived in a Skanda ashram, up in the hill in Aranachala. One night about three in the morning, he was attacked by thieves. He had about six devotees with him. And the thieves screamed from the window, Give us everything you've got or we'll kill you. So the devotees wanted to fight the thieves. And he said, No, give them what they want. Carry it out for them. And he invited the thieves in the house to take whatever they liked. He explained to his devotees, It is their dharma to be thieves, it is our dharma not to resist, because we are sadhas. So give them what they want. The next day they were captured by the police and Ramana got all his things back. But, it's the attitude that counts. When you realize that you are the universe. 
then the whole universe becomes you and you own the whole universe. That you don't have any greed anymore like you have to possess something. Another story about Ramana, when he was walking around the hill, he inadvertently stepped in a hornet's nest. And instead of pulling his foot out and running away he started to speak to the hornets and he said, Sting me all you can, it's my fault I stepped on your nest. Go ahead sting me I deserve it and he kept his leg there about ten minutes. Of course when he took it out it was full of bites. The average person would have gone to the hospital. But he just walked back to the ashram and everything disappeared in a couple of days. So that's non attachment. SF, Robert, if a girl is facing rape she has to fight, she can't. Robert, I guess she does, she has to fight. But, I know something about this. When I had some meetings in Hawaii, I used to have a girl that told me she was raped seven times. And each time she allowed the rapist to do what he wants with her. And she didn't care and she was happy as a lark. That's her attitude so who knows. But if you don't resist, you'll get out of situations more quickly than if you do resist. There's something real about that. You know yourself, if you're a woman and somebody's trying to rape you, the thrill is in resisting for the guy when you resist his advances. But, if you come onto him and you say, okay, I love you what you're doing, I'd love you to do it. He'll become frightened and probably leave you and go away because he didn't expect that. If you cooperate a rapist doesn't like that. They like when you resist, because they've got power over you. That's something to think about. Non-resistance always works. But, as long as you believe that you are the body, you can never practice non-resistance. Your ego will always interfere and make you stick up for your rights. It's only in the period when you're practicing your sadhana, who am I self-inquiry that you become stronger and stronger, and you're able to practice non-resistance. Therefore do not try to acquire something positive, rather get rid of the I and everything will come by itself. In other words, do not try to acquire positive traits because it'll take you years and years. Find out to whom they come. Find out who has the problem, and find the source then everything will take care of itself. Consider this your spiritual family. Ask personal questions. Things that have been bothering you for a very long time. Don't be afraid, let it all hang out. SD, well assuming that our goal is to be realized within this lifetime, if you were facing imminent death or something and you were not realized, it would be to your advantage to resist so you can stick around and keep practicing, wouldn't it? Robert, it depends. It depends on your karma. It depends on many factors. But, if you're killed while you're practicing, there's no doubt you'll come back to a spiritual family and you'll be able to practice again when you're young. But, it depends on a lot of things. SD, but you know as so many people have spoken of to Maharshi in the past, they talk about trying for 20 years and not succeeding. It seems the necessity for this as Nisargadatta said, the only reason to be in the body is self-realization. So one wants on a certain level to hang on. Robert, to become self-realized. To achieve that right. Robert, yes exactly. But, if it doesn't happen don't worry about it. Your effort never goes in vain. Everything you do, every practice that you take, SD, so you'll be reborn in the next grade sort of, sort of, maybe even on a nicer planet. Laughter. SF, Robert, what about the recourse of sadhana? There are these periods when one that's doing sadhana may feel dry, a little bit dejective, a little bit disappointed like he's going nowhere. What would you have to say to him? There are periods like that in the course of sadhana. What would you have to say to that to give him support? Robert, then you observe. You become a witness to those feelings. And you watch those feelings. And then after you ask yourself, to whom do they come? Who has these feelings? 
To whom do they come? To me. I feel this. Who am I? Who is the I that feels dejected? And keep still, but hang on to the I. Hold on to the I with all your might. Like holding on to a rope, and then let go and when you let go there's silence. Then you will feel that those feelings disappear, and they don't come back anymore. But, you have to keep going back again and again until it happens. It's like studying to be a doctor. You have to go to class after class after class. Study, study, study. Sometimes you think you're going to fail so you try again, you study harder until you finally make it. This is the same thing. But no practice is in vain, everything is accounted for. And if you die in your attempt, you carry it with you, and you have another chance. You be ahead of the game. Do not worry about anything, be happy, be free. Love yourself, not your ego, but yourself. S.G. Robert You said there's no free will, but there's a choice to turn within or not. Isn't that a function of duality also? Why that exception? Robert it's the only freedom we've really got. Not to react to a condition, but to turn within. That's a choice. We don't have to do that and allow karma to carry us along, or we can do that and become free. The choice is ours. That's the only choice we've got. Everything else is predetermined. S.G. Isn't that just the illusion of choice that they have an understanding that the brain is not capable of creating a thought or initiating anything and cannot have an original thought? It's only a receiver and receives impulses from pure consciousness outside of itself. Robert, this is true. Always reacts to that, is that not so? Robert, that is so, but the brain has nothing to do with the mind. It's the mind that causes the brain to do that. Therefore we do not work on healing the brain. We work on annihilating the mind. When the mind is gone the brain will take care of itself and rest in the heart and do the right things. So don't concern yourself with the brain. Concern yourself with getting rid of the mind and everything will take care of itself. S.E. Who is to concern themselves with getting rid of the mind? Robert, the ego. That doesn't exist. S.G., so everything else is already determined. Is destiny determined in each moment, or is it predetermined that everything that ever will be is already known now? Robert, it's all predetermined. It's all predetermined, so everything that will pre-exist or has been already is so. Robert, and it's all an illusion, so ask yourself, to whom is this destiny? And you'll find out destiny never existed. SD, so on the highest level neither would predestiny, would that be right? Exactly. On the highest level there's no realization. There's nothing to realize. SG, the mind accepts the concept of what you're saying, but we're getting beyond that. Robert, then you have to ask yourself, to whom does the mind come? For whom is the mind? Who has to go through all these concepts? Who has to worry about these things? S.G. Robert, this ego wants to know. The ego wants to know. S.G. Yes. So, for whom is there an ego? S. Just for this illusory ego, this false identification. If there's destiny, then I have no choice whether there is awakening in this case or not. The choice you have is to turn within, and not be concerned about this. SD, so are you saying in a way that by turning within you can cancel out your predestiny? Robert, exactly. SH, who turns within, not the ego? Robert, the mind. That's the last thing the ego wants. Robert, you have to use the mind to get rid of the mind. S.G., mind is the ego, is it not? Robert, yes. S.D., so turning it on itself, that's what we're trying to do. 
Robert, turning it on itself exactly. As you turn it on itself, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker until it's completely annihilated. S.E., and the process appears to be free choice until the self ends, and then there was no choice, or no mind turned inward in the first place. Robert, exactly. On the relative level there's an apparent choice. Robert, yes. But in effect there's no choice whatsoever. Robert, because you're already free. S.D., are you predestined to awaken in a particular lifetime or are you predestined to become realized? Robert, at that level you're right, you are. But, that does not exist, so you're not. The as long as we're playing with concepts, we're going to get stuck longer and longer. Forget about predestination. Laughter. Focus on the eye and stop the game. SK, I have a question on that topic, being on a relative level. You see this friend, and they smashed up your car and now they want to do whatever the next thing is. Robert, sue you. Laughter the persons whose car that was smashed up, at some point wouldn't they develop some concern toward their friend and somehow say something to make them aware that although it may not be hurting them themselves, but karmically that they'd be hurting them to be doing these things and therefore not keep giving that person things to create bad karma with. Robert, perhaps that person is not ready to listen yet. SK well either way, shouldn't that person make some kind of choice out of this compassion and concern for their friend to do something, say something? Robert, say that again. Well someone ate all my food and then they borrowed my car and smashed it up. And now they want to borrow a thousand dollars. Anyhow all these things looking at me at a point. I would be concerned about this person and maybe compassion will be expressed and I will tell that person that frankly these things you know, I'm not incurring bad karma by you doing these things in fact it could be the opposite, but you yourself. Robert, oh I see what you mean. Could very well be incurring bad karma and say something so that they could take a look at that and make some kind of choice. Robert. This depends on what state of consciousness they're in. SK, either party? Yeah. You can either do nothing and just watch what happens, of course if you're not attached and you're realized, what do you really own? Nothing. SK, yeah but you're seeing someone on a relative level who is involved, if you just see it that way. You're not seeing that way. The realized person does not see that. SK. All right, an unrealized person would see that. So now you've got to work with it. SK. Yeah. So you have to do what you have to do. SK. Yeah, boy, if I become realized, I want to remember the view of an unrealized being. And that seems like that's hopeful of someone else. But you don't really, because you're seeing the unrealized being as realized. SK, so it's all a dream anyway. See, when you're realized you're seeing the whole universe as yourself. You can't see anything else. There's no longer duality for you. So how can you see the things you're talking about? That's for the Ajani. SK, so that's a good sign to tell where one is at. Yes. If it bothers you. SV. Could you not say that you won't think of it one way or another, you'll just act spontaneously. You won't think whether you should help or you won't help. You'll just do the right thing. SK, as a human. As a human. Robert, it depends what state of consciousness you're in. As a Johnny you'll do nothing. SV, but nothing could be anything. It could but you'll probably do nothing at all. You'll just watch because it doesn't matter. SK, in that case it seems I'd rather have a Johnny as a friend than a Johnny. Students laugh. SH, well spoken. Laughter. SE, there's a very famous Zen koan called Dropping Ashes on the Buddha. 
which addresses this point exactly. A man supposedly attains emptiness and there's nothing matters to him and so he comes in and he flicks cigarette ashes on the Buddha and the question is, how do you teach him that there are time and places for everything and this is the wrong time and place? And the other part of the story, and this man is very big and he listens to no one. So how do you teach him? That's the koan, I never answered it. Robert, the answer to it is. There's no one to teach and no one dropped ashes. S.K., because the Buddha never existed? Laughter. I always thought that that related to, that if the Buddha is outside of yourself, never deal with anything there. S.E., so can you expand on that again please? Robert, see who sees the ashes. Who sees the situation? The non-realized beings. So they've got the problem. But, in reality, the Buddha was never disturbed and no ashes were dropped and there's no reaction. Or you can ask the question, for whom is there a reaction? For the non-realized person. They've got to deal with it. Let's make it more personal. If you want to come over and stab me fifty times and cut off my fingers and my feet. Enjoy yourself, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Because it's the body that you're doing that you think is real that you're hurting. But, I have no body. So what's the difference? Why should I protect something that doesn't exist? That's the answer. Sage, why do you feed it? Robert, I feed it because that's the action my body takes. It's karmic what's left of the karma. S.H. Yeah, but no one feeds it. You see it like that. That's your point of view that I feed it and everything else. S.H. No, no one feeds it, it just feeds. It feeds. Laughter. S.H. No one feeds your body. No, exactly, exactly. You've got it. S.H. Boy, he came that out of my mind. Laughter is at this point, the tape ends. Transcript 24 3. Essential Questions 15th November, 19, 190 Robert, last Thursday, no what's today, Thursday? Last Sunday Someone asked the question about holding on to the eye. And I said imagine the eye is like a rope and you're holding on to the I and you're going down the rope, to the source of the rope. You're finding the source of the I. And when you get to the end you let go. And someone mentioned, oh I experienced that. I entered the void and I feel wonderful, is that right? And I said, no that's wrong. I didn't elaborate, and a few people called me and asked me, why did I say that's wrong? Don't we want to attain the void, or emptiness, or nirvana? or absolute reality. We really don't want to attain anything. We just want to let go of the other things that tell us that there's something to attain. And as long as you say, I have experienced the void. That's laughable because when you experience the void, the I has merged and there's nothing to experience. Do you follow? S.H. Yeah. Robert. As long as you say, I experience this or I am experiencing bliss or I feel so happy, then you're not. Because I is left. Lass. S. H. Yeah. Robert, I has to go. Who can experience bliss? There is nobody left to experience bliss. There's no one left to experience anything. It becomes ineffable beyond explanation. And then they asked me another question. So they said, well what happens then? And I said you become more human. Now what do I mean by that? I mean your quality about you, your radiant quality, your radiance expands. You become omnipresent. You become the universe. You realize the universe is an emanation of yourself, is a projection of yourself. That's what I mean by becoming more human. You become lovable, joyous, compassionate. 
you develop all the Advaita qualities by themselves. Though your humanhood becomes selfless, you no longer think about I and me and mine. As a matter of fact you hardly think. You just become and of course there's nothing to become. You just remain yourself. The self that you truly are. You are that self and there's nothing else. Now people always want tools to work with and we always go back to the relative plane because of that. When I give you tools to work with we have to go down to the relative plane because reality has no tools. Reality has no process. In reality you do not have to meditate. You do not have to pray. You do not have to do mantras. Reality is reality. Can you imagine God praying? To whom shall he pray? Himself? Can you imagine what you call God meditating? To whom shall he meditate? Therefore when you do all these rituals, it's your so-called humanhood, which really doesn't exist, that is doing the rituals. And you're doing the ritual to discover that you don't exist. Now I have given the class three Maya mantras, four principles and three vehicles. If you're practicing that, that's all you need because that's enough to take a view for twenty lifetimes. I want to share something else with you tonight. But, first, do you remember the four principles? Who remembers them? I'm looking at you people, you're all new people. Laughter. Except for Sam and Horat. Sam, I'm not here. Laughter SF. The first one is everything is a projection of the mind. The second is SK. There's no existence of the I, no prevailing, not born. SF. Oh, I was never born, I don't exist, and I'll never die. I mean, that's the principle that says that. Laughter. Robert, if you don't exist, then what are you doing here? Laughter. SF. The third one is there is no self in anything or anybody. Robert, there's no ego, no cause. SF, and the fourth one is. Let's stick to the third one a little more. Laughs. It means that nothing has a cause. No thing has a cause in this world. No thing ever came into existence. No thing appears the way it appears, it's an optical illusion. No thing has an ego, there's no ego. There's no basis for existence. What's the fourth one? SF, the fourth one, in order to know the noble truth you'll have to discard the untruth. Robert, yes. Instead of looking for self-realization, deny that what isn't self-realization. In other words, you look at the body and you say, not this. You look at the Iraq war, you say, not this. You look at President Bush and you say, not this. And you go on like that. You look at your own body, your own experiences, not this. And when you've denied everything, whatever is left is yourself. Though we go in reverse. We're not trying to become self-realized, we're trying to remove the clouds that tell us we're not, and then we'll shine through again. That's good. Now about the three vehicles that you cross the ocean of Samsara. J. S. K. The first one is a log. Robert, the what? A log. Robert, a log. What do you mean log? Laughter. What's the first one? To be alone. The desire to be alone for practice. Robert, where did the log come from? Laughter. A log is lonely. Robert, oh I see. I just said that, I wanted a Sanskrit term that you never gave me for it. Robert, what do you want a Sanskrit term for? Well, at first I wanted to understand it better and I thought that was the best way but really. Robert, you speak English. Laughter. S. H. More impressive when said. Laughter. SG has a better ring to it. Laughter. SK. No, it's much more than that. How do you describe Sad Husanga or Satsang? 
Robert, how do you describe it? By silence. Yeah, but how do you describe it to those who want to have something to grasp onto? Robert, in simple English language. Though satsing? Robert, sure. What is satsing? Robert, being in sat, being in reality. I guess we're able to explain differently. Robert, no actually if we don't have to talk Sanskrit we shouldn't. We should speak languages that we know. Like Russian. Laughter. Okay so the first vehicle is an intense desire to be alone most of the time. Not because you want to be lonely but because you can connect. When you're by yourself you can work on yourself more. You should be happy when you're alone. You can see into yourself. You have more of an opportunity to connect with the infinite when you're by yourself rather than when you're with people. Therefore a person on a spiritual path like this especially hungers for time when they can be alone and really dive deep within themselves. And what's the second one? SK, well you know the first one I just thought of something. For the person who's alone a lot. Who does practice and is alone a lot? Another way maybe to look at it is that on a relative level you're alone in the world. I'm talking relative, when you're with people you're alone on a relative level. So you're not going to be picking up or be concerned with their attitudes towards you etc or affected by this and that and of course on an absolute level we're not different. That is we're all one, but on a relative level aloneness is also with people on a relative level. Robert, well that's okay, but actually when it comes to practice most people are disturbed by other people and when they are by themselves they can get more out of it. SK, so that first vehicle is a conditional thing? Not really, but it's true of most people. SK, so the second vehicle would be satsang? Yes. The second vehicle is an intense desire to be at satsang, to come to meetings like this. A deep feeling to want this rather than to go to the movies or bowling or go drive your car off a cliff or whatever else you want to do. You have a strong desire to come to a class like this. That shows that something is opening in your heart. Or actually think think what is it you like to do best. Watch TV, read comic books, go to movies, spend time with your friends, your worthless friends. Laughter. What do you really like to do? Be honest with yourself. If you'd rather come to satsing like this then your heart is opening up and that's great. But don't force yourself and don't fool yourself. Rather when you're alone work on yourself and the feelings will come by themselves. And what's the third one? SF, a company of your peers or satsing. Robert, to want to be in the company of a sage or your co-spiritual people. In other words, if you have friends, you want them to be on some kind of spiritual path also. So they can help you and you can help them. There's no sense in associating with a person that takes you to porno movies. Laughter. Unless that helps you get enlightened, I don't know. Laughter. Usually you want to be with people that are like yourself. Laughter. Someone's actually told me that. Someone really told me one time, they go and see porno movies because they get enlightened again. The heart opens up. Laughter. SK, I like to talk about those things. Laughter. Robert, so what's the fourth? SK, the fourth one should probably be an amendment to the third is, what if you are too strongly attached? Robert, I got you, there's no fourth one. Laughter. SK, so then the question arises. Robert, what's that question? What if one gets too attached to a sadhu? To have sadhu sangha or particular sadhus or teacher one has. Robert, that's up to the teacher to take care of. SK, really? Sure. To make you become unattached. See how the dog is attached. 
he never comes to the owner. S.H. He goes to everyone else. Robert, do you feed him? Yes, sure. Feed him, pat him, take him for a walk. S.K. Do you love that dog as much as you love the other dogs? More. S.K. More. Wow. He's number one dog. Robert, so we're now going to share the three essential questions with you. And again, this is also something you can work with. Very important, I think. The first question you pose when you first open your eyes in the morning and when you first get out of bed as soon as you get up. The second question you pose at about noon time and the third question you pose before you go to sleep. If you work on these things, you're going to see fast results. First question you pose to yourself is, where did I come from? And remember when you do this, you do this as soon as you open your eyes in the morning. Before you can think of anything else and even if your mind starts thinking. Ask the question three times to yourself. Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Then you ask yourself, what do I mean by that? Where did I come from? Am I referring to my body? I just said, am I referring? Though I must mean, where did the I come from? Where did the I come from? Not my body, but the I that appears to be my body. Where did the I come from? Then you ponder and you wait. Then you repeat it again. Where did the I come from? I know I just slept, I dreamt, and now I'm awake and notice that I say, I all the time. I slept, I awake, I dreamt. Now, where did this I come from? Where did the I come from? I is the first pronoun and everything I say seems to be I. I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel sick, I feel well, it's always I. What does this mean? Well, I notice that everything is attached to I, in other words, I can't see anything unless I put I first. I want to become realized. I am not realized. I need a teacher, I don't need a teacher and so forth. You start to feel that the whole universe is attached to I, everything. So you say to yourself something like this, this means that if I find the source of I, all my problems, my faults, my karma, my samskaras, everything will disappear because they're all attached to I. Then you can say I, 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 like a mantra, I, I, and you're realizing all the time that you're going deeper and deeper in the I. Again, it's like holding on to a rope and you're going down the rope to the source, I, I, never mentally come to the end of the rope. The end should come by itself or the source. In other words, don't say I've come to the source, for as I explained before, you wouldn't be able to say I came to the source if you came to the source because the I will be gone. Everything is attached to the I and you simply go deeper and deeper and deeper saying to yourself, I, 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 I. Keep this up until you feel that you don't want to keep it up any longer. Then get dressed and go about your business and forget about it. But, do not come to any conclusion, that's the worst thing you can do. Conclusion comes by itself. You just do the practice. Any questions about that so far? Okay, now at about 12 noon. It doesn't have to be exactly 12 noon. Laughter. Don't synchronize your watch. But around that time, when you're sort of involved in the world, you can be working, you can be washing dishes or pots and pans. You can be watching a movie, you can be doing anything you like. But remember to do this. You ask yourself, where did the universe come from? Where did the universe come from? And you begin to ponder that. The planets, the galaxies, the stars, the earth, worms, animals, birds, grass, trees, where did it all come from? Who sees it? I see it. We're back to I again. When I sleep what happens to the universe? It seems to have disappeared and yet I still existed. But when I woke up, there was the world again. Though it seems that I am experiencing the world. 
I am experiencing the universe. We're back to I. What this means to me is the universe is a projection, a manifestation of my mind. For when I close my eyes it disappears. I must be projecting the universe. Therefore again, if I get rid of the I, the universe will go too. For the universe only exists because I exist. Do you follow that? Again you begin to ponder I. You say to yourself I I. I I. The reason you're saying that is due to the fact that when you keep repeating I I, you begin to condense the whole universe, including your body which begins to disappear, until only I is left. It's like when you're making a fire. You throw all the twigs in the fire, the leaves in the fire, wood in the fire, everything goes in the fire. But, you have a stick with which to stir the fire. But in the end the stick's got to go in the fire also. The stick represents the eye. Though everything is a projection of your mind attached to your eye. You say my mind. I has a mind. I is attached to the mind. If I get rid of the mind the eye goes with it and you will be no mind. Nothing with which to think and drive you crazy. Though again you begin to practice I I I I. For as long as you can, do not come to any conclusion. The conclusion will come of its own accord. Now you come to the evening just before you go to sleep. Again you do not have to sit in meditation postures for this. You can lie down, you can sit anywhere, you can walk, you can stand, you can do whatever you like. You ask yourself the question, where did God come from? We're all hung up on God, and some of us here, think it's blasphemous to talk about God this way. Yet you have to inquire, where did God come from? Then you begin to realize, when I was little I was indoctrinated in God in a religion, Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, Islam, whatever, but have I ever had an experience of God myself? How do I know that it's true, where did this God come from? Though God must be a preconceived idea. God must be a concept of mind. You say to yourself, even now while I discuss this with myself I have a fear that comes inside because of blasphemy. I've been told that God is real and therefore it becomes blasphemous when I speak of God this way. But, I want to know, where did God come from? Then you begin to ponder again. God comes from my mind. God is an idea, a concept of which I don't understand. And then you say, I believe in God, I'm thinking of God. It is my concept. Though again, you get back to that again, to I, and you realize that God is also attached to I. Can you imagine that? God is attached to I. Think about this. If you weren't aware of your sense of I, you wouldn't believe in anything. For you have to say, I believe in God. I believe in Allah. I believe in Jehovah. I, it's always I, I, I. If there's no I, who's there to believe? So we get back to I again. And you have to again follow the I thread to its culmination. The idea now is to realize and know that God is attached to I. You don't try to get rid of God, you transcend the I and God goes with it. Though you say, I, 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 the same thing, I, I. And God will begin to disappear, because I will disappear. And when all these things disappear, what will be left? Absolute reality. Pure intelligence. Boval awareness. Ultimate oneness and you will be free. So those are your three essential questions. If you practice these things you will see fast results. Any questions? SK, regarding number 2. Let's say Ramana was sleeping and someone put his foot in a horn, its nest, do you think he would wake up physically? Robert, no. If you're speaking of Ramana, he had these experiences when he was a boy. When he went to sleep he couldn't wake up and his friends used to pick him up and take him out of his bed and put him on the hill and beat him up. 
he didn't feel a thing and when he woke up they would laugh. So he had a problem of waking up. Students laugh. Asaf, is it a problem to wake up for the Johnny? Robert, well it's not a problem, what it is, is there's no difference between waking and sleeping and death and birth. It's all the same. A Johnny is awake during sleep. The material world is asleep, so the Johnny both functions in the world as a dream, but he's always awake at the same time. So he wouldn't have any problem with that. As K, what determines whether a Johnny would be according to someone else's viewpoint would be awake or sleeping. Is it just the karma that would? Robert, well from somebody else's viewpoint is according to their own karma. You see, the average person sees what your karma lets you see. That's how you come to conclusions. You say this is right and this is wrong. This is good and this is bad. This is such and this is such. It all has to do with karma. When there's no karma there's only one judger, and that's the self omnipresence. Everything becomes the self. Everything becomes the jhani. The jhani is omnipresence himself. Teach, what do you mean by omnipresent? Robert, I mean everywhere present at the same time. S.H. Under all circumstances, universally. Under all circumstances, universally, the jhani is consciousness itself. And consciousness is everywhere. It's undivided, it's self-contained. So the jhani is aware that he is consciousness self-contained. And everything is the self and I am that. I am is another name for consciousness. SH, then all forms of these entities have dissolved. It's all consciousness. SH, there are no separate forms then. There are no separate forms, but then, again it's like the Johnny is a mirror. And the images on the mirror of all the people in the world are images. Only the Johnny is aware he's the mirror and everything that shines through him are images though he's in the images and also in the mirror. But, if you try to grab the images, you grab the mirror because there are no images, the images don't really exist. The Johnny is therefore aware of this all of the time, whether asleep or awake or whatever. SH, they're just phantom appearances. Phantom appearances? In a way, they're just images, they come out of the Johnny himself or out of consciousness. SR. They're like nothingness, they're not located anywhere. Robert, nothing is located anywhere, that's true. Nothing exists, even the images do not exist. Only pure consciousness exists. SR. Can you say a Johnny that they're really like talking about pure consciousness in a way on any point but that would be ineffable? Exactly. But, for the sake of explanation we talk about images. As an example, all of you are looking at me. And if I ask each one, what do you see? I get 12 different answers or whatever. Because you're telling me about yourself. Laughs. You can only see yourself wherever you look. That's all you see. SH, and there's no reference to time and space at all. Robert. Time and space does not exist. They appear to exist. There's only one, it's all condensed. But, in the dream there appears to be multiples. The one appears to have split into many. But, that's the dream so I talk about it. Seth, even if I don't know about it. Whatever I see is only seeing myself. Robert, yes. Seeing yourself. Yes. SR, you'd have to have a preconceived idea that the scene is different than what you're saying, to see it any other way though. Robert, that's from Prarabdha Karma, you've accumulated all these samskaras. So the Ajani sees all that on the marks of the world. SR, that gives you the sense that the seer is different from what's seen. Robert, yes because you're carrying all that around with you. Robert, exactly.
that the second principle you were talking about that night, that you really are the world as it manifests. Robert, you mean the third principle. The first or the second, I can't really remember what principle you have stressed today because you've taken on the stressful world that appears before you. Robert, I have taken on the world. Therefore don't try to change the world, change the I. Transcend the I and the world will go, because the world is attached to the I. SF, so the seer is different from the seen at just one level. But, at another level there is no seeing, so it's not different than the seer. Robert, and there's no seer. There's only consciousness. Zell, that would apply to the eye trying to watch the eye, or if I find I'm watching the eye, it doesn't become impersonal and there's still an eye doing the watching, and it hasn't come together. Robert, you have to ask yourself who is watching. SG, the Hall of Mirrors. Yes. SG, it's when the object and the eye is gone. SF. You explained one day, Robert, that there are actually not two eyes, it's just one eye, which is the real eye. Robert, yes. The supreme principle, which doesn't identify with the body, sort of believes. Robert, the eye, is attached to your belief system. Seth, right, but the eye is only one, there is not two eyes. There's only one, but in the last analysis that has to go two. SF, right because still conceptual. Laughter. Yes. SK, in the lowest analysis there are two eyes. Robert, yes. See there was one dog, he was I, and then he turned into multiples. And as soon as someone gets a gun there will be no dogs. Robert, who would like to get me a glass of water? SH, I would. Robert, so how does all this grab you, Sam? Sam, could one say that the quickest way to this be silence after a period of time? Robert, oh yes. If one could just sit in silence. Robert, that's the best way. Because the concepts go, the ideas go. Robert, but can you sit in silence? That's the question. Yeah, but what I'm saying if somebody did. Robert, that's it, everything turns into silence. Everything just is, not even silence exists. Robert receives water, student continues. Sam, could one say theoretically, that even if one's mind wanders a lot and one has many thoughts, I think it is difficult for them to sit in silence. Even if they do that, even if they still sit in silence after a time will that not take care of itself? Robert, everything helps. Only it may take a thousand years. Laughter. But when you're saying I I you're coming towards silence, that's the whole idea. You say I I. Where did I come from? I I, I I and you will notice the space between I I becomes bigger and bigger and greater and greater, until automatically you stop saying I I. And then you're in the real silence, what you're talking about. But, that's how you get there. But it's a little naive to think that the average person can just sit down and be silent, they can't, because their thoughts are so powerful, it won't let them sit still. That's why I give you the practices. So you'll have a tool to work with and you can do something. SK, isn't there also trouble that people think they're in a thoughtless state when they're really not and they need something to go beyond that state? To get to the real silence. Robert, of course that's right. SY, what about just continuing this no matter what you're doing all day long, trying to do this rather than separate times of the day? Robert, if you can manage it's great. But, in the beginning you shouldn't be a fanatic. You should sort of balance everything. It will bring you to the same goal. Because from experience working with people I found, if you take the average person out of the world and you start doing this all of a sudden, 24 hours a day, they can go crazy. Laughter. 
Sage, have you had them go crazy? Robert, and that's good sometimes. SK, or they just give it up and go back into the world, Robert, yes. And not try spiritual life again. Robert, you have to balance everything. SY, I've been trying to do it for years and years and years but I find that I haven't been able to. It's just whenever I can think of it. I keep thinking that I should be able to do it 24 hours a day for I know it would work. Robert, well don't think of that at all. Just be gentle with yourself. Love yourself a little more and focus on yourself when you can. But be gentle and make it simple. Do not have the feeling, I have to do this. It'll all happen by itself. Everything will happen by itself if you allow it to. S.Y. Part of my mind knows that, the other part can't stop. Then you have to ask yourself the question, who feels like this? To whom do these feelings come? And follow it down. You can go right back to I. You're working with the I. Follow the I thread to the heart and you'll become free gently slowly. Do you know what kind of chair I need Henry? I need a softer chair that I can sink into with the arms further apart. Laughter, SH, how about cushions? General talk and laughter. Robert, if you practice these principles, all the things I gave you shared with you, you will actually see fast results. It works. But, you've got to do it, you've got to make it happen. I cannot do it for you. I can lead you to the gold mine but you've got to dig yourself. SH, well they're all three essentially the same following the I to its source. Robert, they're essentially the same, yes God, the universe. SF what? Anyone else? SK, the self God, yeah. SF, the body God and the... Robert, they're all the same. The whole trick is to realize that the whole universe, God and everything else is attached to your eye. And when you allow the eye to go into the heart, the eye will disappear and pure reality will shine forth. S. H. The heart is the source of the light. Robert, the heart is the source. Where is it located? Where the eye disappears. Robert, on the right side of the chest. We're not speaking of the physical heart. We're speaking of the spiritual heart. And we're not speaking of chakras. We're speaking of the heart on the right side of the chest, which is only a point of reference. SG, when I meditate, I try to find, locate the heart on the right side. I'm always looking for the heart on the right side. Is that correct? Robert, Yes, you don't try to find it, you just become it. You are the heart, that's you. The heart is the self. It's only called the heart for a point of reference. Due to the fact that as a point of reference, spirituality awakens quicker when you focus your attention that way. SG, so you should focus your attention on it. Robert, yes. Yes. Robert. Yes, on the right side. SH, are you sure it's on the right side? It seems to me to be in the center. Laughter. Robert, well if you like the center Henry, enjoy it. But who all spiritual teachings, the spiritual heart, is only on the right side. SG, whether you're right-handed or left-handed. Robert, that's right, that is a good point as a matter of fact. When you say something like this, who me? Where do you point? On the right side. S, even if you're left. Even if you're left, you point to the right side of your chest. Whenever you talk about yourself, you always point to the right side of your chest. You're pointing to your spiritual heart, to yourself, that's your real self. SG, I want to talk about sapphic food on the spiritual path. Robert, well sapphic food automatically comes to you when you're thinking of the eye. When you're practicing jhana marga, automatically you will know what to eat. But, 
Sattvic food is always the best food which consists of fruits and vegetables and grains and a little milk, that's always the best. But, this is why on this path we do not discuss too much yoga. How to sleep, what to eat. Nothing is really necessary. Except getting rid of the I. On the path of getting rid of the I, everything else will come automatically. You will be drawn to the right foods, to the right people, to the right employment, to right action. Everything will take care of itself when you're focusing on I. Look how happy that dog is. Does the dog think of I? The dog has nothing to think about. The dog just exists, he doesn't know he's a dog, we do. SK, he's not thinking of I right now. Laughter, Robert, not quite, he just exists. You don't want anything? Addresses dog. Robert, but we get so caught up in our thinking, in our thoughts and in our emotions, we have no time to become free. The secret therefore is to slow the mind down. Keep the mind from thinking. In other words, when your mind starts to think, catch yourself. Every time your mind starts to think, catch yourself. And you can ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? Well, you can be the witness to your thoughts, or you can exchange thoughts for the mantra and say, who am I or what we discussed tonight. But by all means, do something to keep yourself from thinking. S. H. Does that include work thinking? The thinking that's necessary to accomplish a task. Robert, yes, due to the fact that your body will accomplish the task much better when you don't think. You will know what to do. Your mind will become one-pointed on the task and you will accomplish the task much better. We're not thinking about the task. But yet something inside of you will know exactly what to do. But when a person thinks about a task, he thinks something like this, what if it didn't work? What if I make a mistake? What if this happens or that happens? Whereas if you don't think something will take over and the task will become more beautiful for you. When you find yourself in the moment, centered in the moment. Where five minutes ago doesn't exist and five minutes from now does not exist. You become centered in the now, then you can do the task correctly. SF is the witness of thoughts another thought. Robert, yes, it's another thought you have to get rid of in the end. It's like the stick I was talking about. You make the fire and you throw everything in the fire to burn up. But, the stick is the witness and when everything else burns up you throw in the stick too. SK, the stick you use to stir up the fire. Robert, to stir up the fire, yes. Everything has to go. SH, the witness included. The witness included. Because after all, who is the witness? Where did the witness come from? SH, just consciousness functioning on its own. If it were consciousness, there would be no thoughts about a witness. SH, either the witness isn't a thought. Well, somebody's got to think about being a witness. S. H. Then that isn't witnessing. Then who knows that you're witnessing? S. H. No one. Then you can't be witnessing. S. H. There is no one to know. There's no more witnessing. S. H. There's just witnessing per se. The witnessing has to go. Because when there's just witnessing, when you come out of it, you say, I witnessed. SH, no I, just witnessing? Then that's good, then the witnessing is really the self. If you get to that point, you can call it by any name you like. You can call it witnessing, you can call it consciousness, you can call it absolute reality, it's all the same. As long as there's no I. SV. Student asks about the imagination technique for the art that they practice and whether the growing silence they feel now will have an effect on this. Robert, well look at it this way. Your body came to this earth to do a certain work and nothing can deviate from why it came here. So your body is going to do the work it came here to do. It has nothing to do with you. 
Therefore, if you're meant to be a good artist or a great actor, you're going to accomplish this. But, you will be silent about it. Silence is your real nature, your true nature. Yet, you will perform better than you ever performed before. Everything will be better for you, but you are not the doer. You just got to get rid of the notion, I am the doer. That has to go, it has nothing to do with you. You are not the doer, you are the self. But, yet your body is going to do whatever it came here to do. But, your body is not you. So don't worry about it, the right thing will happen. SF, it will manifest as more responsibility in creation? Robert, yes, if that's what it's supposed to be. In other words, whatever your body's supposed to do on this earth, it's going to accomplish without your help. SF, Robert, I have a problem with this thing about thoughts. Ultimately, thoughts are the manifestation of the self. I don't know if I'm wrong, but if that's the case, the thoughts are non-dual per se. Duality comes only when there is somebody who believes they're the thinker. Though thoughts per se, like in the case of the Johnny, he has thoughts but there is nobody to think about. I mean that's the way I see it. Robert, the self is self-contained and the self really does not manifest thoughts to begin with. Thoughts are an illusion and like you say, the Johnny does have thoughts. But, the thoughts of the Johnny can only go this far and they stop. But, they do not bring on any more karma, they do not disturb the Johnny at all. They have no value whatsoever to the Johnny. The thoughts come very lightly, very slowly, they come and they go, they come and they go. There is no permanent thought. But, the thoughts do not come from the self. The self is the self. They appear to come from the self. Just like the world appears, the body appears, the thoughts appear. Therefore when you follow the eye like we said in the beginning, and we realize the thoughts, and the body is attached to the eye, when the eye goes everything else goes. Thoughts go and everything goes. So don't try to really stop your thoughts, get rid of the eye that thinks the thoughts. See the difference? Whenever I tell you stop thinking, I mean catch the eye that thinks. Find the source of the eye that thinks and the thoughts will stop by themselves. SF, and the differences between those thoughts which have a claim in it, and those thoughts which do not. Robert, have a claim. SF, yeah, those claims that I'm doing something. You have to realize I am not the doer. And when those thoughts come, ask yourself, to whom do they come? And they'll disappear. Is that what you mean? SF, no, because you were talking about the thoughts of a Johnny that they had different thoughts, and I would take it that those thoughts don't have any claim of doing? Oh, I see what you mean right. That's right. SF and other thoughts have a claim of doing. Yes. SF, so there's a difference between those which have a claim and those which don't. A Johnny has no attachment to his thoughts whatsoever. They mean nothing, they're valueless. SV. The other question I have is, also prior to having any knowledge of this, I'm not thinking about myself, but imagine a person who would like to pick up a pencil and sketch his still life in the moment that he's getting into relationships between a few objects and still life and fully concentrates on that in that silence and putting them together. In a certain way I always felt that person is there for a small extended period of time in his life, and when he puts the pencil down, he falls back into regular consciousness. And the question was, is what you're talking about is sort of like doing the still life except that there's no pencil. And all the objects and everything you're relating to, is as if you're relating to still life say? Robert, that's a good way to see it yes that's a good analogy. There's only consciousness and whatever appears in consciousness is an image. As fee, it starts getting more and more like a still life. Like still life and when you realize who you are, you realize that you are the consciousness and not the still life. And the still life becomes an illusion. But, it's still there. 
but you're aware that it's not reality. You realize that everything is non-reality. But, it exists as an image in the self. Like the images in the mirror. They appear to exist. But, you can't do anything with them because if you try to grab them you grab the mirror not the image. Consciousness is the same way. When you try to grab anything, you find it's illusory. It doesn't exist. Only consciousness exists. So, you ask, what about everything in the room, it appears to be real. That's part of the dream, it's part of the illusion. When you have a dream, you dream that everything exists, the world exists, the universe exists, people exist and you're going through all kinds of periods, problems and delusions, but then you wake up and it's gone. So when you wake up you laugh, for you realize it has all been a dream and only the self exists and you are that. SF, but when you say that consciousness exists that's looking at it from a relative point of view. In itself consciousness doesn't have a feeling of I exist. Robert, of course you're right. But, to explain it you have to use some words. SF, yeah. There is no consciousness. There is no existence, there's no self. So let's keep still then. Jorge. SG, last week we were talking about karma and you said let the body do what it has to do. The body came here to do something so let it do what it has to do which is karma. But, you say karma is absolute. For instance, if you have a deep insight into yourself in the moment and you see it, something completely about yourself has changed. That changes your karma, that changes your illusion. Also, Robert, as long as the I exists, karma exists. The only time karma does not exist, and there's no longer any change, is when you get rid of the notion of I. SG, I understand, but also if you have deep insight, whatever you see is erased, you're gone that changes the direction which you're going. But somebody has to be there to see. Who sees? SG, nobody, how will that something see, nobody sees. There has to be an object and a subject. Somebody has to see. They both have to be, there's no such thing as a red snake. For as long as you see it there has to be a subject and an object, when they both merge then that's consciousness, SG, right. When there's no more seeing, there's just being. SG, that's what happens after seeing something to see the insight. There's only being. But, your body has nothing to do with that. The appearance of your body is going on doing what it's supposed to do. SG, it'll still rather change the direction in which you're going and becoming blissful. Robert, that's possible. SG, also what about grace? Grace itself. Grace itself can also change the course of this? Grace you already have. When you're aware of your grace things can never be karmic. Grace transcends karma. SG, people who are not aware of the grace they're experiencing, that changes the direction of their mind also. Your life is always changing anyway. But, you have nothing to do with it, it's due to karma. When you get rid of the notion of I, all change stops. You're no longer aware of change. When you believe I exist, then you're aware of change. So don't worry about change. If you see yourself, and you can remove your eye sense then, everything will take care of itself. SG, get rid of what? The eye sense. Get rid of the eye sense, the sense of I. And everything will take care of itself. It makes life easier. Because you don't have to make any changes yourself. SG, I understand. Students talks about other people but don't worry about people. Do what you have to do and everything will take care of itself. SG, I understand. We worry too much about people. SG, well I'm not worried about people, I'm just making a point. Many people try to understand themselves, but they're too confused. 
Robert, who knows that? So enjoying their life, it never happens to them. They have to go through whatever comes. And you were talking about the absoluteness of karma. Robert, whom but who's aware of those things? I am. Where do I come from? Get rid of the eye and all that stuff will stop. Work on the eye. S. G. I don't disagree with that, but I'm just talking about the absoluteness of karma disputing it. On the relative plane, the absoluteness of karma is true. Laughter, S.G., on the relative plane. But, let's say, someone meets a great saint, and the saint bestows a great blessing on you and your life is changed. That's because you've prepared yourself to meet the saint. S.G., I understand, but yet whatever happens, that's not karma. There's a very great saying that Ramakrishna would say, a touch of grace may change your course of life. That's true when it happens. But, you have prepared yourself for that. SK, some schools of thought believe that's in your karma to get that grace. Robert, what you're saying is true. But, you have prepared yourself for that in one life or another. And now that's your karma to get that grace. SK, and now that would bring about another point, that there is no real free grace. It earns somewhere. No grace is free, the rest is an illusion. Karma is an illusion. Grace is self-realization. So stay yourself in the eye and everything will take care of itself. So that's an important point. Why do we want to get mixed up into so many different teachings? Just follow your own eye and find its source and everything will come, all by itself. We've got to stop thinking so much. We think and we think and we think and we think. How does this work? How does this work? Why does this work? Come simple. Do not be too intellectual. The stupider you look the better. SR, a month ago I transpired to read Ramana, some poems about the same subject and the idea of the archer and the arrow, I'm trying to understand this. Robert, the archer and the arrow. But what happens is this, weren't you talking about karma? Well, I get a sense that every moment where the archer enters the goal, is that moment he's more sterile. Three short stanzas like, I am the arrow speeding along, unconcerned, certain. I am the archer by being true, certain. I am the target awaiting the return, certain. Robert, if it helps you, it's good. That's a good poem, if it helps you personally, it's good. SR, he talks about every moment is creation. Yes. That's a good analogy. As long as it helps you, that's good. But, don't complicate yourself. See, the body is going to do whatever it has to do. But, you are not your body so you have nothing to do with it. Therefore take no concern of anything and go back to the eye and ask yourself, who experiences it? To whom does it come? As an example, when I came back from India in 1985, I was going to retire in a log cabin in Maryville and spend the rest of my life by myself and grow my own food. But instead I started having a nerve problems. Now why did that happen? What have I got to do with it? I've got nothing to do with it. So the body is now in Los Angeles instead having meetings. I have no desire to do anything like that, it just happened, but I've got nothing to do with it. Myself is always radiantly happy. Bliss joyous absolute reality, and that's really me and anything else that you see is your problem. Laughter. SF, well I see my world. Silence. Robert, so here's a meditation that you can practice on yourself. See, these are all tools, use them if you have to. They work and will cause changes. Make yourself comfortable. Close your eyes to remove obstructions and take ten deep breaths from your diaphragm. Inhale through your nose, expand your abdominals. Exhale through your nose and mouth and contract your abdominals in slow motion, ten deep breaths, 
slowly and gently. This is to relax you. Now just breathe normally. Now you begin to practice Vipassana meditation for a little bit where you become aware of your breath, feel the sensations in your body. Just breathe normally. Become aware of your breath and the sensations in your body. Ignore your thoughts. Whatever thoughts come to you be the observer, the witness, ignore them. At this point, the tape ends abruptly. Transcript 25 3. Essential Questions Revisited 18th November 1990 Robert, good afternoon. The first thing I would like you to do is to ask yourself, why did I come here tonight? Think about that. What is your purpose? What do you want? Did you come to compare this speaker to some other speaker? Did you come to listen to some profound message? Did you come to hear the speaker because you heard something about him? All those reasons are wrong. When you look at me, what do you see? If I asked each one of you, I would get 40 different answers. I am like a mirror and when you look at me, you see yourself. Though if you see a dirty old bum, you're looking at yourself. Everybody sees something else. But you're seeing your personal ego consciousness is what you're really seeing. The time has to come when you look at everybody and everything and you have no reaction. It's neither good nor bad where you see consciousness everywhere. Where you see beings, places, things as images on a gigantic screen. Your true self is the screen. The images are superimposed on the screen. Therefore when you look at yourself you have no reaction, there's silence. In the silence is infinity. Infinity is space, bliss, parabrahman, absolute awareness, ultimate oneness. Whenever you think you stop the reality from flowing by your thoughts. Whenever your mind is quiescent, calm, still like a motionless lake, then you reflect your own divinity. And you become pure and happy and all your problems melt away. You become no thing. There's really nothing to become. What you really do is you get back to your original state. And again how does this happen? By not reacting to person, place or thing. Becoming the observer, the witness to the world. The witness to your own thoughts. Whenever thoughts come to you, you try to halt the thoughts by witnessing your mind in action, by observing your thoughts. As you do this the mind begins to slow up. Peace ultimately ensues. You become happy blissful for that is your true nature. But when you speak too many words it hinders the process. When you talk to me, I listen to the space in between the words. To you the words are real, to me the space is real. The space is consciousness. The words are just a mark on consciousness which has to be erased. No one ever became awakened by using words. You still know that I am God. Your real nature is I am. And the way you experience this I am is by recognizing what I am not. I am not my experiences. I am not my problems. I am not the world. I am not the universe. I am not myself as I appear to be. When everything is gotten out of the way and the true self will shine forth in all its glory and splendor. There's really nothing to do but be still. There are no courses to take. There's no school to go to. There's no profound knowledge to learn. There are no prayers you have to make. There are no obligations whatsoever. Simply quiet your mind. Do not allow your mind to control you at all. Do not think past your nose. When you see the thoughts starting, catch yourself. Ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? They come to me. Hold on to the me with all your might and follow the me to its source. Where did me come from? How did me get here? What is the source of me? As you get to the source of me, you will realize I am that. I am not my body or my mind or the experience. I am that I am. I have always been that I am, nothing more nothing less. 
Know yourself. Search for yourself. What's the use of going through life gathering things, worrying about things, learning new trades, when you're going to leave everything at about 90 years old and die? What has been your purpose then? The wise person considers this when they're quite young. Starts to search for reality. But, the search is not outside themselves. The search goes on within yourself. Am I the body? Am I the doer? Am I the mind? The realization goes on that the body, the mind and the doer do not listen to you to the eye. They do what they want, don't they? For instance, does your body ask I when it catches a cold? It does its own thing. Does it ask I when it becomes sleepy? Does it ask I for permission when it wants to go to the bathroom? The body is under its own laws of karma, but I has nothing to do with that. Find out what I is. When you speak of I, stop identifying yourself with the body with the mind. When you do your work, do not believe that you are the doer. Realize you are I. When you sleep I watches. When you dream I watches. When you awake I watches. I is always there. Who is this I? This elusive I that's always watching, that never sleeps, never dreams, that isn't even awake in this world, but who is the silent witness of all your thoughts. Where did this I come from? Find out. Find out by diving within yourself. Find out by going to the source. Find out by keeping still, by becoming the witness, by not participating in the world's activities too much. By living the quiet life. By wanting to be alone and contemplate the I. One day you will follow the I deep enough like holding on to a rope. Climbing down the rope. You will come to the end of the rope. Which is the source of I. Then you will let go and you will find yourself in the void and emptiness. The world has been transcended and you will become I am. Not I am this or I am that really just I am. I am as self-contained. I am as your real nature. I am as absolute awareness, absolute reality, nirvana, emptiness. You get glimpses of this once in a while when you're daydreaming and the world leaves you, the activities of the world leaves you. All of a sudden you feel good for no reason. Wouldn't you like to feel like this all the time? Then what are you doing with your life? You have to go over your beliefs, your needs, your wants, your fears, examine everything. Investigate, go deeper within yourself. No more time alone, forget about the world. I'm not speaking of giving up your employment, or leaving your family, or moving someplace in the desert. I'm speaking of continuing what you do, but give up your mental attachment to whatever you do. You can be a doctor and know the self by not being attached to your profession. Your body will continue doing what it does and will even do it better than you can ever do it if you identified with the doer. Stay where you are, give up nothing, just do not be attached to anything. Do not react to person, place or thing. Let come what may. Be all things the same. Have no preferences. Have love in your heart, peace in your soul. And the day will come when you give up your heart, and you give up your soul to Sat Chit Ananda. And you will be free. At that time, you will be omnipresent. You will be aware of yourself as the universe. You will no longer be aware of yourself as an entity. But, you will be aware of yourself as the universe. And your body will not exist any longer. People will see you as they did before. Only you will see it differently. You will see all existence as one. Duality will cease. There will only be oneness. Now what good is all this? Why should you strive for this? Is everybody happy? Let's be sincere. We think if we accumulate a lot of money we will be happy. If we marry the right person we'll be happy. If we get the right job, if we have the right car, if we move to the right state, we'll be abundantly happy. 
What a disappointment, in this world nothing is ever the same, you have to understand this first. We live in a world of duality, so it seems. Everything has two sides. If you want to experience wealth you have to experience poverty. If you want to experience health, you have to experience sickness. You cannot experience one without the other. You may say well Robert, I know people who are abundantly wealthy, and they've never been poor. You're speaking only of one life. You no doubt have many existences many lifetimes, and they're all carryovers. Though the first thing you do is stop judging others. You learn to leave others alone. You do not react to anything or anybody. You begin to work on yourself. And you begin to understand, I am not what appears to be. What appears to be may be a fact, but it is not the truth. I appear to be male or female. I have this job, I am married to this person. I make so much money a year. That's a fact but it is not the truth. The truth is that I am nobody. You have no body. Everything is no body. Everything is consciousness. Consciousness is like a chalkboard. It always stays the same. But, you draw different figures on the chalkboard. You may draw the moon on the chalkboard, the stars, the planets, people, bugs, animals, and you see pictures of what you drew. But, if you try to grab them, what do you grab? Chalkboard. Consciousness is like the chalkboard. People, places, and things are like the drawings on the chalkboard. They can be erased and new drawings put in their place. Yet the chalkboard always remains the same. The reason people suffer is because they identify with the images and not with the chalkboard. Or they identify with the world but not with consciousness. You therefore have to change your identification and start identifying with the invisible something that you can't hear, taste, touch or feel. That invisible something is your true nature. It is your real self. Now how do we get there? What do we do? Thursday, I gave you three essential questions that brings you to awakening. We'll go over them again. The first question you ask in the morning, the second question you ask in the afternoon, and the third question you ask before you go to sleep. This is really important if you want to awaken. It's a shortcut. You have to do the first question as soon as you open your eyes. Do not allow your mind to think. As soon as you open your eyes catch yourself immediately and ask yourself the first question which is, where did I come from? Where did I come from? As I speak this question most of you identify I with your body and you think I'm saying, where did I as a body come from? I'm not saying that at all. The question is, where did I come from? Not, where did my body come from? The question is, where did I come from? My body slept, my body dreamt, my body is now awake. But, I has been the witness to all three states of consciousness. For I know that I exist while sleeping. I exist while dreaming and I am awake. I exist now. Where did I come from? And you keep still. After you realize that I is the witness of the dreaming, sleeping and waking states, you keep still. Where did I come from? I am now awake, you say. I am going to go about my business. I am going to eat breakfast. I am going to go to work. Notice how I always say I, you ask yourself, there's always I, I, I. I eat breakfast but I've been making one mistake. I've been identifying the I with the body that eats breakfast. I is not the body. You tell yourself. I is not eating the breakfast. The body is eating the breakfast. After all did the body get permission from the eye to eat breakfast? Body does what it wants. The body is under the law of karma. But what about I? Where did I come from? Who witnesses these things? Who am I? What is the source of the eye? That's how you talk to yourself and you keep still. 
then a realization will come to you. The realization will be this. It seems everything I talk about, I always use the first pronoun I. This must mean that everything, everything is attached to I. The world, my body, my thoughts, my mind, the stars, the moon, the sun, people, places and things are all attached to I. Or don't I say I see my friend? I'm doing my work. I feel sick. I feel happy. I feel depressed. I feel miserable. I feel good. There's always I, 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 I. It appears that everything, everything is attached to I. Therefore if I try to get rid of everything first, it's like the old problem, what came first? The tree or the seed? I will get nowhere for when I get rid of one thing, another thing pops up to take its place. For instance, if I don't like my job and I complain and I change jobs. I will like my new job for a while, then I'll have the same old problem. Though I don't do that anymore. Instead I'm going to realize the source of the I. If I transcend the I, if I get to the source of the I, everything else will go with it. And there will be emptiness and I will be free. Do you follow that? Everything is attached to your I. Do not try to work on the things, those are effects. Work on the cause which is the I and the effects will disappear of their own accord. So you follow the I by diving deep within yourself. You're looking for the source of the I. You hold on to the I until you find its source. You do this in the morning when you wake up. So how do you do this? When you get to the source of the I, which is you go down the rope. You imagine the eye is a rope, and you're climbing down the rope, and you come to the end and you just let go and you fall freely. Then you start saying to yourself, I, 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 say that to yourself for a while, I, 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 I. As you do this you're becoming calmer and calmer. As you practice this, the space between the eyes will become greater and greater. The space is consciousness. The I will eventually disappear and your identity will merge into consciousness as I am. That's what you do in the morning until noon time. You can practice this in whatever work you do. You can keep saying I I, knowing the background of what we just discussed. Which is that everything is attached to I. Then at about 12 to 1 o'clock you go to question number 2. Question number 2 is, where did the universe come from? You're asking yourself, don't ask your friends. Don't ask your co-workers. They'll put you in those little white jackets and you'll wind up in the funny farm. Laughter. Ask yourself, where did the universe come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the universe come from? As you ask this question, new revelations will come to you from your morning question. You will begin to see, during my sleep last night, I was dreaming, and in my dream, I seem to have existed just like I do now. I went to work. I had a family. I took an airplane ride. I went on vacation. I got drafted in the war and I got killed, then I woke up. It was all a dream. But where did that dream come from? All that dream was going on in my mind. A dream came out of my mind. Therefore my waking state must also be a dream because I think of it. My mind is thinking of all of my affairs, my body, my work, my children, my house, my car. Just like in a dream. Though the universe comes out of my mind. I have created the universe. After all when I am in deep sleep, there is no universe for me. But, I still exist because when I wake up I can say, I slept. We go back to I again. This means that the whole universe everything. People, places, things, animals, flowers, trees, stars, suns, galaxies all come out of my mind. I have given birth to these things. Who am I? Where did I come from? And you go back again following I to the source. 
Then again you repeat the same thing I I I I for as long as you can. Before you got to sleep. Before you got to sleep, before you fall asleep, you ask yourself the third question which is, where did God come from? Ask yourself three times. Where did God come from? Where did this God come from? That I have believed in all of my life? And you start to think about your childhood. When I was young I was brought up in a religion, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Islam or Hindu. I was told to believe in God, but what do I know about God? Have I had an experience of God? Therefore God must be a belief, a concept, a preconceived idea. Where did this God come from? Now, if you've been highly religious in one of the major religions, this is going to be so hard for you to do for you'll think it's blasphemous, I therefore ask you to investigate. To intelligently look within yourself. Asking yourself, where did this God that I've believed in all my life come from? And if you investigate deep enough, you will soon see, I believe in God. I, I say, I, I've been referring to my body. So that means all of these years, my body has believed in God. And I has been the silent witness observing all of this. I has no belief. I is neutral. It's my body and my mind that believe in some anthropomorphic type of deity. Now I realize I is not the body, I is not the mind, and I is not God. Like the universe, like my body, it's all a concept, a belief. God must be attached to I, just like everything else. And when I am able to transcend I, I will transcend the mistaken belief of God and become free. So, again you go back to I, 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 I. You fall asleep doing this, and you will wake up doing this. If you practice this, my friends, you will be free before you know it. You'll be totally free and liberated. I get many phone calls. One of the things I'm frequently asked is how do you tell a real teacher from a phony teacher? I don't know why people are interested in things like that. The answer is always the same. If you go within yourself honestly, sincerely and you become devoted to yourself, you begin to love yourself, not the ego self, but yourself self, and you really want to awaken, you will be attracted to the right teacher, or the right book, or the right tree, or the right rock. But, if you have many faults and you're not sincere yourself, you will be attracted to that kind of a teacher that's as sincere as you are and you'll both look at each other. So I hung up the phone Thursday night. Whore at gave me, is whore at here? No. He gave me a book to read. It's by a woman named Lucy Marr. I knew her at Ramana Ashram. She's lived there for many years and I turned to a page and there was the answer I was talking about. She really explains it in a wonderful way. Therefore if Mary would like to read this, I would be most appreciative. Mary, pleasure to be doing this. Lass. Granted. Fine. Okay Robert. Robert, you should record this, it's real interesting. Mary, this is titled, Gurus, Siddhas and Sannyasis. It is the mind that creates questions and goes in search of answers. It takes some time until it realizes this fact and gives up, but meanwhile it interferes continuously in the natural expansion of the seeker's spiritual dimension. Until then, question after question emerges and Ramana Maharshi stood patiently day by day against the flood. A collection of his replies to stray questions is given in the last chapter, however the three themes mentioned in the heading above may ask for a treatment in some detail. There is a widespread hunting for the guru and a lot of so-called gurus make quite a good business out of the distorted ideas about the guru and his function that are prevalent everywhere. Who then is a guru? The Sattvas say that one must serve a guru for twelve years for getting to self-realization. What does a guru do? Does he hand it over to the disciple? 
Is it not the self always realized? What does the common belief mean then? The man is always the self and yet he does not know it. He confounds it with the non-self that is the body etc. Such confusion is due to ignorance. If ignorance be wiped out, the confusion will cease to exist and the true knowledge will be unfolded. By remaining in contact with realized sages, the man will gradually lose the ignorance until its removal is complete. The eternal self is thus revealed. The disciple surrenders himself to the master. That means there is no vestige of individuality retained by the disciple. If the surrender is complete all sense of individuality is lost and there is thus no cause for misery. The eternal being is only happiness that is revealed. Without understanding it aright, people think that the Guru teaches the disciple something like Tat, Vamasi and that the disciple realizes, I am Brahman. In their ignorance they conceive of Brahman as something more huge and powerful than anything else. With a limited eye the man is so stuck up and wild. What will be the case if the same eye grows up enormous? He will be enormously ignorant and foolish. This false I must perish. Its annihilation is the fruit of Guru Ishvara, the service to the Guru. Realization is eternal and it is not newly brought about by the Guru. He helps in the removal of ignorance that is all. The real Guru is one who has realized the Self. But how can we recognize him? He does not talk about himself. He behaves exactly as everybody else, and if he does not there is reason to be cautious. There is only one quality by which he is reading in his silence, as well as in his talk. If you are ready for him, he will meet you without any searching for him on your part, and only then can you be assured that he is the Guru for you. Meanwhile, you are not without guidance from without. The inner guidance sends signals as it were, ceaselessly. A certain sentence in a book, a smile on an infant, the beauty of a flower or a sunset. All of them can become the means for a sudden understanding, one of the minor enlightenments which adorn the path of the sincere seeker after truth. All of them could become his or her guru. The famous ancient saint said of himself that he had twenty-four gurus including inanimate objects. Even the first quest after the meaning of life is already prompted by the inner, the real guru. There is a beautiful experience of Moses preserved in the tradition of Islam. When he complained, O Lord, where shall I seek to find thee? He heard the answer, Thou wouldest not seek me if thou wouldest not already have found me. Who is it that is in search for the Guru? The longing is certainly prompted by the self as is indicated, also the answer to Moses' prayer. But, it is the personal eye that goes out hunting for an outer Guru. You will get exactly the kind of Guru that corresponds to the stage of your development. That usually means a rather low type because a Guru of a higher standard is of no use to a disciple of limited understanding. The receiver has to be tuned to the wavelength of the transmitter for receiving and diversity. Thus, even if there is a meeting with a realized soul, the Guru need not refuse the disciple, because the disciple will not even perceive the presence of greatness, since his inner senses are still clouded. He will be like a man who went in search for China Samani, a celestial gem that fulfills every desire who found it and threw it away when he saw a colorful pebble. Of the worst kind among the many gurus nowadays are those who are deliberately exploiting those hunting for a guru. Their method of catching the trustful ignorant is often a mystifying show of ceremony, incantations, dark hints and even threats of black magic powers with reference to traditions. Sri Ramana Maharshi said about these, the books say that there are so many kinds of initiations. They also say that the Guru makes some right for him with fire, water, japa, mantra, nesasa and calls such fantastic performances, diksha initiations. As if the disciple becomes ripe only after such practices have gone through by the Guru. 
The most potent form of work is silence, however vast and ecstatic the sastras may be, they fail in their effect. Guru is quiet and peace prevails in all. This silence is more vast and more emphatic than all the sastras put together. But, when the faith guru is clever enough he may even feign this attitude also. Another type of self-styled guru may not only deceive the would-be disciple, but also himself. He might have some intellectual knowledge of the truth and will be able to teach the same as far as this limited knowledge goes. The sincere seeker after truth will one fade or another by the silent grace of his inner guidance. Recognize the limitation of the would-be guru and leave him perhaps for another one. Or perhaps he has ripened enough in the meantime, so that he will now recognize the voice of the inner guru, of the self and accept it unreservedly. Or he might follow the way of daughter Rhea and learn to see the guru in all as everything which amounts to practically the same thing. Now there's a strange fact that Ramana Maharshi himself refused to be the guru of his devotees, or to be exact, he never initiated any of them in the traditional way. Some of them are known to have left him, though they loved and worshipped him, because they thought themselves unable to proceed spiritually without an outer guru. How is this strange attitude of his to be understood? Is it strange to shun the responsibility which the guru is expected to take over in respect to his devotee? According to tradition, a guru who accepts a disciple also takes over his karma bad as it may be. No, Sri Ramana Maharshi was only being consistent. He lived what he taught, the realization of the one without a second. When there is only one Brahman where is the place for guru and disciple? A guru presupposes a disciple, a disciple a guru, they are invariably two. Can there be two selves? The one guiding the other? True guidance is possible only when the self of the guru and that of the disciple is one and the same self. The real function of the guru, the higher and more efficient than his teaching, is his power of contact. Removing the ignorance of the disciple by direct transmission. This of course is possible only when the guru has himself realized the truth. This power is so real that Ramana Maharshi always gave the greatest importance to satsang. The contact of highly advanced souls. Because their purity, wisdom and compassion are contagious, like health and peace. This is the actual danger of surrender to a wrong guru. That his cunning, vanity and selfishness are just as contagious. Even the experience of everyday life shows the danger of people coming to him. Though he usually is taken as an evil example only. But, even in that case the bad influence goes deeper. He is immediately contagious like a disease may the inner guru protect. This mysterious land lost in the sea, granting the gift of the supreme truth to those who find the path into its hidden depths also still keeps many of the secrets of magic techniques and powers called Siddhas. The number of seekers after these secrets will probably outnumber those who search after truth. Though it is widely known that Ramana Maharshi did not appreciate such tendencies, usually connected with Yoga Sadhana. Now and again he was asked about submission of Siddhas within the frame of the search of the self. 1. He declared, the self is the most intimate and eternal being, whereas the Siddhas are born. The one requires effort to acquire, the other does not. The powers of thought by the mind which must be kept alert, whereas the self is realized when the mind is destroyed. The power is manifest only when there is the ego. The self is beyond the ego and is realized after the ego is eliminated. Where is the use of occult powers for the self-realized being? Self-realization may be accompanied by occult powers or it may not be. If a person has sought such a power before realization, he may get them after realization. There are others who have not sought such powers and have attempted only self-realization. They do not manifest. 
Among the visitors at this stage was Mr. Evan Went, the well-known Tibetologist. He too asked for an explanation on the value of occult powers. Ramana Maharshi replied, The occult powers are only in the mind. They are not natural in the self. That which is not natural but acquired cannot be permanent is not worth striving for. They denote extended powers. A man is possessed of limited powers and is miserable. He wants to expand his powers so that he may be happy. But, consider if it will be so, that with limited perception one is miserable, with extended perception the misery must increase proportionately. Occult powers will not bring happiness to anyone, but will make him all the more miserable. Moreover, what are these powers for? The would-be occultist desires to display the siddhas, so that others may appreciate them. He seeks the appreciation, and if it is not forthcoming he will not be happy. He may even find another possessor of higher powers. That will cause jealousy, infuriating his unhappiness. The which is the real power? Is it to increase prosperity? Or bring about peace? That which results in peace is the highest perfection of Siddhis. The root idea in Sri Ramana's attitude to the phenomena of ESP or extrasensory perception or Siddhis, nowadays as scientifically labeled, is easily discovered. ESP experience belongs to the personal eye. The teachings of the sage of Arunachala revolves around hunting the eye until it submits. To seek and attain Siddhis is to strengthen it. That settles the matter once and for all. Thinyasis was in ancient India, the fourth and last of the ashrama, the stations of life. The first of them was represented by the boy, who was sent to live as the Gamasharya, with the guru to serve him and be trained in the scriptures. The second stage was his life as a householder after incurring marriage in which he carried out his duties to those around him and made his contribution to the collective. When his sons were settled and his daughters married, he was free to retire. However, he was not the idea of retirement to a comfortable life, of enjoying the well-earned fruits of a life of work and trial. The third stage of the ashrama was a quiet life of renunciation in the woods, in meditation and prayer, in longing for enlightenment. These first three periods conform to custom and convention, but the last one, sannyasi, the total renunciation of what is expected to assert itself at its own time and under its own conditions. This fact was behind Ramana Maharshi's somewhat enigmatic reply to a questioner, to whether the questioner should embrace sannyasa. If you should, you would not have asked. The traditional idea about sannyasa is explained in a rather certain Yudhista in the Bhagavatam book. It is that Safaniyasi's whole endeavor to be directed toward the discovery of the true self at the point of contact between deep sleep and the waking state. He should look upon both bondage and freedom birth and death as unreal. He should not read profane books or live by any profession, nor indulge in politics, nor take sides in a partisan sphere, nor accept disciples nor do much reading which would divert his mind from his spiritual practice, nor make speeches, nor undertake any responsible work. After attaining enlightenment he may continue to behave as before or alter his ways that would suit his demeanor, to give no sign by which others to recognize his attainment. He retains his usual mode of life or pursuit. Sri Ramana Maharshi never encouraged people who thought of assuming the formal sannyasi though he hereby seemingly contradicted himself. When pointed out that he himself had cut all connection with his family life and home, he simply replied that it was a matter of karma. Discussing the subject he saw the motivation in most cases, it is escapism through disappointment with a weary and unsuccessful life. Almost as often, it is a matter of self-importance. Being in modest or even poor circumstances, you are nobody. As a sannyasi you are somebody, at least in the eyes of some people. 
There might be a third motive for a minority impatience. They are not satisfied with the slow rate of their spiritual progress. All three kinds of motivation and all others as well respond to the prompting of the ego I. Therefore Ramana Maharshi gave a typical reply, Why do you think you are a householder? If you go out as a sannyasi, these similar thoughts if you are a sannyasi will haunt you? Whether you continue in a household or renounce or go to the forest, your mind haunts you. The ego is the source that bothers you. If you renounce the world, it will only substitute the thoughts you renounced as a householder and the environment that is enforced are those of the householder. But the mental obstacles are always there. They increase in new surroundings. There is no help in the change of environments. The obstacle in the mind is in the mind. It must be gotten over whether at home or in the forest. If you can do it in the forest, why not in the home? Therefore, why change the environment? Your efforts is to be made in the now, in whatever environment you may be. Environment never abandons you according to your desire. Look at me, I left home. Look at yourselves. You have come here leaving the home environment. What do you find here? Is this different from what you left? As an answer to another question he replied, Sannyasa is to renounce one's individuality. This is not the same as? At ochre robes. A man may be a householder, yet if he does not think he is a householder, he is a sannyasi. On the contrary a man may wear ochre robes and wander about. Yet if he thinks he is a sannyasi he's not that. Think of sannyasa, he thinks it's his own. Sinyasa is meant for one who is fit. It consists of renunciation, not of material objects, but of attachment to them. Sinyasa can be practiced by anyone, even at home. Only one must be supervised closely. It is the silent wisdom of this mysterious land, lost in the sea of the twentieth century. Just as it was millenniums ago, when it was expressed in Manu's law of Sinyasi. He should not wish to die, nor hope to live, but await the time appointed, as the servant awaits his wages. Will not show anger to one who is angry. He must bless the man who curses him. He must not utter falsehood. Rejoicing in the things of this earth, calm, caring for nothing, abstaining from sensual pleasures. Himself the only helper, he may live on in the world in the hope of eternal bliss. The sinyasa is neither showy nor brilliant, nor a very attractive path, but just the one on which truth is likely to meet the wanderer, provided that he is a true sinyasi. Robert, thank you Mary. We'll have some announcements and then we'll have some question and answers. Now if you have any questions about anything spiritual path, be free to ask, talk, make comments, argue whatever you like. Sr. Robert is inquiry and devotion, or surrender to God, infallible. Robert, they're both the same. Surrender to God leads to freedom. It leads to inquiry. Akta and Atma Vichara are both the same, there's no difference. A person who truly loves God and surrenders to God totally in his heart, will come to the same goal as the person practicing Atma Vichara. Both the same, they're not different. But, true surrender means that you have to really surrender everything. You have no thoughts of your own. You have no mind of your own. You have no ideas of your own. That will be done, not mine. It's hard to do for most people. But, if you give up all of your thoughts it is the same as self-inquiry. Therefore, total surrender means giving up your personal sense of I. All of your thoughts have to be given up, they're both the same. S.D., you mentioned previously that God is something that we've been taught, usually as children in our culture and ultimately, there is no God but simply the self, then whom are you surrendering to? Robert, to yourself, to reality. You're surrendering your ego. 
It seems that when you talk about surrendering to God even I consider that in my heart like very desirable. I have a conflict in how to envision this God or until it becomes personified, and when you know that ultimately there is no God then. Robert, when we speak of God here, it's the same as the self, or absolute reality, or pure awareness. Though to surrender to God, to know God, to visualize God means to empty your mind. When your mind is empty, God as yourself shines through. SD, so when you say not my will but thine be done, whose will are you referring to? The self, the empty mind. The self is always thy will. Your pure self. SD, surrender then is not simply, which is letting go of the ego, right? It's giving up your thoughts. Giving up your reactions, total peace, harmony. SK, how can we not react? I find that almost impossible to imagine. Robert, simply by beginning to observe yourself. When you first react to people and you have a bad temper and you're always sticking up for your rights, you begin to observe yourself doing that. And you ask yourself, who has this problem? You pose the question to yourself, to whom does this problem come? SD, but there are reactions that do not seem to even be problems but appreciation of a sunset or the reaction of love. Are you including that? Robert, what you're referring to is called minor realization. When you have total human love. A human love for the sun or the tree, that's a minor realization. But, complete realization is to know that all of these things come out of your mind. It came out of your imagination. You're the creator of all of life, of the whole universe, and when you give it up, bliss comes. Total harmony, total love which is different than human love. SG, but you give it up the creation. Give up the creation? Robert. Yes. Nobody is realized I suppose here what it's like to experience the other after you give up the creation. But, there's that beyond the creation which is ultimate oneness total peace pure awareness sat chit ananda nirvana and when you experience that you will not have anything to say. It's difficult for a materialistic person to know anything beyond their materialism, but what if they surrender and give up everything? Something more beautiful than you can ever imagine takes over and you live in total bliss from there on in. Total happiness, that's the fourth state, total bliss happiness, total oneness omnipresent. SR, it seems like we're indulging in illusion if we encourage other people to seek this out. Robert, we're not encouraging anybody to do anything. SR, I meant as an individual. You're indulging the self, you mean? SR, if I go out and try and encourage other people to seek the self, who told you to do that? SR, oh this person I met down at the no, no it came from me laughter. Sort of like a sense of duty, which came from my body ego. Exactly. When you search for the self within yourself and get a glimpse of what I'm talking about, you become like a light and people automatically gather around you without you doing anything. But when you go searching or preaching or trying to change somebody's path, it's your ego as you just said. Laughs. It's your ego that does that, but you're not told to do anything except work on yourself. Know yourself and become free. Don't worry about others. Everything will take care of itself. SD, it's one thing to proselytize, but I understand that there's no need to do that, but if people are practicing and they ask about the path you're on, Robert, then you can share it with them. But, you don't go out of your way, if they come to you with something else, but you never go out of your way to proselytize or to convert anybody. Always remember when you want to do that it's the ego. The self rests in peace. It does not have to do anything. SD, so the self will respond and only like understanding. Yes. As an example, I didn't ask to sit here and you sit there, it just happened. I didn't ask to teach. 
I never wanted to found a movement or start a religion or do anything. It just happened of its own accord. So I don't care if anybody comes or doesn't come. I can always talk to myself. Laughter. SM. Robert, are there any changes that the physical body goes through in this process? Robert, everybody's different. It's determined by your karma. Some people go through conditions called chemicalization, and that means things become relatively worse. Because what they're doing is bringing up all of their old karma from previous lives. Things become relatively worse for them. But, if they only hold on for a while and they do not react, everything will die down and they will become peaceful and calm. And they will become the self. D. So it's sort of a purifying time. Robert, any person who is on the path seriously and is practicing self-inquiry, you're calling up everything that you've ever had in this life and past lives, it's all coming to the surface. Though to yourself the ego things may appear to become relatively worse. That's all in the relative plane, but again if you hold on and you persevere this too shall pass and you'll be at peace. Once you're on a path like this, do not be concerned let whatever happens. Were you learning not to respond? You're not to respond. Let come what may do not respond and you come out a winner. But, if you respond and you win then you'll have to go through the same thing again and again and again for your accruing more karma. Therefore do not respond and you transcend that situation. Non-resistance transcends. Resistance accrues karma. It makes no difference what the condition may be. SN. Robert, you spoke of self-inquiry and surrender, but what about the Vedic practice I am Brahman? Robert, who says I am Brahman? The ego. If you're Brahman, why say I am Brahman? You just be, you just are. Actually what that text means, in the Upanishads, it means... I am as Brahman. Do you see the difference? It doesn't mean I the ego am Brahman. It means I am or consciousness is consciousness. SN. Is that another practice? No the same thing. SN. A self-inquiry? Yes. SN. But one is a statement and one is a question. But you're not to make a statement. You say who is I am. You ask yourself the question, who am I, and I will always turn into I am. I am and Brahman are the same. There's no difference. But when you become Brahman, there's no one left to say, I am Brahman. What's the use of saying that? It is only the ego that says I am Brahman. But once you've arrived, there's no one left to say anything. You keep still rather than make affirmations. SK, that's two of us again, that's two in that respect. Robert, where did you come from? How was Ho Chin? How was Ho Chin? Didn't you go there? SK, but people use it as a mantra. Ho Chin? Laughter. What are you talking about? SK, I am Brahman. I am Brahman? Some people use it as a mantra and 20 years pass, and they're still using it as a mantra. Laughter. Best thing to do is keep silent. You've been to India, haven't you seen people repeating mantras year after year after year until they grow old and drop dead? Laughter, SK, but then again, the other side, the opposite I've also seen. Well mantras do quiet in the mind. The purpose of a mantra is to make the mind quiet and one-pointed. If you do it correctly it can calm the mind and make it still. But why go through that path that's the hard way. It's better to ask the question, to whom comes the noisy mind? Then ask your stupid question, to whom does this come? And you will find that I ask the questions and I have the problem. Find the source of I and become free, that's the easy way. SV, Robert, I want to ask about going into that question of who am I, and sometimes when I ask the question, it's like I've heard you say, who am I? 
I, I am I. Sometimes I don't. The words don't come, nothing comes. It's like, Robert, that's good, just rest in the nothingness. Just become still. SV, okay, so I've also tried after saying, who am I? Oh, I, I am I, but it's kind of a forced question, I am looking at it. But, actually, it doesn't lead to some other feeling. It's like I've seen there's an I that I can't catch. It's like an I. Why call, why call me? Like it seems solid just for a second and then it's gone. It's like a fleeting ghost or something. It's like it's there, then it's not there. It's like a sensation. And that's what I call I. It's not really. And sometimes it's related to this. But really it's like a flicks fingers, flashing image in the mind. Robert, so what's the question? How to look at that? What is that and how to look at that? Robert, you can ask yourself the question, to whom comes this experience? Where you can be still and observe it and do nothing and become the witness to the whole process. SV, okay. And just watch. When you ask the question, whatever the question may be, do not come up with your own answer. SV, right, okay so I can see what I was doing, I was saying, that's the I and now I see it. That's what I was doing there. Who sees it? SV, yeah. When there's no one to see, your individuality dissolves into emptiness. SV, okay I caught it. What I was doing I was saying, oh that's me, now I see me. Yeah, but if it were really you and was really the I, there would be nobody left over to see. As long as you see it, it's not the real I. SV, well that's what I was saying, you know I was saying, oh no it can't be me because it's fleeting. But you were saying that. Laughs, SV, yes exactly. If it were true you wouldn't be saying that, do you follow? SV, I miss that part. If it were the real, I there would be nobody left to say that. SV, if I saw what it really was, you mean. There would be nobody left to see. SV, if it was seen for what it really was, the seer would have been dissolved. There would be no seer, nothing to be seen. As long as there is a seer and something to be seen, it is not reality. The seer and the seen both have to go. Then only reality ensues. As long as you believe you're having the experience, it's coming from your mind. Because when the true experience comes, there's nothing left to have any experience. SV, there's no one left. No one is left. It's all emptiness. SD, is it emptiness or fullness I would think? Robert, no it's emptiness. The emptiness means bliss, absolute reality. SD, I can think more of that as fullness when we talk about interconnectedness for all things for example that's different to me than emptiness. Well you're referring to emptiness as being nothing. SD, right. But that's not true. Emptiness is another word for consciousness. Space between words is emptiness and that's consciousness. Though therefore when your silent consciousness comes of its own accord and sets you free. SD, so also there is no answer to, who is I? No, if there's an answer it's your ego answering. Silence is the good teacher. SR, I was just thinking about the idea of bliss that could be an emotional or physiological thing. Is it really bliss, or there isn't a bliss in the sense? Robert, no bliss is beyond all expectations. It's beyond all knowingness. SR, what is it that's enjoying this bliss then? Is self, it is self-contained. SR, it is not an emotion. No it's not. Is nothing we know in the relative world. SR, we're using the word bliss as the status quo, but that isn't really what it is. That's right. It's ineffable. 
something you have to experience. Of course there's nothing left to experience. Laughter. Then you've got it. Sar, when you've got it and there's no name for it. There's no name for it. It's nothing. But when somebody tells you you're nothing, they thank you. Laughter. SV is an experience of living in emptiness that I, whatever that is, enjoys or loves war. Robert, then it comes out of your mind because whatever I enjoy, whatever I love, is a mental concept. SV, isn't it that the I enjoys part of it? Comes out of the mind and the other part is the actual experience? They're both out of the mind. For as long as you're having an experience, and you think you're having the experience, they're both erroneous. SV, I see. Having an experience is no experience. There is no one left to have any experience. Both the experiencer and the experience have both been transcended. And again you go back to silence. SR, what does the self do for entertainment when it reaches that stage? Robert, the self does nothing, but the body appears to go on just like it always did. SV, is that experience always happening? Robert, of course it is to everybody. SV, is it like we come out of it and then? Well it's like an illusion. When you're in the desert, and you see water, and you go after the water, and it turns into sand. Though we have identified wrongly with the relative world, SV, okay. And we think the relative world is real. This is the only problem we've got. Though we're not trying to achieve anything. We're trying to remove the idea of relativity and then everything takes care of itself. As an example, you look at me and what do you see? A body. But, I can assure you I am not a body. But, the Ajani sees the body and it sees the body going through normal things. But, I can assure you that's not so. That's not true even though the appearance is like that. There's no body home. SD, then why does the appearance continue? Robert, why is the sky blue? We imagine the sky is blue. We look up at the sky and you say look at the blue sky. As you investigate, there's no sky and there's no blue. In the same way there's no body, there's no world, there's no universe, there's no enlightenment, there's no God. SD, then how did the illusion begin? It never did. You believe it did. SV, why this intense desire to know that which we don't know? Robert, because that's our real nature. Your real nature is always dying for you to come back to it and wants you to be the self. Though every human being will ultimately become the self, sooner or later. That's why I always like to say we're all hell bound for heaven whether we like it or not. Laughter. SH. Why does the self appear to separate itself from itself? Robert, it doesn't. You think it does? It appears like that to you. That's how you see it, but it never was separated, there never was separation. It's like asking, why do I have a dream and in that dream everything appears real? And it's like I'm with you in the dream, and I'm trying to tell you, you're dreaming Henry you'll say no I'm not Robert this is real look I'll pinch and I'll show you. And you pinch me and I'll say ooh and you say see it's real. And then you wake up. Laughter. It's the same thing. The world appears to be real but to whom does it appear? Ask yourself. SF so that the illusion is that there seems to be an illusion? Robert. Yes. Or whom? Ask yourself. SX seems like it's always the mind that sees the illusion. Robert, exactly. I don't know if you can know who you are, it's just that. I'm just listening to what you're saying and it seems like you say, what were those three questions you said, who is the I? Where is the I coming from? The three questions all come from the mind? Robert, 
Yes, of course they do. Where else would they come from? SX, they can't come from anything else. At this point the tape ends.